Section 122 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 122. A Recollection. How many recollections of youth come to me in the soft sunlight of early spring? It was an age when all was pleasant, cheerful, charming, intoxicating. How exquisite are the remembrances of those old springtimes. Do you recall, old friends and brothers, those happy years when life was nothing but a triumph and an occasion for mirth? Do you recall the days of wanderings around Paris, our jolly poverty, our walks in the fresh green woods, our drinks in the wine shops on the banks of the Seine, and our commonplace and delightful little flirtations? I will tell you about one of these. It was twelve years ago and already appears to me so old, so old that it seems now as if it belonged to the other end of life, before middle age this dreadful middle age from which I suddenly perceived the end of the journey. I was then twenty-five. I had just come to Paris. I was in a government office, and Sundays were to me like unusual festivals, full of exuberant happiness, although nothing remarkable occurred. Now it is Sunday every day, but I regret the time when I had only one Sunday in the week. How enjoyable it was! I had six francs to spend. On this particular morning I awoke with that sense of freedom that all clerks know so well, the sense of emancipation, of rest, of quiet, and of independence. I opened my window. The weather was charming. A blue sky full of sunlight and swallows spread above the town. I dressed quickly and set out, intending to spend the day in the woods breathing the air of the green trees, for I am originally a rustic, having been brought up amid the grass and the trees. Paris was astir and happy in the warmth and the light. The front of the houses was bathed in sunlight, the janitress's canaries were singing in their cages, and there was an air of gaiety in the streets, in the faces of the inhabitants, lighting them up with a smile as if all beings and all things experienced a secret satisfaction at the rising of the brilliant sun. I walked towards the Seine to take the swallow, which would land me at Saint Cloud. How I loved waiting for the boat on the wharf. It seemed to me that I was about to set out for the ends of the world, for new and wonderful lands. I saw the boat approaching yonder, yonder under the second bridge, looking quite small with its plume of smoke, then growing larger and ever larger as it drew near, until it looked to me like a mail steamer. It came up to the wharf and I went on board. People were there already in their Sunday clothes, starling toilettes, gaudy ribbons and bright scarlet designs. I took up a position in the bows, standing up and looking at the quays, the trees, the houses and the bridges disappearing behind us. And suddenly I perceived the great viaduct of Pont du Jour, which blocked the river. It was the end of Paris, the beginning of the country, and behind the double row of arches, the Seine, suddenly spreading out as though it had regained space and liberty, became all at once the peaceful river which flows through the plains, alongside the wooden hills, amid the meadows, along the edge of the forests. After passing between two islands, the swallow went round a curved verdant slope dotted with white houses. A voice called out, Bas Mudon, and a little further on, Sèvres, and still further, Saint Cloud. I went on shore and walked hurriedly through the little town to the road leading to the wood. I had brought with me a map of the environs of Paris, so that I might not lose my way amid the paths which cross in every direction these little forests where Parisians take their outings. As soon as I was unperceived, I began to study my guide, which seemed to be perfectly clear. I was to turn to the right, then to the left, then again to the left, and I should leave Versailles by evening in time for dinner. I walked slowly beneath the young leaves, drinking in the air, fragrant with the odor of young buds and sap. I sauntered along, forgetful of musty papers, of the offices, of my chief, my colleagues, my documents, and thinking of the good things that were sure to come to me, of all the veiled unknown contained in the future. A thousand recollections of childhood came over me, awakened by these country odors, and I walked along, permeated with the fragrant living enchantment, the emotional enchantment of the woods warmed by the sun of June. At times I sat down to look at all sorts of little flowers growing on bank, with the names of which I was familiar. I recognized them all, just as if they were the ones I had seen long ago in the country. They were yellow, red, violet, delicate, dainty, perched on long stems or close to the ground. Insects of all colors and shapes, short, long of peculiar form, frightful, and microscopic monsters, climbed quietly up the stalks of grass which bent beneath their weight. Then I went to sleep for some hours in a hollow and started off again, refreshed by my doze. In front of me lay an enchanting pathway, and through its somewhat scanty foliage the sun poured down drops of light on the marguerites which grew there. It stretched out interminably, quiet and deserted, save for an occasional big wasp, who would stop buzzing now and then to sip from a flower, and then continue his way. All at once I perceived at the end of the path two persons, a man and a woman, coming towards me. Annoyed at being disturbed in my quiet walk, I was about to dive into the thicket, when I thought I heard someone calling me. 
The woman was, in fact, shaking her parasol, and the man, in his shirt sleeves, his coat over one arm, was waving the other as a signal of distress. I went towards them. They were walking hurriedly, their faces very red, she with short, quick steps, and he with long strides. They both looked annoyed and fatigued. The woman asked, "'Can you tell me, monsieur, where we are? My fool of a husband made us lose our way, although he pretended he knew the country perfectly.' I replied confidently, "'Madame, you are going towards St. Cloud and turning your back on Versailles.' With a look of annoyed pity for her husband, she exclaimed, "'What? We are turning our back on Versailles? Why, that is just where we want to dine.' "'I am going there also, madame.' "'Mon Dieu! Mon Dieu! Mon Dieu!' she repeated, shrugging her shoulders, and in that tone of sovereign contempt assumed by women who express their exasperation. She was quite young, pretty, a brunette with a slight shadow on her upper lip. As for him, he was perspiring and wiping his forehead. It was assuredly a little Parisian bourgeois couple. The man seemed cast down, exhausted and distressed. "'But my dear friend, it was you,' he murmured. She did not allow him to finish his sentence." It was I. Ah, oh, it is my fault now. Was it I who wanted to go on without getting any information, pretending that I knew how to find my way? Was it I who wanted to take the road to the right on top of the hill, insisting that I recognized the road? Was it I who undertook to take charge of Cashew? She had not finished speaking when her husband, as if he had suddenly gone crazy, gave a piercing scream, a long, wild cry that could not be described in any language, but which sounded like tweet tweet. The young woman did not appear to be surprised or moved, and resumed. No, really, some people are so stupid and they pretend they know everything. Was it I who took the train to Dieppe last year, instead of the train to Havre? Tell me, was it I? Was it I who bet that Monsieur Le Tourneur lived in Rue de Martyrs? Was it I who would not believe that Celeste was a thief? She went on, furious, with a surprising flow of language, accumulating the most varied, the most unexpected, and the most overwhelming accusations drawn from the intimate relations of their daily life, reproaching her husband for all his actions, all his ideas, all his habits, all his enterprises, all his efforts, for his life from the time of their marriage up to the present time. He strove to check her, to calm her, and stammered, "'But, my dear, it is useless. Before monsieur, we are making ourselves ridiculous. This does not interest monsieur.' and he cast mournful glances into the thicket as though he thought to sound its peaceful and mysterious depths in order to flee thither, to escape and hide from all eyes, and from time to time he uttered a fresh scream, a prolonged and shrill tweet-tweet. I took this to be a nervous affection. The young woman, suddenly turning towards me and changing her tone with singular rapidity, said, If monsieur will kindly allow us, we will accompany him on the road so as not to lose our way again and be obliged, possibly, to sleep in the wood. I bowed. She took my arm and began to talk about a thousand things, about herself, her life, her family, her business. They were glovers in the Rue Saint-Lazaire. Her husband walked beside her, casting wild glances into the thick wood and screaming every few moments. At last I inquired, "'Why do you scream like that?' "'I have lost my poor dog,' he replied in a tone of discouragement and despair. "'How is that? You have lost your dog?' "'Yes, he was just a year old. He had never been outside the shop.' I wanted to take him to have a run in the woods. He had never seen the grass nor the leaves, and he was almost wild. He began to run about and bark, and he disappeared in the wood. I must also add that he was greatly afraid of the train. That may have driven him mad. I kept on calling him, but he has not come back. He will die of hunger in there. Without turning towards her husband, the young woman said, If you had left his chain on, it would not have happened. When people are as stupid as you are, they do not keep a dog. But, my dear, it was you, he murmured timidly. She stopped short, and looking into his eyes as if she were going to tear them out, she began again to cast in his face innumerable reproaches. It was growing dark. The cloud of vapor that covers the country at dusk was slowly rising, and there was a poetry in the air, induced by the peculiar and enchanting freshness of the atmosphere that one feels in the woods at nightfall. Suddenly, the young man stopped, and feeling his body feverishly, exclaimed, "'Oh, I think that I—' She looked at him. "'Well, what?' I did not notice that I had my coat on my arm. Well, I have lost my pocketbook. My money was in it. She shook with anger and choked with indignation. That was all that was lacking. How stupid you are. How stupid you are. Is it possible that I could have married such an idiot? Well, go and look for it and see that you find it. I am going on to Versailles with Monsieur. I do not want to sleep in the wood. Yes, my dear, he replied gently. Where shall I find you? A restaurant had been recommended to me. I gave him the address. He turned back, and, stooping down as he searched the ground with anxious eyes, he moved away, screaming every few moments. 
We could see him for some time until the growing darkness concealed all but his outline, but we heard his mournful tweet-tweet shriller and shriller as the night grew darker. As for me, I stepped along quickly and happily in the soft twilight, with this little unknown woman leaning on my arm. I tried to say pretty things to her, but could think of nothing. I remained silent, disturbed, enchanted. Our path was suddenly crossed by a high road. To the right, I perceived a town lying in a valley. What was this place? A man was passing. I asked him. He replied, Bougival. I was dumbfounded. What? Bougival? Are you sure? Parbleu, I belong there. The little woman burst into an idiotic laugh. I proposed that we should take a carriage and drive to Versailles. She replied, No, indeed. This is very funny and I am very hungry. I am really quite calm. My husband will find his way all right. It is a treat to be rid of him for a few hours. We went into a restaurant beside the water and I ventured to ask for a private compartment. We had some supper. She sang, drank champagne, committed all sorts of follies. That was my first serious flirtation. End of section 122. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 123 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 123. Our Letters. Eight hours of railway travel induce sleep for some persons and insomnia for others. With me, any journey prevents my sleeping on the following night. At about five o'clock, I arrived at the estate of Abel, which belongs to my friends, the Muret d'Ortou, to spend three weeks there. It is a pretty house, built by one of their grandfathers in the style of the latter half of the last century. Therefore, it has that intimate character of dwellings that have always been inhabited, furnished, and enlivened by the same people. Nothing changes, nothing alters the soul of the dwelling, from which the furniture has never been taken out, the tapestries never unnailed, thus becoming worn out, faded, discolored on the same walls. None of the old furniture leaves the place, only from time to time it is moved a little to make room for a new piece, which enters there like a newborn infant in the midst of brothers and sisters. The house is on a hill in the center of a park, which slopes down to the river, where there is a little stone bridge. Beyond the water, the fields stretch out in the distance, and here one can see the cows wandering around, pasturing on the moist grass. Their eyes seem full of the dew, mist, and freshness of the pasture. I love this dwelling, just as one loves a thing which one ardently desires to possess. I return here every autumn with infinite delight, I leave with regret. After I had dined with this friendly family, by whom I was received like a relative, I asked my friend, Paul Muray, Which room did you give me this year? Aunt Rose's room. An hour later, followed by her three children, two little girls and a boy, Madame Muray d'Artus installed me in Aunt Rose's room, where I had not yet slept. When I was alone, I examined the walls, the furniture, the general aspect of the room, in order to attune my mind to it. I knew it but little, as I had entered it only once or twice, and I looked indifferently at a pastel portrait of Aunt Rose, who gave her name to the room. This old Aunt Rose, with her curls, looking at me from behind the glass, made very little impression on my mind. She looked to me like a woman of former days, with principles and precepts as strong on the maxims of morality as on cooking recipes. One of those old aunts who are the bugbear of gaiety, and the stern and wrinkled angel of provincial families. I had never heard her spoken of. I knew nothing of her life or of her death. Did she belong to this century or to the preceding one? Had she left this earth after a calm or a stormy existence? Had she given up to heaven the pure soul of an old maid, the calm soul of a spouse, the tender soul of a mother, or one moved by love? What difference did it make? The name alone, Aunt Rose, seemed ridiculous, common, ugly. I picked up a candle and looked at her severe face, hanging far up in an old gilt frame. Then, as I found it insignificant, disagreeable, even unsympathetic, I began to examine the furniture. It dated from the period of Louis XVI, the Revolution, and the Directorate. Not a chair, not a curtain had entered this room since then, and it gave out the subtle odor of memories, which is the combined odor of wood, cloth, chairs, hangings, peculiar to places wherein have lived hearts that have loved and suffered. I retired but did not sleep. After I had tossed about for an hour or two, I decided to get up and write some letters. I opened a little mahogany desk with brass trimmings, which was placed between the two windows, in hope of finding some ink and paper, but all I found was a quill pen, very much worn and chewed at the end. I was about to close this piece of furniture, when a shining spot attracted my attention. It looked like the yellow head of a nail. I scratched it with my finger and it seemed to move. I seized it between two fingernails and pulled as hard as I could. It came toward me gently. It was a long gold pin which had to have been slipped into a hole in the wood and remained hidden there. Why? 
I immediately thought that it must have served to work some spring which hid a secret, and I looked. It took a long time. After about two hours of investigation, I discovered another hole opposite the first one, but at the bottom of a groove. Into this I stuck my pin, and a little shelf sprang toward my face, and I saw two packages of yellow letters, tied with a blue ribbon. I read them. Here are two of them. So you wish me to return to you your letters, my dearest friend. Here they are, but it pains me to obey. Of what are you afraid? That I might lose them? But they are under lock and key. Do you fear that they might be stolen? I guard against that, for they are my dearest treasure. Yes, it pains me deeply. I wondered whether, perhaps, you might not be feeling some regret. Not regret at having loved me, for I know that you still do, but the regret of having expressed on white paper this living love in hours when your heart did not confide in me, but in the pen that you held in your hand. When we love, we need confession. We need talking and writing, and we either talk or write. Words fly away, those sweet words made of music, air and tenderness, warm and light, which escape as soon as they are uttered, which remain in the memory alone, but which one can neither see, touch, nor kiss, as one can with the words written by your hand. Your letters? Yes, I am returning them to you, but with what sorrow? Undoubtedly, you must have had an afterthought of delicate shame at expressions that are ineffaceable. In your sensitive and timid soul, you must have regretted having written to a man that you loved him. You remembered sentences that called up recollections, and you said to yourself, I will make ashes of those words. Be satisfied. Be calm. Here are your letters. I love you. My friend. No, you have not understood me. You have not guessed. I do not regret, and I never shall, that I told you of my affection. I will always write to you, but you must return my letters to me as soon as you have read them. I shall shock you, my friend, when I tell you the reason for this demand. It is not poetic, as you imagined, but practical. I am afraid, not of you, but of some mischance. I am guilty. I do not wish my fault to affect others than myself. Understand me well. You and I may both die. You might fall off your horse, since you ride every day. You might die from a sudden attack, from a duel, from heart disease, from a carriage accident, in a thousand ways. For if there is only one death, there are more ways of its reaching us than there are days for us to live. Then your sisters, your brother, or your sister-in-law might find my letters. Do you think that they love me? I doubt it. And then, even if they adored me, is it possible for two women and one man to know such a secret, such a secret, and not tell of it? I seem to be saying very disagreeable things, speaking first of your death, and then suspecting the discreetness of your relatives. But don't all of us die sooner or later? And it is almost certain that one of us will precede the other under the ground. We must therefore foresee all dangers, even that one. As for me, I will keep your letters beside mine in the secret of my little desk. I will show them to you there, sleeping side by side in their silken hiding place, full of our love, like lovers in a tomb. You will say to me, but if you should die first, my dear, your husband will find these letters. Oh, I fear nothing. First of all, he does not know the secret of my desk, and then he will not look for it, and even if he finds it after my death, I fear nothing. Did you ever stop to think of all the love letters that have been found after death? I have been thinking of this for a long time, and that is the reason I decided to ask you for my letters. Think that never. Do you understand? Never. Does a woman burn, tear, or destroy the letters in which it is told her that she is loved? That is our whole life, our whole hope, expectation, and dream. These little papers which bear our name in caressing terms are relics which we adore. They are chapels in which we are the saints. Our love letters are our titles to beauty, grace, seduction, the intimate vanity of our womanhood. They are the treasures of our heart. No, a woman does not destroy these secret and delicious archives of her life. But, like everybody else, we die, and then, then these letters are found. Who finds them? The husband. Then what does he do? Nothing. He burns them. Oh, I have thought a great deal about that. Just think that every day women are dying who have been loved. Every day the traces and proofs of their fault fall into the hands of their husbands, and that there is never a scandal, never a duel. Think, my dear, of what a man's heart is. He avenges himself on a living woman. He fights with a man who has dishonored her, kills him while she lives. Because, well, why? I do not know exactly why. But if, after her death, he finds similar proofs, he burns them and no one is the wiser, and he continues to shake hands with the friend of the dead woman, and feels quite at ease that these letters should not have fallen into strange hands, and that they are destroyed. Oh, how many men I know among my friends who must have burned such proofs, and who pretend to know nothing, and yet who would have fought madly had they found them when she was still alive. But she is dead. Honor has changed. The tomb is the boundary of conjugal sinning. Therefore I can safely keep our letters, which, in your hands, would be a menace to both of us. Do you dare to say that I am not right? I love you and kiss you. I raised my eyes to the portrait of Aunt Rose, and as I looked at her severe, wrinkled face, I thought of all those women's souls which we do not know, 
and which we suppose to be so different from what they really are, whose inborn and ingenuous craftiness we can never penetrate, their quiet duplicity, and a verse of de Vigny returned to my memory. Always this comrade whose heart is uncertain. End of section 123. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 124 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 124, The Love of Long Ago. The old-fashioned chateau was built on a wooded knoll in the midst of tall trees with dark green foliage. The park extended to a great distance, in one direction to the edge of the forest, and another to the distant country. A few yards from the front of the house was a huge stone basin with marble ladies taking a bath. Other basins were seen at intervals down to the foot of the slope, and a stream of water fell in cascades from one basin to another. From the manor house, which preserved the grace of a superannuated coquette, came down to the grottoes encrusted with shell work, where slumbered the loves of a bygone age. Everything in this antique de men had retained the physiognomy of former days. Everything seemed to speak still of ancient customs, of the manners of long ago, of former gallantries, and of the elegant trivialities so dear to our grandmothers. In a parlor in the style of Louis the Fifteenth, whose walls were covered with shepherds paying court to shepherdesses, beautiful ladies in hoop skirts, and gallant gentlemen in wigs, a very old woman, who seemed dead as soon as she ceased to move, was almost lying down in an easy chair, at each side of which hung a thin, mummy-like hand. Her dim eyes were gazing dreamily toward the distant horizon, as if they sought to follow through the park the visions of her youth. Through the open window, every now and then, came a breath of air laden with the odor of grass and the perfume of flowers. It made her white locks flutter around her wingled forehead, and old memories float through her brain. Beside her, on a tapestried stool, a young girl with long, fair hair hanging braids down her back, was embroidering an altar cloth. There was a pensive expression in her eyes, and it was easy to see that she was dreaming, while her agile fingers flew over her work. But the old lady turned round her head and said, "'Birth, read me something out of the newspapers, that I may still know sometimes what is going on in the world.' The young girl took up a newspaper and cast a rapid glance over it. There is a great deal about politics, Grandmama. Shall I pass that over? Yes, yes, darling. Are there no love stories? Is gallantry, then, dead in France, that they no longer talk about abductions or adventures as they did formerly? The girl made a long search through the columns of the newspaper. Here is one, she said. It is entitled A Love Drama. The old woman smiled through her wrinkles. Read that for me, she said. And birth commenced. It was a case of vitriol throwing. A wife, in order to avenge herself on her husband's mistress, had burned her face and eyes. She had left the court of Assise acquitted, declared to be innocent amid the applause of the crowd. The grandmother moved about excitedly in her chair and exclaimed, This is horrible! Why, it is perfectly horrible! See whether you can find anything else to read to me, darling. Berth again made a search, and farther down among the reports of criminal cases she read, Gloomy drama. A shop girl, no longer young, allowed herself to be led astray by a young man. Then, to avenge herself on her lover, whose heart proved fickle, she shot him with a revolver. The unhappy man is maimed for life. The jury, all men of moral character, condoning the illicit love of the murderess, honorably acquitted her. This time the old grandmother appeared quite shocked, and in a trembling voice she said, "'Why, you people are mad nowadays. You are mad. The good God has given you love, the only enchantment in life. Man has added to this gallantry the only distinction of our dull hours, and here you are mixing up with the vitriol and revolvers, as if one were to put mud into a flagon of Spanish wine. Berth did not seem to understand her grandmother's indignation. But, Grandmama, this woman avenged herself. Remember, she was married, and her husband deceived her. The grandmother gave a start. What ideas have they been filling your head with, you young girls of today? Berth replied, But marriage is sacred, Grandmama. The grandmother's heart, which had its birth in the great age of gallantry, gave a sudden leap. It is love that is sacred, she said. Listen, child, to an old woman who has seen three generations, and who has had a long, long experience of men and women. Marriage and love have nothing in common. We marry to found a family, and we form families in order to constitute society. Society cannot dispense with marriage. If society is a chain, each family is a link in that chain. In order to weld those links, we always seek metals of the same order. When we marry, we must bring together suitable conditions. We must combine fortunes, unite similar races, and aim at the common interest, which is riches and children. We marry only once, my child, because the world requires us to do so, but we may love twenty times in one lifetime, 
because nature has made us like this. Marriage, you see, is law, and love is an instinct which impels us, sometimes along a straight and sometimes along a devious path. The world has made laws to combat our instincts. It was necessary to make them, but our instincts are stronger, and we ought not to resist them too much because they come from God, while laws only come from men. If we did not perfume life with love, as much love as possible, darling, as we put sugar into drugs for children, nobody would care to take it just as it is. Berth opened her eyes wide in astonishment. She murmured, Oh, Grandmama, we can love only once. The grandmother raised her trembling hands toward heaven, as if again to invoke the defunct god of gallantries. She exclaimed indignantly, You have become a race of serfs, a race of common people. Since the revolution, it is impossible any longer to recognize society. You have attached big words to every action and wearisome duties to every corner of existence. You believe in equality and eternal passion. People have written poetry telling you that people have died of love. In my time, poetry was written to teach men to love every woman. And we, when we liked a gentleman, my child, we sent him a page. And when a fresh caprice came into our hearts, we were not slow in getting rid of the last lover, unless we kept both of them. The old woman smiled a keen smile, and a gleam of roguery twinkled in her gray eye, the intellectual, skeptical roguery of those people who did not believe that they were made of the same clay as the rest, and who lived as masters for whom common beliefs were not intended. The young girl, turning very pale, faltered out, "'So then women have no honor? The grandmother ceased to smile. If she had kept in her soul some of Voltaire's irony, she had also a little of Jean-Jacques' glowing philosophy. "'No honor?' because we loved and dared to say so, and even boasted of it? But my child, if one of us, among the greatest ladies in France, had lived without a lover, she would have had the entire court laughing at her. Those who wished to live differently had only to enter a convent. And you imagine, perhaps, that your husbands will love but you alone all their lives, as if indeed this could be the case. I tell you that marriage is a thing necessary in order that society should exist, but it is not in the nature of our race, do you understand? There is only one good thing in life, and that is love, and how you misunderstand it, how you spoil it, you treat it as something solemn like a sacrament or something to be bought like a dress. The young girl caught the old woman's trembling hands in her own. Hold your tongue, I beg of you, Grandmama. And on her knees, with tears in her eyes, she prayed to heaven to bestow on her a great passion, one sole eternal passion in accordance with the dream of modern poets, while the grandmother, kissing her on the forehead, quite imbued still with that charming, healthy reason with which gallant philosophers tinctured the thought of the 18th century, murmured, Take care, my poor darling. If you believe in such folly as that, you will be very unhappy. End of section 124. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 125 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 125. Friend Joseph. They had been great friends all winter in Paris. As is always the case, they had lost sight of each other after leaving school, and had met again when they were old and gray-haired. One of them had married, but the other had remained in single blessedness. Monsieur de Morule lived for six months in Paris, and for six months in his little chateau at Tourville, having married the daughter of a neighboring squire, he had lived a good and peaceful life in the indolence of a man who has nothing to do. Of a calm and quiet disposition, and not over-intelligent, he used to spend his time quietly regretting the past, grieving over the customs and institutions of the day, and continually repeating to his wife, who would lift her eyes, and sometimes her hands, to heaven as a sign of energetic assent. Good gracious, what a government! Madame de Marul resembled her husband intellectually, as though she had been his sister. She knew by tradition that one should above all respect the Pope and the King, and she loved and respected them from the bottom of her heart without knowing them, with a poetic fervor, with a hereditary devotion, with the tenderness of a well-born woman. She was good to the marrow of her bones. She had had no children and never ceased mourning the fact. On meeting his old friend, Joseph Mordeur, at a ball, Monsieur de Morule was filled with a deep and simple joy, for in their youth they had been intimate friends. After the first exclamations of surprise at the changes which time had wrought in their bodies and countenances, they told each other about their lives since they had last met. Joseph Moradour, who was from the south of France, had become a government official. His manner was frank, he spoke rapidly and without restraint, giving his opinions without any tact. He was a Republican, one of those good fellows who do not believe in standing on ceremony, and who exercise an almost brutal freedom of speech. 
He came to his friend's house and was immediately liked for his easy cordiality, in spite of his radical ideas. Madame de Moreau would exclaim, What a shame, such a charming man! Monsieur de Moreau would say to his friend in a serious and confidential tone of voice, You have no idea the harm that you are doing your country. He loved him all the same, for nothing is stronger than the ties of childhood taken up again at riper age. Joseph Mordour bantered the wife and the husband, calling them my amiable snails, and sometimes he would solemnly declaim against people who were behind the times, against old prejudices and traditions. When he was once started on his domestic eloquence, the couple, somewhat ill at ease, would keep silent from politeness and good breeding, then the husband would try to turn the conversation into some other channel in order to avoid a clash. Joseph Morador was only seen in the intimacy of the family. Summer came. The Maroules had no greater pleasure than to receive their friends at their country home at Tourville. It was a good, healthy pleasure, the enjoyments of good people and of country proprietors. They would meet their friends at the neighboring railroad station and would bring them back in their carriage, always on the lookout for compliments on the country, on its natural features, on the condition of the roads, on the cleanliness of the farmhouses, on the size of the cattle grazing in the fields, on everything within sight. They would call attention to the remarkable speed with which their horse trotted, surprising for an animal that did heavy work part of the year behind a plow, and they would anxiously await the opinion of the newcomer on their family domain, sensitive to the last word and thankful for the slightest good intention. Joseph Morador was invited, and he accepted the invitation. Husband and wife had come to the train, delighted to welcome him to their home. As soon as he saw them, Joseph Morador jumped from the train with a briskness which increased their satisfaction. He shook their hands, congratulated them, overwhelmed them with compliments. All the way home he was charming, remarking on the height of the trees, the goodness of the crops, and the speed of the horse. When he stepped on the porch of the house, Monsieur de Merule said, with a certain friendly solemnity, "'Consider yourself at home now.' Joseph Morador answered, "'Thanks, my friend. I expected as much. Anyhow, I never stand on ceremony with my friends. That's how I understand hospitality.' Then he went upstairs to dress as a farmer, he said, and he came back all togged out in blue linen, with a straw hat and yellow shoes, a regular Parisian dressed for an outing. He also seemed to become more vulgar, more jovial, more familiar, having put on with his country clothes a free and easy manner which he judged suitable to the surroundings. His new manner shocked Monsieur and Madame de Merule a little, for they always remained serious and dignified, even in the country, as though compelled by the two letters preceding their name to keep up a certain formality, even in the closest intimacy. After lunch they all went out to visit the farms, and the Parisian astounded the respectful peasants by his tone of comradeship. In the evening the priest came to dinner, an old fat priest, accustomed to dining there on Sundays, but who had been especially invited this day in honor of the new guest. Joseph, on seeing him, made a wry face. Then he observed him with surprise, as though he were a creature of some peculiar race, which he had never been able to observe at close quarters. During the meal he told some rather free stories, allowable in the intimacy of the family, but which seemed to the Merules a little out of place in the presence of a minister of the church. He did not say Monsieur l'abbé, but simply Monsieur. He embarrassed the priest greatly by philosophical discussions about diverse superstitions current all over the world. He said, Your God, Monsieur, is one of those who should be respected, but also one of those who should be discussed. Mine is called reason. He has always been the enemy of yours. The Merules, distressed, tried to turn the trend of the conversation. The priest left very early. Then the husband said, very quietly, Perhaps you went a little bit too far with the priest. But Joseph immediately exclaimed, Well, that's pretty good, as if I would be on my guard with a shaveling. And say, do me the pleasure of not imposing him on me any more at meals. You can both make use of him as much as you wish, but don't serve him up to your friends, hang it. But my friends, think of his holy... Joseph Morador interrupted him. Yes, I know, they have to be treated like rosiers. But let them respect my convictions, and I will respect theirs. That was all for that day. As soon as Madame de Merule entered the parlor the next morning, she noticed in the middle of the table three newspapers which made her start. The Voltaire, the République Française, and the Justice. Immediately, Joseph Morador, still in blue, appeared on the threshold, attentively reading the intransigent. He recried, There's a great article in this by Rochefort. That fellow is a wonder. He read it aloud, emphasizing the parts which especially pleased him, so carried away by enthusiasm that he did not notice his friend's entrance. Monsieur de Merule was holding in his hand the Galois for himself, the clarion for his wife. The fiery prose of the master writer who overthrew the empire, spouted with violence, sung in the southern accent, rang throughout the peaceful parsons, and seemed to splatter the walls of century-old furniture with a hail of bold, ironical, and destructive words. 
The man and the woman, one standing, the other sitting, were listening with astonishment, so shocked that they could not move. In a burst of eloquence, Morador finished the last paragraph and exclaimed triumphantly, Well, that's pretty strong. Then suddenly he noticed the two sheets which his friend was carrying, and he, in turn, stood speechless from surprise. Quickly walking toward them, he demanded angrily, What are you doing with those papers? Monsieur de Merule answered hesitatingly, Why, those, those are my papers. Your papers? What are you doing, making fun of me? You will do me the pleasure of reading mine, they will limber up your ideas, and as for yours, there, that's what I do with them. And before his astonished host could stop him, he had seized the two newspapers and thrown them out of the window. Then he solemnly handed the justice to Madame de Morule, the Voltaire to her husband, while he sank down into an armchair to finish reading the intransigent. The couple, through delicacy, made a pretense of reading a little, and then handed him back the Republican sheets, which they handled gingerly as though they might be poisoned. He laughed and declared, One week of this regime, and I will have you converted to my ideas. In truth, at the end of a week, he ruled the house. He had closed the door against the priest, whom Madame de Merule had to visit secretly. He had forbidden the Galois and the Clarion to be brought into the house, so that a servant had to go mysteriously to the post office to get them, and as soon as he entered, they would be hidden under sofa cushions. He arranged everything to suit himself. Always charming, always good-natured, a jovial and all-powerful tyrant. Other friends were expected, pious and conservative friends. The unhappy couple saw the impossibility of having them there then, and, not knowing what to do, one evening they announced to Joseph Morador that they would be obliged to absent themselves for a few days on business, and they begged him to stay on alone. He did not appear disturbed, and answered, "'Very well, I don't mind. I will wait here as long as you wish. I have already said that there should be no formality between friends. You are perfectly right. Go ahead and attend to your business. It will not offend me in the least.' Quite the contrary, it will make me feel much more completely one of the family. Go ahead, my friends, I will wait for you. Monsieur and Madame de Merule left the following day. He is still waiting for them. End of section 125. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 126 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 126. The Effeminates. How often we hear people say, He is charming, that man, but he is a girl, a regular girl. They are alluding to the effeminates, the bane of our land. For we are all girl-like men in France, that is, fickle, fanciful, innocently treacherous, without consistency in our convictions or our will, violent and weak as women are. But the most irritating of girl men is assuredly the Parisian and the Boulevardier, in whom the appearance of intelligence is more marked, and who combines in himself all the attractions and all the faults of those charming creatures in an exaggerated degree in virtue of his masculine temperament. Our chamber of deputies is full of girl men. They form the greater number of the amiable opportunists whom one might call the charmers. These are they who control by soft words and deceitful promises, who know how to shake hands in such a manner as to win hearts, how to say, my dear friend, in a certain tactful way to people he knows the least, to change his mind without suspecting it, to be carried away by each new idea, to be sincere in their weathercock convictions, to let themselves be deceived as they deceive others, to forget the next morning what he affirmed the day before. The newspapers are full of these effeminate men. That is probably where one finds the most, but it is also where they are most needed. The Journal des Debats and the Gazette de France are exceptions. Assuredly, every good journalist must be somewhat effeminate, that is, at the command of the public, supple and following unconsciously the shades of public opinion, wavering and varying, skeptical and credulous, wicked and devout, a braggart and a true man, enthusiastic and ironical, and always convinced while believing in nothing. Foreigners, our anti-types, as Madame Abel called them, the stubborn English and the heavy Germans, regard us with a certain amazement mingled with contempt, and will continue to so regard us till the end of time. They consider us frivolous. It is not that, it is that we are girls, and that is why people love us in spite of our faults, why they come back to us despite that evil spoken of us. These are lovers' quarrels. The effeminate man, as one meets him in this world, is so charming that he captivates you after five minutes' chat. His smile seems made for you. One cannot believe that his voice does not assume specially tender intonations on their account. When he leaves you, it seems as if one had known him for twenty years. One is quite ready to lend him money if he asks for it. He has enchanted you, like a woman. If he commits any breach of manners towards you, you cannot bear any malice. He is so pleasant when you next meet him. 
If he asks your pardon, you long to ask pardon of him. Does he tell lies? You cannot believe it. Does he put you off indefinitely with promises that he does not keep? One lays as much store by his promises as though he had moved heaven and earth to render them a service. When he admires anything, he goes into such raptures that he convinces you. He once adored Victor Hugo, whom he now treats as a back number. He would have fought for Zola, whom he has abandoned for Barbe and de Orvilly. And when he admires, he permits no limitation. He would slap your face for a word. But when he becomes scornful, his contempt is unbounded and allows of no protest. In fact, he understands nothing. Listen to two girls talking. Then you are angry with Julia? I slapped her face. What had she done? She told Pauline that I had no money thirteen months out of twelve, and Pauline told Gontran, you understand. You were living together in the Rue Clonzel? We lived together four years in the Rue Breda. We quarreled about a pair of stockings that she said I had worn. It wasn't true. Silk stockings that she had bought at Mother Martin's. Then I gave her a pounding and she left me at once. I met her six months ago and she asked me to come and live with her, as she has rented a flat that is twice too large. One goes on one's way and hears no more. But on the following Sunday, as one is on the way to Saint-Germain, two young women get into the same railway carriage. One recognizes one of them at once. It is Julia's enemy. The other is Julia. And there are endearments, caresses, plans. Say, Julia, listen, Julia, etc. The girl man has friendships of this kind. For three months he cannot bear to leave his old Jack, his dear Jack. There is no one but Jack in the world. He is the only one who has any intelligence, any sense, any talent. He alone amounts to anything in Paris. One meets them everywhere together, they dine together, walk about in company, and every evening walk home with each other back and forth without being able to part with one another. Three months later, if Jack is mentioned, there is a drinker, a sorry fellow, a scoundrel for you. I know him well, you may be sure, and he is not even honest and ill-bred, etc., etc. Three months later, and they are living together. But one morning, one hears that they have fought a duel and then embraced each other amid tears on the dueling ground. Just now they are the dearest friends in the world, furious with each other half the year, abusing and loving each other by turns, squeezing the other's hands till they almost crush his bones, and ready to run each other through the body for a misunderstanding. For the relations of these effeminate men are uncertain. Their temper is by fits and starts, their delight unexpected, their affection turn about face, their enthusiasm subject to eclipse. One day they love you, the next day they will hardly look at you, for they have, in fact, a girl's nature, a girl's charm, a girl's temperament, and all their sentiments are like the affection of girls. They treat their friends as women treat their pet dogs. It is dear little Tutu whom they hug, feed with sugar, allow to sleep on the pillow, but whom they would be just as likely to throw out of a window in the moment of impatience, whom they turn round like a sling, holding it by the tail, squeeze in their arms till they almost strangle it, and plunge without any reason into a pail of cold water. Then what a strange thing it is when one of these beings falls in love with a real girl. He beats her, she scratches him, they execrate each other, cannot bear the sight of each other and yet cannot part, linked together by none knows but what mysterious psychic bonds. She deceives him, he knows it, sobs and forgives her. He despises and adores her without seeing that she would be justified in despising him. They are both atrociously unhappy and yet cannot separate. They cast invectives, reproaches, and abominable accusations at each other from morning till night, and when they have reached the climax and are vibrating with rage and hatred, they fall into each other's arms and kiss each other ardently. The girl man is brave and a coward at the same time. He has, more than another, the exalted sentiment of honor, but is lacking in the sense of simple honesty, and circumstances favoring him would defalcate and commit infamies which do not trouble his conscience, for he obeys without questioning the oscillations of his ideas, which are always impulsive. To him it seems permissible and almost right to cheat a haberdasher. He considers it honorable not to pay his debts unless they are gambling debts, that is, somewhat shady. He dupes people whenever the laws of society admit of his doing so. When he is short of money, he borrows in all ways, not always being scrupulous as to tricking the lenders, but he would, with sincere indignation, run his sword through anyone who should suspect him of only lacking in politeness. End of section 126. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 127 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 127. Old Amable. The humid gray sky seemed to weigh down on the vast brown plain. The odor of autumn, the sad odor of bare, moist lands, of fallen leaves, of dead grass, made the stagnant evening air more thick and heavy. 
The peasants were still at work, scattered through the fields, waiting for the stroke of the Angelus to call them back to the farmhouses, whose thatched roofs were visible here and there through the branches of the leafless trees, which protected the apple gardens against the wind. At the side of the road, on a heap of clothes, a very small boy, seated with his legs apart, was playing with a potato, which he now and then let fall on his dress, whilst five women were bending down, planting slips of colza in the adjoining plain. With a slow, continuous movement, all along the mounds of earth which the plough had just turned up, they drove in sharp wooden stakes, and in the hole thus formed, placed the plant, already a little withered, which sank on one side, then they patted down the earth and went on with their work. A man who was passing, with a whip in his hand and wearing wooden shoes, stopped near the child, took it up and kissed it. Then one of the women rose up and came across to him. She was a big red-haired girl with large hips, waist, and shoulders, a tall Norman woman, with yellow hair, in which there was a blood-red tint. She said in a resolute voice, "'Why, here you are, Césaire. Well?' The man, a thin young fellow with a melancholy air, murmured, "'Well, nothing at all. Always the same thing. He won't have it. He won't have it. What are you going to do? What do you say I ought to do? Go see the curé. I will. Go at once. I will.' and they stared at each other. He held the child in his arms all the time. He kissed it once more and then put it down again on the woman's clothes. In the distance between two farmhouses could be seen a plow driven by a horse and driven by a man. They moved on very gently, the horse, the plow, and the laborer, in the dim evening twilight. The woman went on. What did your father say? He said he would not have it. Why wouldn't he have it? The young man pointed toward the child whom he had just put back on the ground, then with a glance he drew her attention to the man drawing the plough yonder there, and he said emphatically, "'Because tis his, this child of yours.' The girl shrugged her shoulders, and in an angry voice said, "'Faith, everyone knows it well, that it is Victor's. And what about it, after all? I made a slip. Am I the only woman that did? My mother also made a slip before me. Then yours did the same before she married your dad. Who is it that hasn't made a slip in the country?' I made a slip with Victor because he took advantage of me while I was asleep in the barn, it's true, and afterward it happened between us when I wasn't asleep. I certainly would have married him if you weren't a servant man. Am I a worse woman than that? The man said simply, As for me, I like you just as you are, with or without the child. It's only my father that opposes me. All the same, I'll see about settling the business. She answered, Go to the curé at once. I'm going to him and he set forth with his heavy peasant's tread, while the girl, with her hands on her hips, turned round to plant her colza. In fact, the man who thus went off, Césaire Houbrec, the son of deaf old amiable Houbrec, wanted to marry, in spite of his father, Celeste Levesque, who had a child by Victor Lecoq, a mere laborer on her parents' farm, who had been turned out of doors for this act. The hierarchy of caste, however, does not exist in the country, and if the laborer is thrifty, he becomes, by taking the farm in his turn, the equal of his former master. So Césaire Holbrec went off, his whip under his arm, brooding over his own thoughts and lifting up one after the other, his heavy wooden shoes daubed with clay. Certainly he desired to marry Celeste Levesque. He wanted her with her child because she was the wife he wanted. He could not say why, but he knew it. He was sure of it. He had only to look at her to be convinced of it, to feel quite queer, quite stirred up, simply stupid with happiness. He even found a pleasure in kissing the little boy, Victor's little boy, because he belonged to her and he gazed without hate at the distant outline of the man who was driving his plow along the horizon. But old Amable did not want this marriage. He opposed it with the obstinacy of a deaf man, with a violent obstinacy. Césaire in vain shouted in his ear, and that ear which still heard a few good sounds, "'I'll take good care of you, Daddy. I tell you she's a good girl and strong, too, and also thrifty.' The old man repeated, "'As long as I live, I won't see her your wife.' And nothing could get the better of him, nothing could make him waver." One hope only was left to Césaire. Old Amable was afraid of the curé through the apprehension of death which he felt drawing nigh. He had not much to fear of God, nor of the devil, nor of hell, nor of purgatory, of which he had no conception, but he dreaded the priest who represented to him burial, as one might fear doctors through horror of disease. For the last tight days, Celeste, who knew this weakness of the old man, had been urging Césaire to go and find the curé, but Césaire always hesitated, because he had not much liking for the black robe, which represented to him hands always stretched out for collections or for blessed bread. However, he had made up his mind, and he proceeded toward the presbytery, thinking in what manner he would speak about his case. The Abbe Raffan, a lively little priest, thin and never shaved, was awaiting his dinner hour while warming his feet at the kitchen fire. As soon as he saw the peasant entering, he asked, merely turning his head, "'Well, Césaire, what do you want?' 
I'd like to have a talk with you, Monsieur le Curé. The man remained standing, intimidated, holding his cap in one hand and his whip in the other. Well, talk. Suzanne looked at the housekeeper, an old woman who dragged her feet while putting on the cover for her master's dinner, at the corner of the table in front of the window. He stammered, "'Tis, tis a sort of confession." Thereupon the Abbe Raffan carefully surveyed his peasant. He saw his confused countenance, his air of constraint, his wandering eyes, and he gave orders to the housekeeper in these words. "'Marie, go away for five minutes to your room while I talk to Césaire. The servant cast on the man an angry glance and went away grumbling. The clergyman went on. "'Come now, tell your story.' The young fellow still hesitated, looked down at his wooden shoes, moved about his cap. Then, all of a sudden, he made up his mind. "'Here it is. I want to marry Celeste Levesque.' "'Well, my boy, what's there to prevent you?' "'The father won't have it.' "'Your father?' "'Yes, my father.' "'What does your father say?' "'He says she has a child.' "'She's not the first to whom that happened since our mother Eve.' "'A child by Victor Lecoq, and Thimboiselle's servant-man.' "'Ah, ah, so he won't have it. "'He won't have it.' "'What? Not at all?' "'No, no more than an ass that won't budge an inch, saving your presence. "'What do you say to him yourself in order to make him decide? "'I say to him that she's a good girl, and strong too, and thrifty also. "'And this does not make him agree to it, so you want me to speak to him. "'Exactly, you speak to him. "'And what am I to tell your father? "'Why, what you tell people in your sermons to make them give you sous. In the peasant's mind, every effort of religion consisted in loosening the purse strings and emptying the pockets of men in order to fill the heavenly coffer. It was a kind of huge commercial establishment of which the curés were the clerks, sly, crafty clerks, sharp as any one must be who does business for the good God at the expense of the country people. He knew full well that the priests rendered services, great services to the poorest, to the sick and dying, that they assisted, consoled, counseled, sustained, but all this by means of money in exchange for white pieces for beautiful glittering coins, with which they paid for sacraments and masses, advice and protection, pardon of sins and indulgences, purgatory and paradise, according to the yearly income and the generosity of the sinner. The Abbe Raffan, who knew this man, and never lost his temper, burst out laughing. Well, yes, I'll tell your father my little story, but you, my lad, you'll come to church. Hulbrecht extended his hand in order to give a solemn assurance. On the word of a poor man, if you do this for me, I promise that I will. Come, that's all right. When do you wish me to go and find your father? Why, the sooner the better, tonight if you can. In half an hour, then, after supper. In half an hour. That's understood. So long, my lad. Goodbye till we meet again, Monsieur le Curé. Many thanks. Not at all, my lad. And Césaire Houbrec returned home, his heart relieved of a great weight. He held on lease a little farm, quite small, for they were not rich, his father and he, Alone with a female servant, a little girl of fifteen who made the soup, looked after the fowls, milked the cows, and churned the butter, they lived frugally, though Césaire was a good cultivator. But they did not possess either sufficient lands or sufficient cattle to earn more than the indispensable. The old man no longer worked. Sad like all deaf people, crippled with pains, bent double, twisted, he went through the fields leaning on his stick, watching the animals and the men with a hard, distrustful eye. Sometimes he sat down on the side of the road and remained there without moving for hours, vaguely pondering over the things that had engrossed his whole life, the price of eggs and corn, the sun and the rain which spoil the crops or make them grow, and, worn out with rheumatism, his old limbs still drank in the humidity of the soul, as they had drunk in for the most sixty years, the moisture of the walls and his low house thatched with damp straw. He came back at the close of the day, took his place at the end of the table in the kitchen, and when the earthen bowl containing the soup had been placed before him, he placed round it his crooked fingers, which seemed to have kept the round form of the bowl, and, winter or summer, he warmed his hands before commencing to eat, so as to lose nothing, not even a particle of the heat that came from the fire, which costs a great deal, neither one drop of soup into which fat and salt have to be put, nor one morsel of bread, which comes from the wheat. Then he climbed up a ladder into a loft where he had his straw bed, while his son slept below stairs at the end of a kind of niche near the chimney piece, and the servant shut herself up in a kind of cellar, a black hole which was formerly used to store the potatoes. Caesar and his father scarcely ever talked to each other. From time to time only, when there was a question of selling a crop or buying a calf, the young man would ask his father's advice, and, making a speaking trumpet of his two hands, he would bawl out his views into his ear which old Amable either approved of them or opposed them, in a slow, hollow voice that came from the depths of his stomach. 
So one evening, Césaire, approaching him as if to about to discuss the purchase of a horse or a heifer, communicated to him at the top of his voice his intention to marry Celeste Levesque. Then the father got angry. Why? On the score of morality? No, certainly. The virtue of a girl is of slight importance in the country, but his avarice, his deep, fierce instinct for saving, revolted at the idea that his son should bring up a child which he had not begotten himself. He had thought suddenly, in one second, of the soup the little fellow would swallow before becoming useful on the farm. He had calculated all the pounds of bread, all the pints of cider that this brat would consume up to his fourteenth year, and a mad anger broke loose from him against Césaire, who had not bestowed a thought on all this. He replied in an unusually strong voice, "'Have you lost your senses?' Thereupon Césaire began to enumerate his reasons, to speak about Celeste's good qualities, to prove that she would be worth a thousand times what the child would cost, but the old man doubted these advantages, while he could have no doubts as to the child's existence, and he replied with emphatic repetition, without giving any further explanation. "'I will not have it! I will not have it! As long as I live, this won't be done!' And at this point they had remained for the last three months without one or the other giving in, resuming at least once a week the same discussion, with the same arguments, the same words, the same gestures, and the same fruitlessness. It was then that Celeste had advised Césaire to go and ask for the curé's assistance. On arriving home, the peasant found his father already seated at table, for he came late through his visit to the presbytery. They dined in silence, face to face, ate a little bread and butter after the soup, and drank a glass of cider. Then they remained motionless in their chairs, with scarcely a glimmer of light, the little servant girl having carried off the candle in order to wash the spoons, wipe the glasses, and cut the crusts of bread to be ready for the next morning's breakfast. There was a knock at the door, which was immediately opened, and the priest appeared. The old man raised toward him an anxious eye full of suspicion, and, foreseeing danger, he was getting ready to climb up his ladder. When the Abbe Raffan laid his hand on his shoulder and shouted close to his temple, "'I want to have a talk with you, Father Amable.' Césaire had disappeared, taking advantage of the door being open. He did not want to listen, for he was afraid and did not want his hopes to crumble slowly with each obstinate refusal of his father. He preferred to learn the truth at once, good or bad, later on, and he went out into the night. It was a moonless, starless night, one of those misty nights, when the air seems thick with humidity. A vague odor of apples floated through the farmyard, for it was the season when the earliest apples were still gathered, the early ripe, as they are called in the cider country. As Césaire passed along the cattle sheds, the warm smell of living beasts asleep on manure was exhaled through the narrow windows, and he heard the stamping of the horses, who were standing at the end of the stable, and the sound of their jaws tearing and munching the hay on the racks. He went straight ahead, thinking about Celeste. In this simple nature, whose ideas were scarcely more than images generated directly by objects, thoughts of love only formulated themselves by calling up before the mind the picture of a big red-haired girl standing in a hollow road and laughing with their hands on her hips. It was thus he saw her on the day when he first took a fancy to her. He had, however, known her from infancy, but never had he been so struck by her as on that morning. They had stopped to talk for a few minutes, and then he went away, and as he walked along, he kept repeating, "'Faith, she's a fine girl all the same. Tis a pity she made a slip with Victor.' Till evening he kept thinking of her, and also on the following morning. When he saw her again, he felt something tickling the end of his throat, as if a cock's feather had been driven through his mouth into his chest, and since then, every time he found himself near her, he was astonished at this nervous tickling which always commenced again. In three months he made up his mind to marry her, so much did she please him. He could not have said whence came this power over him, but he explained it in these words, I am possessed by her, as if the desire for this girl within him were as dominating as one of the powers of hell. He scarcely bothered himself about her transgression. It was a pity, but, after all, it did her no harm, and he bore no grudge against Victor Lecoq. But if the curé should not succeed, what was he to do? He did not dare to think of it. The anxiety was such a torture to him. He reached the presbytery and seated himself near the little gateway to wait for the priest's return. He was there perhaps half an hour when he heard steps on the road, and although the night was very dark, he presently distinguished the still darker shadow of the cassock. He rose up, his legs giving way under him, not even venturing to speak, not daring to ask a question. The clergyman perceived him and said gaily, "'Well, my lad, it's all right.' Césaire stammered, all right. Tisn't possible. Yes, my lad, but not without trouble. What an old ass your father is. The peasant repeated, Tisn't possible. Why, yes. Come and look me up tomorrow at midday in order to settle about the publication of the bands. The young man seized the curious hand. He pressed it, shook it, bruised it as he stammered, True, 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 monsieur le curé. On the word of an honest man, you'll see me tomorrow at your sermon. 
The wedding took place in the middle of December. It was simple, the bridal pair not being rich. Césaire, attired in new clothes, was ready since eight o'clock in the morning to go and fetch his betrothed and bring her to the mayor's office, but it was too early. He seated himself before the kitchen table and waited for the members of the family and the friends who were to accompany him. For the last eight days it had been snowing, and the brown earth, the earth already fertilized by the autumn sowing, had become dead white, sleeping under a great sheet of ice. It was cold in the thatched houses adorned with white caps, and the round apples in the trees of the enclosure seemed to be flowering, covered with white as they had been in the pleasant month of their blossoming. This day the big clouds to the north, the big great snow clouds, had disappeared, and the blue sky showed itself above the white earth on which the rising sun cast silvery reflections. Césaire looked straight before him through the window, thinking of nothing, quite happy. The door opened, two women entered, peasant women in their Sunday clothes, the aunt and the cousin of the bridegroom, then three men, his cousins, then a woman who was his neighbor. They sat down on chairs and remained, motionless and silent, the women on one side of the kitchen, the men on the other, suddenly seized with timidity, with that embarrassed sadness which takes possession of the people assembled for a ceremony. One of the cousins soon asked, "'Is it not the hour?' Césaire replied, I am much afraid it is. Come on, let us start, said another. Those rose up. Then Césaire, whom a feeling of uneasiness had taken possession of, climbed up the ladder of the loft to see whether his father was ready. The old man, always as a rule an early riser, had not yet made his appearance. His son found him on his bed of straw, wrapped up in his blanket, with his eyes open and a malicious gleam in them. He bawled into his ear, Come, Daddy, get up, it's time for the wedding. The deaf man murmured in a doleful tone, I can't get up. I have a sort of chill over me that freezes my back. I can't stir. The young man, dumbfounded, stared at him, guessing that this was a dodge. Come, Daddy, you must make an effort. I can't do it. Look here, I'll help you. And while he stooped toward the old man, pulled off his blanket, caught him by the arm, and lifted him up, but old Amable began to whine, Ooh, 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 what's suffering? Ooh, I can't. My back is stiffened up. The cold wind must have rushed through this cursed roof. Well, you'll get no dinner, as I'm having a spread at Polite's Inn. This will teach you what comes of acting mulishly. And he hurried down the ladder and started out, accompanied by his relatives and guests. The men had turned up the bottoms of their trousers so as not to get them wet in the snow. The women held up their petticoats and showed their lean ankles with gray woolen stockings and their bony shanks resembling broomsticks. And they all moved forward with a swinging gait, one behind the other, without uttering a word moving cautiously for fear of losing the road which was hidden beneath the flat, uniform, uninterrupted stretch of snow. As they approached the farmhouses, they saw one or two persons waiting to join them, and the procession went on without stopping and wound its way forward, following the invisible outlines of the road, so that it resembled a living chaplet of black beads undulating through the white countryside. In front of the bride's door, a large group was stamping up and down the open space awaiting the bridegroom. When he appeared, they gave him a loud greeting, and presently Celeste came forth from her room, clad in a blue dress, her shoulders covered with a small red shawl, and her head adorned with orange flowers. But everyone asked Césaire, "'Where's your father?' He replied with embarrassment, "'He couldn't move on account of the pains,' and the farmers tossed their heads with a sly and credulous air. They directed their steps toward the mayor's office. Behind the pair about to be wedded, a peasant woman carried Victor's child as if it were going to be baptized, and the peasants, in pairs now, with arms linked, walked through the snow with the movements of a sloop at sea. After having been united by the mayor in a little municipal house, the pair were made one by the curé, in his turn, in the modest house of God. He blessed their union by promising them fruitfulness, then he preached to them on the matrimonial virtues, the simple and healthful virtues of the country, work, concord, and fidelity, while the child, who was cold, began to fret behind the bride. As soon as the couple reappeared on the threshold of the church, shots were discharged from the ditch of the cemetery. Only the barrels of guns could be seen, whence came forth rapid jets of smoke, then a head could be seen gazing at the processions. It was Victor Lecoq celebrating the marriage of his old sweetheart, wishing her happiness and sending her his good wishes with explosions of powder. He had employed some friends of his, five or six laboring men, for these salvos of musketry. It was considered a nice attention. The repast was given in Polite Cash Prunes Inn. Twenty covers were laid in the great hall where people dined on market days, and the big leg of mutton turning before the spit, the fowls browned under their own gravy, the chitterlings sputtering over the bright clear fire filled the house with a thick odor of live coals sprinkled with fat, the powerful, heavy odor of rustic fare. They sat down to table at midday, and the soup was poured at once into the plates. All faces had already brightened up, mouths open to utter loud jokes, and eyes were laughing with knowing winks. 
They were going to amuse themselves, and no mistake. The door opened, and old Amable appeared. He seemed in a bad humor, and his face wore a scowl as he dragged himself forward on his sticks, whining at every step to indicate his suffering. As soon as they saw him, they stopped talking. But suddenly his neighbor, Daddy Malavoir, a big joker who knew all the little tricks and ways of people, began to yell, as Césaire used to do, by making a speaking trumpet of his hands. "'Hello, my cute old boy. You have a good nose on you to be able to smell Polite's cookery from your own house.' A roar of laughter burst forth from the throats of those present. Malavoir, excited by his success, went on. "'There's nothing for the rheumatics like a chitterling poultice. It keeps your belly warm along with a glass of three six. The men uttered shouts, banged the table with their fists, laughed, bending on one side and raising up their bodies again as if they were working a pump. The women clucked like hens, while the servants wriggled, standing against the walls. Old Amable was the only one that did not laugh, and, without making any reply, waited till they made room for him. They found a place for him in the middle of the table, facing his daughter-in-law, and, as soon as he was seated, he began to eat. It was his son who was paying, after all, it was right that he should take his share. With each ladle full of soup that went into his stomach, with each mouthful of bread or meat crushed between his gums, with each glass of cider or wine that flowed through his gullet, he thought he was regaining something of his own property, getting back a little of his money which all those gluttons were devouring, saving, in fact, a portion of his own means, and he ate in silence with the obstinacy of a miser who hides his coppers, with the same gloomy persistence with which he formerly performed his daily labors. But all of a sudden he noticed at the end of the table Celeste's child on a woman's lap, and his eye remained fixed on the little boy. He went on eating, with his glance riveted on the youngster, into whose mouth the woman who minded him every now and then put a little morsel which he nibbled at, and the old man suffered more from the few mouthfuls sucked by this little chap than from all that the others swallowed. The meal lasted till evening, then everyone went back home. Césaire raised up old Amable. "'Come, Daddy, we must go home,' said he, and he put the old man's two sticks in his hands. Celeste took her child in her arms, and they went on slowly through the pale night whitened by the snow. The deaf old man, three-fourths tipsy, and even more malicious under the influence of drink, refused to go forward. Several times he even sat down with the object of making his daughter-in-law catch cold, and he kept whining without uttering a word, giving vent to a sort of continuous groaning as if he were in pain. When they reached home, he at once climbed up to his loft, while Césaire made a bed for the child near the deep niche where he was going to lie down with his wife but as the newly wedded pair could not sleep immediately, they heard the old man for a long time moving about on his bed of straw, and he even talked aloud several times. Whether it was that he was dreaming, or that he let his thoughts escape through his mouth in spite of himself, not being able to keep them back, under the obsession of a fixed idea. When he came down his ladder the next morning, he saw his daughter-in-law looking after the housekeeping. She cried out to him, "'Come, Daddy, hurry on, here's some good soup.' and she placed at the end of the table the round black earthen bowl filled with steaming liquid. He sat down without giving any answer, seized the hot bowl, warmed his hands with it in a customary fashion, and, as it was very cold, even pressed it against his breast to try to make a little of the living heat of the boiling liquid enter into him, into his old body stiffened by so many winters. Then he took his sticks and went out into the fields, covered with ice, till it was time for dinner, for he had seen Celeste's youngster still asleep in a big soapbox. He did not take his place in the household. He lived in the thatched house as in bygone days, but he seemed not to belong to it any longer, to be no longer interested in anything, to look upon those people, his son, his wife, and the child, as strangers whom he did not know, to whom he never spoke. The winter glided by, it was long and severe. Then the early spring made the seeds sprout forth again, and the peasants once more, like laborious ants, passed their days in the fields, toiling from morning till night, under the wind and under the rain, along the furrows of brown earth which had brought forth the bread of men. The year promised well for the newly married pair. The crops grew thick and strong, there were no late frosts, and the apples bursting into bloom scattered on the grass their rosy white snow, which promised a hail of fruit for the autumn. Césaire toiled hard, rose early, and left off work late, in order to save the expense of a hired man. His wife said to him sometimes, "'You'll make yourself ill in the long run.' He replied, "'Certainly not. I'm a good judge.' Nevertheless, one evening he came home so fatigued that he had to go to bed without supper. He rose the next morning at the usual hour, but could not eat, in spite of his fast on the previous night, and he had to come back to the house in the middle of the afternoon in order to go to bed again. In the course of the night he began to cough. He turned round on his straw couch, feverish, with his forehead burning, his tongue dry, and his throat parched by a burning thirst. However, at daybreak he went toward his grounds, 
but next morning the doctor had to be sent for and pronounced him very ill with inflammation of the lungs. And he no longer left the dark recess in which he slept. He could be heard coughing, gasping, and tossing about in this hole. In order to see him, to give his medicine, and to apply cupping glasses, they had to bring a candle to the entrance. Then one could see his narrow head with his long matted beard underneath a thick lacework of spider's webs, which hung and floated when stirred by the air, and the hands of the sick man seemed dead under the dingy sheets. Celeste watched him with restless activity, made him take physic, applied blisters to him, went back and forth in the house, while old Amable remained at the edge of his loft, watching at a distance the gloomy cavern where his son lay dying. He did not come near him through hatred of the wife, sulking like an ill-tempered dog. Six more days passed. Then one morning, Celeste, who now slept on the ground on two loose bundles of straw, was going to see whether her man was better. She no longer heard his rapid breathing from the interior of his recess. Terror-stricken, she asked, "'Well, Césaire, what sort of a night had you?' He did not answer. She put out her hand to touch him, and the flesh on his face felt cold as ice. She uttered a great cry, the long cry of a woman overpowered with fright. He was dead. At this cry the deaf old man appeared at the top of his ladder, and when he saw Celeste rushing to call for help, he quickly descended, placed his hand on his son's face, and suddenly realizing what had happened, went to shut the door from the inside, to prevent the wife from re-entering and resuming possession of the dwelling, since his son was no longer living. Then he sat down on a chair by the dead man's side. Some of the neighbors arrived, called out, and knocked. He did not hear them. One of them broke the glass of the window and jumped into the room. Others followed. The door was opened again and Celeste reappeared, all in tears, with swollen face and bloodshot eyes. Then old Amable vanquished, without uttering a word, climbed back into the loft. The funeral took place the next morning. Then, after the ceremony, the father-in-law and the daughter-in-law found themselves alone in the farmhouse with the child. It was the usual dinner hour. She lighted the fire, made some soup, and placed the plates on the table, while the old man sat on the chair waiting without appearing to look at her. When the meal was ready, she bawled in his ear, "'Come, Daddy, you must eat!' He rose up, took his seat at the end of the table, emptied the soup bowl, masticated his bread and butter, drank his two glasses of cider, and then took himself off. It was one of those warm days, one of those enjoyable days when life ferments, pulsates, blooms all over the surface of the soil. Old Amable pursued a little path across the fields, he looked at the young wheat and the young oats, thinking that his son was now under the earth, his poor boy. He walked along wearily, dragging his legs after him in a limping fashion. And as he was all alone in the plain, all alone under the blue sky, in the midst of the growing crops, all alone with the larks which he saw hovering above his head without hearing their light song, he began to weep as he proceeded on his way. Then he sat down beside a pond and remained there till evening, gazing at the little birds that came there to drink. Then as the night was falling, he returned to the house, supped without saying a word, and climbed up to his loft, and his life went on as in the past. Nothing was changed, except that his son Césaire slept in the cemetery. What could he, an old man, do? He could work no longer, he was now good for nothing except to swallow the soup prepared by his daughter-in-law, and he ate it in silence, morning and evening, watching with an eye of rage the little boy also taking soup, right opposite him, at the other side of the table. Then he would go out, prowl about the fields after the fashion of a vagabond, hiding behind the barns where he would sleep for an hour or two as if he were afraid of being seen, and then come back at the approach of night. But Celeste's mind began to be occupied by graver anxieties. The farm needed a man to look after it and cultivate it. Somebody should be there always to go through the fields, not a mere hired laborer, but a regular farmer, a master who understood the business and would take an interest in the farm. A lone woman could not manage the farming, watch the price of corn, and direct the sale and purchase of cattle. Then ideas came into her head, simple practical ideas, which she had turned over in her head at night. She could not marry again before the end of the year, and it was necessary at once to take care of pressing interests, immediate interests. Only one man could help her out of her difficulties, Victor Lecoq, the father of her child. He was strong and understood farming. With a little money in his pocket, he would make an excellent cultivator. She was aware of his skill, having known him when he was working on her parents' farm. So one morning, seeing him passing along the road with a cart of manure, she went out to meet him. When he perceived her, he drew up his horses, and she said to him, as if she had met him the night before, "'Good morrow, Victor. Are you quite well, the same as ever?' He replied, "'I'm quite well, the same as ever. And how are you?' "'Oh, I'd be all right, only that I'm alone in the house, which bothers me on account of the farm.' Then they remained chatting for a long time, leaning against the wheel of the heavy cart. The man every now and then lifted up his cap to scratch his forehead and began thinking, while she, with flushed cheeks, went on talking warmly, told him about her views, her plans, her projects for the future. At last he said in a low tone, Yes, it can be done. 
She opened her hand like a countryman clinching a bargain and asked, Is it agreed? He pressed her outstretched hand. Tis agreed. It's settled then for next Sunday? It's settled for next Sunday. Well, good morning, Victor. Good morning, Madame Holbrecht. This particular Sunday was the day of the village festival, the annual festival in honor of the patron saint, which in Normandy is called the Assembly. For the last eight days, quaint-looking vehicles, in which live the families of strolling fair exhibitors, lottery managers, keepers of shooting galleries, and other forms of amusement, or exhibitors of curiosities, whom the peasants call wonder-makers, could be seen coming along the roads drawn slowly by gray or sorrel horses. The dirty wagons with their floating curtains, accompanied by a melancholy-looking dog, who trotted with his head down between the wheels, drew up one after the other on the green in front of the town hall. Then a tent was erected in front of each ambulant abode, and inside this tent could be seen, through the holes in the canvas, glittering things which excited the envy or the curiosity of the village youngsters. As soon as the morning of the fete arrived, all the booths were opened, displaying their splendors of glass or porcelain, and the peasants on their way to mass looked with genuine satisfaction at these modest shops, which they saw again, nevertheless, each succeeding year. Early in the afternoon there was a crowd on the green. From every neighboring village the farmers arrived, shaken along with their wives and their children in two-wheeled open chars a banques, which rattled along, swaying like cradles. They unharnessed at their friends' houses, and the farmyards were filled with strange-looking traps, gray, high, lean, crooked, like long-clawed creatures from the depths of the sea. And each family, with the youngsters in front and the grown-up ones behind, came to the assembly with tranquil steps, smiling countenances and open hands, big hands, red and bony, accustomed to work and apparently tired of their temporary rest. A clown was blowing a trumpet. The barrel organ accompanying the carousel sent through the air its shrill, jerky notes. The lottery wheel made a whirring sound like that of cloth tearing, and every moment the crack of the rifle could be heard, and the slow-moving throng passed on quietly in front of the booths resembling paste in a fluid condition, with the motions of a flock of sheep and the awkwardness of heavy animals who had escaped by chance. The girls, holding one another's arms in groups of six or eight, were singing. The youths followed them, making jokes, with their caps over their ears and their blouses stiffened with starch, swollen out like blue balloons. The whole countryside was there, masters, laboring men, and women servants. Old Amble himself, wearing his old-fashioned green frock coat, had wished to see the assembly, for he never failed to attend on such an occasion. He looked at the lotteries, stopped in front of the shooting galleries to criticize the shots, and interested himself specially in a very simple game, which consisted in throwing a big wooden ball into the open mouth of a mannequin carved and painted on a board. Suddenly he felt a tap on his shoulder. It was Daddy Malavoir who exclaimed, Ha! Come and have a glass of brandy. And they sat down at the table of an open-air restaurant. They drank one glass of brandy, then two, then three, and Old Amable once again began wandering through the assembly. His thoughts became slightly confused. He smiled without knowing why. He smiled in front of the lotteries, in front of the wooden horses, and especially in front of the killing game. He remained there a long time, filled with delight, when he saw a holiday maker knocking down the gendarme or the curé, two authorities whom he instinctively distrusted. Then he went back to the inn and drank a glass of cider to cool himself. It was late. Night came on. A neighbor came to warn him, "'You'll get back home late for the stew, Daddy.' Then he set out on his way to the farmhouse. A soft shadow, the warm shadow of a spring night, was slowly descending on the earth. When he reached the front door, he thought he saw through the window, which was lighted up, two persons in the house. He stopped, much surprised, when he went in, and he saw Victor Lecoq seated at the table, with a plate filled with potatoes before him, taking his supper in the very same place where his son had sat. And he turned round suddenly as if he wanted to go away. The night was very dark now. Celeste started up and shouted at him, "'Come quick, here's some good stew to finish off the assembly with.' He complied through inertia and sat down, watching in turn the man, the woman, and the child. He then he began to eat quietly, as on ordinary days. Victor Lecoq seemed quite at home, talked from time to time to Celeste, took up the child in his lap and kissed him. And Celeste again served him with food, poured out drink for him, and appeared happy while speaking to him. Old Amable's eyes followed them attentively, though he could not hear what they were saying. When he had finished supper, and he had scarcely eaten anything, there was such a weight in his heart, he rose up, and instead of ascending to his loft as he did every night, he opened the gate of the yard and went out into the open air. When he had gone, Celeste, a little uneasy, asked, "'What is he going to do?' Victor replied in an indifferent tone, "'Don't bother yourself. He'll come back when he's tired.' Then she saw after the house, washed the plates and wiped the table, while the man quietly took off his clothes. Then he slipped into the dark and hollow bed in which she had slept with Cider. The yard gate opened and Old Amable again appeared. As soon as he entered the house, he looked round on every side with the air of an old dog on the scent. 
He was in search of Victor Lecoq. As he did not see him, he took the candle off the table and approached the dark niche in which his son had died. In the interior of it, he perceived the man lying under the bedclothes and already asleep. Then the deaf man noiselessly turned around, put back the candle, and went out into the yard. Celeste had finished her work. She put her son into his bed, arranged everything, and waited for her father-in-law's return before lying down herself. She remained sitting on a chair, without moving her hands and with her eyes fixed on vacancy. As he did not come back, she murmured in a tone of impatience and annoyance, "'This good-for-nothing man will make us burn four sous' worth of candles.' Victor answered from under the bedclothes, "'It's over an hour since he went out. We ought to see whether he fell asleep on the bench outside the door.' "'I'll go and see,' she said. She rose up, took the light, and went out, shading the light with her hand in order to see through the darkness. She saw nothing in front of the door, nothing on the bench, nothing on the dung heap, where the old man used sometimes to sit in hot weather. But just as she was to the point of going in again, she chanced to raise her eyes toward the big apple tree, which sheltered the entrance to the farmyard, and suddenly she saw two feet, two feet at the height of her face, belonging to a man who was hanging. She uttered terrible cries. Victor! 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 He ran out in his shirt. She could not utter another word, and turning aside her head so as not to see, she pointed to the tree with her outstretched arm. Not understanding what she meant, he took the candle in order to find out, and in the midst of the foliage lit up from below, he saw old Amable hanging high up with a stable halter around his neck. A ladder was leaning against the trunk of the apple tree. Victor ran to fetch a billhook, climbed up the tree and cut the halter, but the old man was already cold, and his tongue protruded frightfully with a terrible grimace. End of section 127. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 128 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 128. The Christening. Well, doctor, a little brandy? With pleasure. The old ship surgeon, holding out his glass, watched it as it slowly filled with the golden liquid. Then, holding it in front of his eyes, he let the light from the lamp stream through it, smelled it, tasted a few drops, and smacked his lips with relish. Then he said, Ah, the charming poison, or rather the seductive murderer, the delightful destroyer of peoples. You people do not know it the way I do. You may have read that admirable book entitled La Sommoir, but you have not, as I have, seen alcohol exterminate a whole tribe of savages, a little kingdom of negroes, alcohol calmly unloaded by the barrel by red-bearded English seamen. Right near here, in a little village in Brittany near pont la Bay, I once witnessed a strange and terrible tragedy caused by alcohol. I was spending my vacation in a little country house left for me by my father. You know this flat coast where the wind whistles day and night, where one sees, standing or prone, these giant rocks which in the olden times were regarded as guardians, and which still retain something majestic and imposing about them? I always expect to see them come to life and start to walk across the country with the slow and ponderous tread of giants, or to unfold enormous granite wings and fly toward the paradise of the druids. Everywhere is the sea, always ready on the slightest provocation to rise in its anger and shake its foamy mane at those bold enough to brave its warmth. And the men who travel on this terrible sea, which, with one motion of its green back, can overturn and swallow up their frail barks, they go out in the little boats, day and night, hardy, weary, and drunk. They are often drunk. They have a saying which says, When the bottle is full, you see the reef, but when it is empty, you see it no more. Go into one of their huts, you will never find the father there. If you ask the woman what has become of her husband, she will stretch her arms out over the dark ocean which rumbles and roars along the coast. He remained there one night, when he had had too much to drink, so did her oldest son. She has four more big, strong, fair-haired boys. Soon it will be their time. As I said, I was living in a little house near pont la Bay. I was there alone with my servant, an old sailor, and with a native family which took care of the grounds in my absence. It consisted of three persons, two sisters and a man, who had married one of them, and who attended to the garden. A short time before Christmas, my gardener's wife presented him with a boy. The husband asked me to stand as godfather. I could hardly deny the request, and so he borrowed ten francs from me for the cost of the christening, as he said. The second day of January was chosen as the date of the ceremony. For a week the earth had been covered by an enormous white carpet of snow, which made this flat, low country seem vast and limitless. The ocean appeared to be black in contrast with this white plain. One could see it rolling, raging, and tossing its waves as though wishing to annihilate its pale neighbor which appeared to be dead. It was so calm, quiet, and cold. At nine o'clock, the father, Karandek, came to my door with his sister-in-law, the big Kermigan, and the nurse, who carried the infant wrapped up in a blanket. We started for the church. 
The weather was so cold that it seemed to dry up the skin and crack it open. I was thinking of the poor little creature who was being carried on ahead of us, and I said to myself that this Breton race must surely be of iron, if their children were able, as soon as they were born, to stand such an outing. We came to the church, but the door was closed. The priest was late. Then the nurse sat down on one of the steps and began to undress the child. At first I thought there must have been some slight accident, but I saw that they were leaving the poor little fellow naked, completely naked, in the icy air. Furious at such imprudence, I protested. Why, you are crazy. You will kill the child. The woman answered quietly, Oh, no, sir. He must wait naked before the Lord. The father and the aunt looked on undisturbed. It was the custom. If it were not adhered to, misfortune was sure to attend the little one. I scolded, threatened, and pleaded. I used force to try to cover the frail creature. All was in vain. The nurse ran away from me through the snow, and the body of the little one turned purple. I was about to leave these brutes when I saw the priest coming across the country, followed by the sexton and a young boy. I ran towards him and gave vent to my indignation. He showed no surprise, nor did he quicken his pace in the least. He answered, What can you expect, sir? It's the custom. They all do it, and it's of no use trying to stop them. But at least hurry up, I cried. He answered, But I can't go any faster. He entered the vestry while we remained outside on the church steps. I was suffering. But what about the poor little creature who was howling from the effects of being cold? At last the door opened. We went into the church, but the poor child had to remain naked throughout the ceremony. It was interminable. The priest stammered over Latin words and mispronounced them horribly. He walked slowly and with a ponderous tread. His white surplice chilled my heart. It seemed as though, in the name of a pitiless and barbarous god, he had wrapped himself in another kind of snow in order to torture this little piece of humanity that suffered so from the cold. Finally, the christening was finished according to the rites, and I saw the nurse once more take the frozen, moaning child and wrap it up in the blanket. The priest said to me, Do you wish to sign the register? Turning to my gardener, I said, Hurry up and get home quickly so that you can warm that child. I gave him some advice so as to ward off, if not too late, a bad attack of pneumonia. He promised to follow my instructions and left with his sister-in-law and the nurse. I followed the priest into the vestry, and when I had signed, he demanded five francs for expenses. As I had already given the father ten francs, I refused to pay twice. The priest threatened to destroy the paper and to annul the ceremony. I, in turn, threatened him with the district attorney. The dispute was long, and I finally paid five francs. As soon as I reached home, I went down to Carindex to find out whether everything was all right. Neither father, nor sister-in-law, nor your nurse had yet returned. The mother, who had remained alone, was in bed, shivering with cold and starving, for she had had nothing to eat since the day before. "'Where the deuce can they have gone?' I asked." She answered without surprise or anger, They're going to drink something to celebrate. It was the custom. Then I thought of my ten francs, which were to pay the church, and would doubtless pay for the alcohol. I sent some broth to the mother and ordered a good fire to be built in the room. I was uneasy and furious, and promised myself to drive out these brutes, wondering with terror what was going to happen to the poor infant. It was already six, and they had not yet returned. I told my servant to wait for them, and I went to bed. I soon fell asleep and slept like a top. At daybreak, I was awakened by my servant, who was bringing me my hot water. As soon as my eyes were open, I asked, "'How about Carindec?' The man hesitated and then stammered, "'Oh, he came back all right after midnight, and so drunk he couldn't walk, and so were Kermagan and the nurse. I guess they must have slept in a ditch, for the little one died and they never even noticed it.' I jumped up out of bed, crying, "'What? The child is dead?' "'Yes, sir. They brought it back to Mother Carindec. When she saw it, she began to cry, and now they are making her drink to console her.' What's that? They're making her drink. Yes, sir, I only found it out this morning. As Carindec had no more brandy or money, he took some wood alcohol, which Monsieur gave him for the lamp, and all four of them are now drinking that. The mother is feeling pretty sick now. I had hastily put on some clothes, and seizing a stick with the intention of applying it to the backs of these human beasts, I hastened towards the gardener's house. The mother was raving drunk beside the blue body of her dead baby. Carindec, the nurse, and the Kermagan woman were snoring on the floor. I had to take care of the mother, who died towards noon. The old doctor was silent. He took up the brandy bottle and poured out another glass. He held it up to the lamp, and the light streaming through it imparted to the liquid the amber color of molten topaz. With one gulp, he swallowed the treacherous drink. End of section 128. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 129 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. The Sleepervox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 129, The Farmer's Wife. Said the bear and René de Tres to me, 
Will you come and open the hunting season with me at my farm at Marville? I shall be delighted if you will, my dear boy. In the first place, I am all alone. It is rather a difficult ground to get at, and the place I live in is so primitive that I can only invite my most intimate friends. I accepted his invitation, and on Saturday we set off the train going to Normandy. We alighted at a station called Amuver, and Baron René, pointing to a carryall drawn by a timid horse and driven by a big countryman with white hair, said, Here is our equipage, my dear boy. The driver extended his hand to his landlord, and the Baron pressed it warmly, asking, Well, Maître Le Brumont, how are you? Always the same, Monsieur Le Baron. We jumped into his swinging hen coop perched on two enormous wheels, and the young horse, after a violent swerve, started into a gallop, pitching us into the air like balls. Every fall backward on the wooden bench gave me the most dreadful pain. The peasant kept repeating in his calm, monotonous voice, There, there, all right, all right, Moutard, all right. But Moutard scarcely heard and kept capering along like a goat. Our two dogs behind us, in the empty part of the hen coop, were standing up and sniffing the air of the plains where they scented game. The baron gazed with a sad eye into the distance at the vast Norman landscape, undulating in melancholy, like an immense English park, where the farmyards, surrounded by two or four rows of trees and full of dwarfed apple trees which hid the houses, gave a vista as far as the eye could see of forest trees, copses, and shrubberies such as landscape gardeners look for in laying out the boundaries of princely estates. And René de Treyes suddenly exclaimed, I love the soil, I have my very roots in it. He was a pure Norman, tall and strong, with a slight paunch, and of the old race of adventurers who went to found kingdoms on the shores of every ocean. He was about fifty years of age, ten years less, perhaps, than the farmer who was driving us. The latter was a lean peasant, all skin and bone, one of those men who live a hundred years. After two hours traveling over stony roads, across that green and monotonous plain, the vehicle entered one of those orchard farmyards and drew up before an old structure falling into decay, where an old maid servant stood waiting beside a young fellow who took charge of the horse. We entered the farmhouse. The smoky kitchen was high and spacious. The copper utensils and the crockery shone in the reflection of the hearth. A cat lay asleep on a chair, a dog under the table. One perceived an odor of milk, apples, smoke, that indescribable smell peculiar to old farmhouses, the odor of the earth, of the walls, of furniture, the odor of spilled stale soup, of former wash days and of former inhabitants, the smell of animals and of human beings combined, of things and of persons, the odor of time and of things that have passed away. I went out to have a look in the farmyard. It was very large, full of apple trees, dwarfed and crooked, and laden with fruit which fell on the grass around them. In this farmyard, the Norman smell of apples was as strong as that of the bloom of orange trees on the shores of the south of France. Four rows of beeches surrounded this enclosure. They were so tall that they seemed to touch the clouds at this hour of nightfall, and their summits, through which the night winds passed, swayed and sang a mournful, interminable song. I re-entered the house. The baron was warming his feet at the fire and was listening to the farmers talk about country matters. He talked about marriages, births, and deaths, then about the fall on the price of grain and the latest news about cattle. The Villard, as he called a cow that had been bought at the fair ville, had calved in the middle of June. The cider had not been first class last year. Apricots were almost disappearing from the country. Then we had dinner. It was a good rustic meal, simple and abundant, long and tranquil. And while we were dining, I noticed the special kind of friendly familiarity which had struck me from the start between the baron and the peasant. Outside, the beaches continued sighing in the night wind, and our two dogs, shut up in a shed, were whining and howling in an uncanny fashion. The fire was dying out in the big fireplace. The maid servant had gone to bed. Maître Le Brumont said in his turn, "'If you don't mind, Monsieur Le Baron, I'm going to bed. I'm not used to staying up late.' The baron extended his hand toward him and said, "'Go, my friend,' in so cordial a tone that I said, as soon as the man had disappeared, "'He is devoted to you, this farmer.' "'Better than that, my dear fellow.' It is a drama, an old drama, simple and very sad, that attaches him to me. Here is the story. You know that my father was colonel in a cavalry regiment. His orderly was this young fellow, now an old man, the son of a farmer. When my father retired from the army, he took this former soldier, then about forty, as his servant. I was at that time about thirty. We were living in our old chateau of Valorenne, near Caudebec and Co. At this period, my mother's chambermaid was one of the prettiest girls you could see, fair-haired, slender, and sprightly in manner, a genuine soubrette of the old type that no longer exists. Today, these creatures spring up into hussies before their time. Paris, with the aid of the railways, attracts them, calls them, takes hold of them. As soon as they are budding into womanhood, these little sluts who in old times remain simple maidservants. Every man passing by, as recruiting sergeants did formerly, looking for recruits, with conscripts, entices, and ruins them, these foolish lassies, 
and we have now only the scum of the female sex for servant maids, all that is dull, nasty, common, and ill-formed, too ugly even for gallantry. Well, this girl was charming, and I often gave her a kiss in dark corners. Nothing more, I swear to you. She was virtuous, besides, and I had some respect for my mother's house, which is more than can be said of the blackguards of the present day. Now it happened that my manservant, the ex-soldier, the old farmer you have just seen, fell madly in love with this girl, perfectly daft. The first thing we noticed was that he forgot everything. He paid no attention to anything. My father said incessantly, "'See here, Jean, what's the matter with you? Are you ill?' He replied, "'No, no, Monsieur Le Baron, there's nothing the matter with me.' He grew thin. He broke glasses and let plates fall when waiting on the table. We thought he must have been attacked by some nervous affection and sent for the doctor, who thought he could detect symptoms of spinal disease. Then my father, full of anxiety about his faithful manservant, decided to place him in a private hospital. When the poor fellow heard of my father's intentions, he made a clean breast of it. Monsieur Le Baron, well, my boy, you see, the thing I want is not physic. Ha, ah, what is it then? It's marriage. My father turned round and stared at him in astonishment. What's that, you say? It's marriage. Marriage? So then, you jackass, you're in love. That's how it is, Monsieur Le Baron. And my father began to laugh so immoderately that my mother called through the wall of the next room. What in the world is the matter with you, Gontran? He replied, Come here, Catherine. And when she came in, he told her, with tears in his eyes from sheer laughter, that his idiot of a servant man was lovesick. But my mother, instead of laughing, was deeply affected. Who is it that you have fallen in love with, my poor fellow? she asked. He answered without hesitation, With Louise, Madame Le Baron. My mother said with the utmost gravity, we must try to arrange this matter the best way we can. So Louise was sent for and questioned by my mother, and she said in reply that she knew all about Jean's liking for her, that in fact Jean had spoken to her about it several times, but that she did not want him. She refused to say why. And two months elapsed, during which my father and mother never ceased to urge this girl to marry Jean. As she declared she was not in love with any other man, she could not give any serious reason for her refusal. My father at last overcame her resistance by means of a big present of money and started the pair of them on a farm, this very farm. I did not see them for three years, and then I learned that Louise had died of consumption. But my father and mother died too in their turn, and it was two years more before I found myself face to face with Jean. At last one autumn day about the end of October, the idea came into my head to go hunting on this part of my estate, which my father told me was full of game. So one evening, a wet evening, I arrived at this house. I was shocked to find my father's old servant with perfectly white hair, though it was not more than forty-five or forty-six years of age. I made him dine with me at the very table where we are now sitting. It was raining hard. We could hear the rain battering the roof, the walls, and the windows, flowing in a perfect deluge into the farmyard, and my dog was howling in the shed where the other dogs are howling tonight. All of a sudden, when the servant maid had gone to bed, the man said in a timid voice, Monsieur Le Baron, what is it, my dear Jean? I have something to tell you. Tell it, my dear Jean. You remember Louise, my wife. Certainly I remember her. Well, she left me a message for you. What was it? Ah, uh, ah, uh, well, it was what you might call a confession. Ha, huh, and uh, what was it about? It was, it was... I'd rather all the same tell you nothing about it, but I must, I must. Well, it's this. It wasn't consumption she died of at all. It was grief. Well, that's the long and short of it. As soon as she came to live here after we were married, she grew thin. She changed so that you wouldn't know her, Monsieur Le Baron. She was just as I was before I married her, but it was just the opposite. Just the opposite. I sent for the doctor. He said it was her liver that was affected. He said it was what he called a hepatic complaint. I don't know these big words, Monsieur Le Baron. Then I bought medicine for her. Heaps on heaps of bottles that cost about three hundred francs. But she'd take none of them. She wouldn't have them. She said... It's no use, my poor Jean, it wouldn't do me any good. I saw well that she had some hidden trouble, and then I found her one time crying, and I didn't know what to do. No, I didn't know what to do. I bought her caps and dresses and hair oil and earrings, nothing did her any good, and I saw that she was going to die. And so one night at the end of November, one snowy night after she had been in bed the whole day, she told me to send for the curé. So I went for him. As soon as he came, Jean, she said, I am going to make a confession to you. I owe it to you, Jean. I have never been false to you, never, never, before or after you married me. Monsieur le curé is there, and I can tell you so, he knows my soul. Well, listen, Jean, if I am dying, it is because I was not able to console myself for leaving the chateau, because I was too fond of the young baron Monsieur René. Too fond of him, mind you, Jean, there was no harm in it. 
This is the thing that's killing me. When I could see him no more, I felt that I should die. If I could only have seen him, I might have lived. Only seen him, nothing more. I wish you'd tell him some day, by and by, when I am no longer here. You will tell him. Swear you will, Jean. Swear it. In the presence of Monsieur le Curé, it will console me to know that he will know it one day, that this was the cause of my death. Swear it. Well, I gave her my promise, Monsieur le Baron, and on the faith of an honest man I have kept my word. And he ceased speaking, his eyes filling with tears. Good God, my dear boy, you can't form any idea of the emotion that filled me when I heard this poor devil, whose wife I had killed without suspecting it, telling me this story on that wet night in this very kitchen. I exclaimed, Ah, oh, my poor Jean, my poor Jean. He murmured, Well, that's all, Monsieur le Baron. I could not help it one way or the other, and now it's all over. I caught his hand across the table, and I began to weep. He asked, Will you come and see her grave? I nodded assent, for I couldn't speak. He rose, lighted a lantern, and we walked through the blinding rain by the light of the lantern. He opened a gate, and I saw some crosses of black wood. Suddenly he stopped before a marble slab and said, There it is, and he flashed the lantern close to it so that I could read the inscription. To Louise Hortense Marinet, wife of Jean-Francois Le Brumont, farmer. She was a faithful wife, God rest her soul. We fell on our knees in the damp grass, he and I, with the lantern between us, and I saw the rain beating on the white marble slab, and I thought of the heart of her sleeping there in her grave. Poor heart. Poor heart. Since then I come here every year, and I don't know why, but I feel as if I were guilty of some crime in the presence of this man who always looks as if he forgave me. End of section 129. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 130 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 130. The Devil. The peasant and the doctor stood on opposite sides of the bed, beside the old dying woman. She was calm and resigned, and her mind quite clear as she looked at them and listened to their conversation. She was going to die, and she did not rebel at it, for her time had come as she was ninety-two. The July sun streamed in the window and the open door and cast its hot flames on the uneven brown clay floor, which had been stamped down by four generations of clodhoppers. The smell of the fields came in also, driven by the sharp wind and parched by the noontide heat. The grasshoppers chirped themselves hoarse and filled the country with their shrill noise, which was like that of the wooden toys which are sold to children at fair time. The doctor raised his voice and said, Honor, you cannot leave your mother in this state. She may die at any moment. And the peasant, in great distress, replied, But I must get in my wheat, for it has been lying on the ground a long time, and the weather is just right for it. What do you say about it, mother? And the dying old woman, still tormented by her Norman avariciousness, replied yes with her eyes and her forehead, and thus urged her son to get in his wheat and to leave her to die alone. But the doctor got angry, and stamping his foot, he said, You are no better than a brute, do you hear? And I will not allow you to do it. Do you understand? And if you must get in your wheat today... Go and fetch Rappé's wife and make her look after your mother. I will have it, do you understand me? And if you do not obey me, I will let you die like a dog when you are ill in your turn, do you hear? The peasant, a tall, thin fellow with slow movements, who was tormented by indecision, by his fear of the doctor and his fierce love of saving, hesitated, calculated, and stammered out, How much does La Rappé charge for attending sick people? How should I know? the doctor cried. That depends upon how long she is needed. Settle it with her by heaven but I want her to be here within an hour, do you hear? So the man decided. I will go for her, he replied. Don't get angry, doctor. And the latter left, calling out as he went. Be careful, be very careful, you know, for I do not joke when I am angry. As soon as they were alone, the peasant turned to his mother and said in a resigned voice, I will go and fetch La Rappe as the man will have it. Don't worry till I get back. And he went out in his turn. La Rappe was an old washerwoman, watched the dead and the dying of the neighborhood, and then, as soon as she had sewn her customers into that linen cloth from which they would emerge no more, she went and took up her iron to smooth out the linen of the living. Wrinkled like a last year's apple, spiteful, envious, avaricious, with a phenomenal avarice, bent double as if she had been broken in half across the loins by the constant motion of passing the iron over the linen, one might have said that she was a kind of abnormal and cynical love of a death struggle. She never spoke of anything but of the people she had seen die, of the various kinds of deaths at which she had been present, and she related with the greatest minuteness details which were always similar, just as a sportsman recounts his luck. When Envoy Bontemps entered her cottage, he found her preparing the starch for the collars of the women villagers, and he said, Good evening. 
I hope you are pretty well, Mother Repé. She turned her head round to look at him and said, As usual, as usual, and you? Oh, as for me, I am as well as I could wish, but my mother is not well. Your mother? Yes, my mother. What is the matter with her? She is going to turn up her toes, that's what's the matter of her. The old woman took her hands out of the water and asked with sudden sympathy, Is she as bad as all that? The doctor says she won't last until morning. Then she certainly is very bad. Honor hesitated, for he wanted to make a few preparatory remarks before coming to his proposition, but as he could hit upon nothing, he made up his mind suddenly. How much will you ask to stay with her till the end? You know that I am not rich, and I cannot afford to keep a servant girl. It is just that which has brought my poor mother to the state. Too much worry and fatigue. She did the work of ten in spite of her ninety-two years. You don't find any made of that stuff nowadays. La Rapay answered gravely, There are two prices. Forty sous by day and three francs by night for the rich, and twenty sous by day and forty by night for the others. You shall pay me the twenty and forty. But the peasant reflected, for he knew his mother well. He knew how tenacious of life, how vigorous and unyielding she was, and she might last another week in spite of the doctor's opinion. So he said resolutely, No, I would rather you would fix a price for the whole time until the end. I will take my chance one way or the other. The doctor says she will die very soon. If that happens, so much the better for you, and so much the worse for her. But if she holds out till tomorrow or longer, so much the better for her, and so much the worse for you. The nurse looked at the man in astonishment, for she had never treated death as a speculation, and she hesitated, tempted by the idea of the possible gain, but she suspected that he wanted to play her a trick. "'I can say nothing until I have seen your mother,' she replied. "'Then come with me and see her.' She washed her hands and went with him immediately. They did not speak on the road. She walked with short, hasty steps while he strode on with his long legs, as if he were crossing a brook at every step. The cows lying down in the fields, overcome by the heat, raised their heads heavily and lowed feebly at the two passers-by, as if to ask them for some green grass. When they got near the house, Honor Bontemps muttered, Suppose it is all over, and his unconscious wish that it might be showed itself in the sound of his voice. But the old woman was not dead. She was lying on her back on her wretched bed, her hands covered with a purple cotton counterpane, horribly thin, knotty hands like the claws of strange animals, like crabs, half closed with rheumatism, fatigue, and the work of nearly a century which she had accomplished. La Rape went up to the bed and looked at the dying woman, felt her pulse, tapped her on the chest, listened to her breathing, and asked her questions so as to hear her speak, and then, having looked at her for some time, she went out of the room, followed by Honor. Her decided opinion was that the old woman would not last till night. He asked, Well? And the sick nurse replied, Well, she may last two days, perhaps three. You have to give me six francs, everything included. Six francs? Six francs, he shouted. Are you out of your mind? I tell you, she cannot last more than five or six hours. And they disputed angrily for some time, but as the nurse said she must go home, as the time was going by, and as his wheat would not come to the farmyard of its own accord, he finally agreed to her terms. Very well, then, that is settled. Six francs, including everything, until the corpse is taken out. And he went away with long strides to his wheat which was lying on the ground under the hot sun which ripens the grain, and the sick nurse went in again to the house. She had brought some work with her, for she worked without ceasing by the side of the dead and dying, sometimes for herself, sometimes for the family which employed her as seamstress and paid her rather more in that capacity. Suddenly she asked, have you received the last sacraments, Mother Bonton? The old peasant woman shook her head, and La Rape, who was very devout, got up quickly. Good heavens, is it possible? I will go and fetch the curé. And she rushed off to the parsonage so quickly that the urchins in the street thought some accident had happened when they saw her running. The priest came immediately in his surplice, preceded by a choir boy who rang a bell to announce the passage of the host through the parched and quiet country. Some men who were working at a distance took off their large hats and remained motionless until the white vestment had disappeared behind some farm buildings. The women who were making up the sheaves stood up to make the sign of the cross. The frightened black hens ran away along the ditch until they reached a well-known hole, through which they suddenly disappeared, while a foal which was tied in a meadow took fright at the sight of the surplice and began to gallop round and round, kicking out every now and then. The acolyte in his red cassock walked quickly and the priest, with his head inclined toward one shoulder and his square beretta on his head, followed him, muttering some prayers, while last of all came La Rappe, bent almost double as if she wished to prostrate herself, as she walked with folded hands as they do in church. Honor saw them pass in the distance, and he asked, "'Where is our priest going?' His man, who was more intelligent, replied, "'He is taking the sacrament to your mother, of course.' 
The peasant was not surprised and said, that may be, and went on with his work. Mother Bontemps confessed, received absolution and communion, and the priest took his departure, leaving the two women alone in the suffocating room, while La Rapée began to look at the dying woman and to ask herself whether it could last much longer. The day was on the wane, and gusts of cooler air began to blow, causing a view of Epinal, which was fastened to the wall by two pins, to flap up and down. The scanty window curtains, which had formerly been white, but were now yellow and covered with fly specks, looked as if they were going to fly off, as if they were struggling to get away, like the old woman's soul. Lying motionless with her eyes open, she seemed to await with indifference that death which was so near and which yet delayed its coming. Her short breathing whistled in her constricted throat. It would stop altogether soon, and there would be one woman less in the world. No one would regret her. At nightfall, Honor returned, and when he went up to the bed and saw that his mother was still alive, he asked, How is she? Just as he had done formerly when she had been ailing. And then he sent La Rapée away, saying to her, Tomorrow morning at five o'clock without fail. And she replied, Tomorrow at five o'clock. She came at daybreak and found Honor eating his soup, which he had made himself before going to work, and the sick nurse asked him, Well, is your mother dead? She is rather better, on the contrary, he replied, with a sly look out of the corner of his eyes, and he went out. La Rapée, seized with anxiety, went up to the dying woman, who remained in the same state, lethargic and impassive, with her eyes open and her hands clutching the counterpane. The nurse perceived that this might go on thus for two days, four days, eight days, and her avaricious mind was seized with fear, while she was furious at the sly fellow who had tricked her, and the woman who would not die. Nevertheless, she began to work, and waited, looking intently at the wrinkled face of Mother Bontemps. When Honor returned to breakfast, he seemed quite satisfied, and even in a bantering humor. He was decidedly getting in his wheat under very favorable circumstances. La Rapée was becoming exasperated. Every minute now seemed to her so much time and money stolen from her. She felt a mad inclination to take this old woman, this headstrong old fool, this obstinate old wretch, and to stop her short, rapid breath, which was robbing her of her time and money, by squeezing her throat a little. But then she reflected on the danger of doing so, and other thoughts came into her head. So she went up to the bed and said, "'Have you ever seen the devil?' Mother Bonton murmured, No. Then the sick nurse began to talk and tell her tales which were likely to terrify the weak mind of the dying woman. Some minutes before one dies, the devil appears, she said, to all who are in the death throes. He has a broom in his hand, a saucepan on his head, and he utters loud cries. When anybody sees him, all is over, and that person has only a few moments longer to live. She then enumerated all those to whom the devil had appeared that year. Josephine Loisel, Eulalie Rattier, Sophie Pacadneau, Seraphine Grospied. Mother Bontemps, who had at last become disturbed in mind, moved about, wrung her hands, and tried to turn her head to look toward the end of the room. Suddenly, La Rapée disappeared at the foot of the bed. She took a sheet out of the cupboard and wrapped herself up in it. She put the iron saucepan on her head, so that its three short feet bent up like horns, and she took a broom in her right hand and a tin pail in her left, which she threw up suddenly so that it might fall to the ground noisily. When it came down, it certainly made a terrible noise. Then, climbing upon a chair, the nurse lifted up the curtain which hung at the bottom of the bed, and showed herself, gesticulating and uttering shrill cries into the iron saucepan which covered her face, while she menaced the old peasant woman, who was nearly dead, with her broom. Terrified, with an insane expression on her face, the dying woman made a superhuman effort to get up and escape. She even got her shoulders and chest out of bed. Then she fell back with a deep sigh. All was over, and La Rapée calmly put everything back into its place, the broom into the corner by the cupboard with the sheet inside it, the saucepan on the hearth, the pail on the floor, and the chair against the wall. Then, with professional movements, she closed the dead woman's large eyes, put a plate on the bed and poured some holy water into it, placing in it the twig of boxwood that had been nailed to the chest of drawers, and kneeling down, she fervently repeated the prayers for the dead, which she knew by heart as a matter of business. And when Anwar returned in the evening, he found her praying, and he calculated immediately that she had made twenty sous out of him, for she had only spent three days and one night there, which made five francs altogether, instead of six which he owed her. End of section 130. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 131 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 131. The Snipe. Old Baron de Raveau had for forty years been the champion sportsman of his province, but a stroke of paralysis had kept him in his chair for the last five or six years. He could now only shoot pigeons from the window of his drawing room or from the top of his high doorsteps. 
he spent his time reading. He was a good-natured businessman who had much of the literary spirit of a former century. He worshipped anecdotes, those little risque anecdotes, and also true stories of events that happened in his neighborhood. As soon as a friend came to see him, he asked, well, anything new? And he knew how to worm out information like an examining lawyer. On sunny days, he had his large reclining chair, similar to a bed, wheeled to the hall door. A man's servant behind him held his guns, loaded them, and handed them to his master. Another valet, hidden in the bushes, let fly a pigeon from time to time at irregular intervals, so that the baron should be unprepared and be always on the watch. And from morning till night he fired at the birds, much annoyed if he were taken by surprise, and laughing till he cried when the animal fell straight to the earth, or turned over in some comical and unexpected manner. He would turn to the man who was loading the gun and say, almost choking with laughter, "'Did that get him, Joseph? Did you see how he fell?' Joseph invariably replied, "'Oh, Monsieur Le Baron never misses them.' In autumn, when the shooting season opened, he invited his friends as he had done formerly, and loved to hear them firing in the distance. He counted the shots and was pleased when they followed each other rapidly, and in the evening he made each guest give a faithful account of his day. They remained three hours at table telling about their sport. They were strange and improbable adventures, in which the romancing spirit of the sportsman delighted. Some of them were memorable stories and were repeated regularly. The story of a rabbit that little Vicomte de Buril had missed in his vestibule convulsed them with laughter each year anew. Every five minutes, a fresh speaker would say, I heard, brr, brr, and a magnificent covey rose at ten paces from me. I aimed, piff, paff, and I saw a shower, a veritable shower of birds. There were seven of them. And they all went into raptures, amazed but reciprocally credulous. But there was an old custom in the house called the story of the snipe. Whenever this queen of birds was in season, the same ceremony took place at each dinner. As they worshipped this incomparable bird, each guest ate one every evening, but the heads were all left in the dish. Then the baron, acting the part of a bishop, had a plate brought to him containing a little fat, and he carefully anointed the precious heads, holding them by the tip of their slender, needle-like beak. A lighted candle was placed beside him, and everyone was silent in anxiety of expectation. Then he took one of the heads thus prepared, stuck a pin through it, and stuck the pin on a cork, keeping the whole contrivance steady by means of little cross sticks, and carefully placed this object on the neck of a bottle in the manner of a tourniquet. All the guests counted simultaneously in a loud tone. One, two, three, and the baron, with a fillip of the finger, made this toy whirl round. The guest to whom the long beak pointed when the head stopped became the possessor of all the heads, a feast fit for a king, which made his neighbors look askance. He took them one by one and toasted them over the candle. The grease sputtered, the roasting flesh smoked, and the lucky winner ate the head, holding it by the beak and uttering exclamations of enjoyment. And at each head, the diners, raising their glasses, drank to his health. When he had finished the last head, he was obliged, at the baron's orders, to tell an anecdote to compensate the disappointed ones. End of section 131. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 132 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 132. The Will. I knew that tall young fellow, René de Bourneval. He was an agreeable man, though rather melancholy and seemed prejudiced against everything, was very skeptical, and he could with a word tear down social hypocrisy. He would often say, there are no honorable men, or at least, they are only relatively so when compared with those lower than themselves. He had two brothers whom he never saw, the Messieurs de Courcil. I always supposed they were by another father, on account of the difference in the name. I had frequently heard that the family had a strange history, but did not know the details. As I took a great liking to René, we soon became intimate friends, and one evening, when I had been dining with him alone, I asked him by chance, Are you a son of the first or second marriage? He grew rather pale and then flushed, and did not speak for a few moments. He was visibly embarrassed. Then he smiled in the melancholy, gentle manner, which was peculiar to him, and said, My dear friend, if it will not weary you, I can give you some strange particulars about my life. I know that you are a sensible man, so I do not fear that our friendship will suffer by my revelations, and should it suffer, I should not care about having you for my friend any longer. My mother, Madame de Courcil, was a poor little timid woman, whom her husband had married for the sake of her fortune, and her whole life was one of martyrdom. Of a loving, timid, sensitive disposition, she was constantly being ill-treated by the man who ought to have been my father, one of those boors called country gentlemen. A month after their marriage, he was living a licentious life and carrying on liaisons with the wives and daughters of his tenants. This did not prevent him from having three children by his wife, that is, if you count me in. 
My mother said nothing and lived in that noisy house like a little mouse. Set aside, unnoticed, nervous, she looked at people with her bright, uneasy, restless eyes, the eyes of some terrified creature which can never shake off its fear. And yet she was pretty, very pretty and fair, a pale blonde, as if her hair had lost its color through her constant fear. Among the friends of Monsieur de Courcil, who constantly came to her chateau, there was an ex-cavalry officer, a widower, a man who was feared, who was at the same time tender and violent, capable of the most determined resolves, Monsieur de Bourneval, whose name I bear. He was a tall, thin man with a heavy black mustache. I am very like him. He is a man who read a great deal, and his ideas were not like those of most of his class. His great-grandmother had been a friend of J. J. Rousseau's, and one might have said that he had inherited something of this ancestral connection. He knew the Contrat Social and the Nouvelle Iloise by heart, and all those philosophical books, which prepared in advance the overthrow of our old usages, prejudices, superannuated laws, and imbecile morality. It seems that he loved my mother and she loved him, but their liaison was carried on so secretly that no one guessed at its existence. The poor, neglected, unhappy woman must have clung to him in despair, and in her intimacy with him must have imbibed all his ways of thinking, theories of free thought, audacious ideas of independent love. But being so timid, she never ventured to speak out, and it was all driven back, condensed, shut up in her heart. My two brothers were very hard towards her, like their father, and never gave her a caress, and, accustomed to seeing her count for nothing in the house, they treated her rather like a servant. I was the only one of her sons who really loved her, and whom she loved. When she died I was seventeen, and I must add, in order that you may understand what follows, that a lawsuit between my father and mother had been decided in my mother's favor, giving her the bulk of the property, and, thanks to the tricks of the law and the intelligent devotion of a lawyer to her interests, the right to make her will in favor of whom she pleased. We were told that there was a will at the lawyer's office, and were invited to be present at the reading of it. I can remember it as if it were yesterday. It was an imposing scene, dramatic, burlesque, and surprising occasioned by the posthumous revolt of that dead woman, by the cry for liberty, by the demands of that martyred one who had been crushed by our oppression during her lifetime, and who, from her closed tomb, uttered a despairing appeal for independence. The man who believed he was my father, a stout, ruddy-faced man who looked like a butcher, and my brothers, two great fellows of twenty and twenty-two, were waiting quietly in their chairs. Monsieur de Bourneval, who had been invited to be present, came in and stood behind me. He was very pale and bit his mustache, which was turning gray. No doubt he was prepared for what was going to happen. The lawyer double-locked the door and began to read the will, after having opened in our presence, the envelope sealed with red wax, of the contents of which he was ignorant. My friend stopped talking abruptly, and rising, took from his table an old paper, unfolded it, kissed it, and then continued. This is the will of my beloved mother. I, the undersigned, Anne Catherine Genevieve Mathilde de Croix-Leur, the legitimate wife of Leopold Joseph Gontron de Conceal, sound in body and mind, here express my last wishes. I first of all ask God, and then my dear son René, to pardon me for the first act I am about to commit. I believe that my child's heart is great enough to understand me and to forgive me. I have suffered my whole life long. I was married out of calculation, then despised, misunderstood, oppressed, and constantly deceived by my husband. I forgive him, but I owe him nothing. My elder sons never loved me, never petted me, scarcely treated me as a mother, but during my whole life I did my duty towards them, and I owe them nothing more after my death. The ties of blood cannot exist without daily and constant affection. An ungrateful son is less than a stranger. He is a culprit, for he has no right to be indifferent towards his mother. I have always trembled before men, before their unjust laws, their inhuman customs, their shameful prejudices. Before God I have no longer any fear. Dead, I fling aside disgraceful hypocrisy. I dare to speak my thoughts, and to avow and to sign the secret of my heart. I therefore leave that part of my fortune, of which the law allows me to dispose, in trust to my dear lover, Pierre Germain Simon de Bourneval, to revert afterwards to our dear son René. This bequest is specified more precisely in a deed drawn up by a notary. And I declare before the supreme judge who hears me that I should have cursed heaven in my own existence if I had not found the deep, devoted, tender, unshaken affection of my lover, if I had not felt in his arms that the Creator made his creatures to love, sustain, and console each other, and to weep together in the hours of sadness. Monsieur de Courcil is the father of my two eldest sons. René alone owes his life to Monsieur de Bourneval. I pray the master of men and of their destinies to place father and son above social prejudices, to make them love each other until they die, and to love me also in my coffin. These are my last thoughts and my last wish. Monsieur de Courcil had risen and he cried, It is the will of a madwoman. Then Monsieur de Bourneval stepped forward and said in a loud penetrating voice, I, Simone de Bourneval, solemnly declare that this writing contains nothing but the strict truth, 
and I am ready to prove it by letters which I possess. On hearing that, Monsieur de Courcil went up to him, and I thought that they were going to attack each other. There they stood, both of them tall, one stout and the other thin, both trembling. My mother's husband stammered out, You are a worthless wretch! And the other replied, in a loud, dry voice, We will meet elsewhere, monsieur. I should have already slapped your ugly face and challenged you long, since if I had not, before anything else, thought of the peace of mind during her lifetime of that poor woman whom you caused to suffer so greatly. Then, turning to me, he said, You are my son. Will you come with me? I have no right to take you away, but I shall assume it, if you are willing to come with me. I shook his hand without replying, and we went out together. I was certainly three parts mad. Two days later, Monsieur de Bourneval killed Monsieur de Courcil in a duel. My brothers, to avoid a terrible scandal, held their tongues. I offered them, and they accepted half the fortune which my mother had left me. I took my real father's name, renouncing that which the law gave me, but which was not really mine. Monsieur de Bourneval died three years later, and I am still inconsolable. He rose from his chair, walked up and down the room, and standing in front of me, said, Well, I say that my mother's will was one of the most beautiful, the most loyal, as well as one of the grandest acts that a woman could perform. Do you not think so? I held out both hands to him, saying, I most certainly do, my friend. End of section 132. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 133 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 133. Walter Schnaff's Adventure. Ever since he entered France with the invading army, Walter Schnaffs had considered himself the most unfortunate of men. He was large, had difficulty in walking, was short of breath, and suffered frightfully with his feet, which were very flat and very fat. But he was a peaceful, benevolent man, not warlike or sanguinary, the father of four children whom he adored, and married to a little blonde, whose little tendernesses, attentions, and kisses he recalled with despair every evening. He liked to rise late and retire early, to eat good things in a leisurely manner, and to drink beer in the saloon. He reflected, besides, that all that is sweet in existence vanishes with life, and he maintained in his heart a fearful hatred, instinctive as well as logical, for cannon, rifles, revolvers, and swords, but especially for bayonets, feeling that he was unable to dodge this dangerous weapon rapidly enough to protect his big paunch. And when night fell and he lay on the ground, wrapped in his cape beside his comrades who were snoring, he thought that long and deeply about those that he had left behind, and of the dangers in his path. If he were killed, what would become of the little ones, who would provide for them and bring them up? Just at present they were not rich, although he had borrowed when he left so as to leave them money, and Walter Schnaffs wept when he thought of all this. At the beginning of a battle his legs became so weak that he would have fallen if he had not reflected that the entire army would pass over his body. The whistling of the bullets gave him goose flesh. For months he had lived thus in terror and anguish. His company was marching on Normandy, and one day he was sent to reconnoitre with a small detachment, simply to explore a portion of the territory and to return at once. All seemed quiet in the country. Nothing indicated an armed resistance. But as the Prussians were quietly descending into a little valley traversed by deep ravines, a rapid fusillade made them halt suddenly, killing twenty of their men, and a company of sharpshooters, suddenly emerging from a little wood as large as your hand, darted forward with bayonets at the end of their rifles. Walter Schnaffs remained motionless at first, so surprised and bewildered that he did not even think of making his escape. Then he was seized with a wild desire to run away, but he remembered at once that he ran like a tortoise compared with those thin Frenchmen, who came bounding along like a lot of goats. Perceiving a large ditch full of brushwood covered with dead leaves about six paces in front of him, he sprang into it with both feet together, without stopping to think of its depth, just as one jumps from a bridge into the river. He fell like an arrow through a thick layer of fines and thorny brambles that tore his face and hands, and landed heavily in a sitting posture on a bed of stones. Raising his eyes, he saw the sky through the hole he had made and falling through. This aperture might betray him, and he crawled along carefully on hands and knees at the bottom of this ditch beneath the covering of interlacing branches, going as fast as he could and getting away from the scene of the skirmish. Presently he stopped and sat down, crouched like a hare amid the tall dry grass. He heard firing and cries and groans going on for some time. Then the noise of fighting grew fainter and ceased. All was quiet and silent. Suddenly, something stirred beside him. He was frightfully startled. It was a little bird which had perched on a branch and was moving the dead leaves. For almost an hour, Walter Schnaff's heart beat loudly and rapidly. Night fell, filling the ravine with its shadows. The soldier began to think. What was he to do? What was to become of him? Should he rejoin the army? But how? By what road? 
and he began over again the horrible life of anguish, of terror, of fatigue and suffering that he had led since the commencement of the war. No, he no longer had the courage. He would not have even the energy necessary to endure long marches and to face the dangers to which one was exposed at every moment. But what should he do? He could not stay in this ravine in concealment until the end of hostilities. No, indeed. If it were not for having to eat, this prospect would not have daunted him greatly. But he had to eat, to eat every day. And here he was, alone, armed and in uniform, on the enemy's territory, far from those who would protect him. A shiver ran over him. All at once, he thought, if I were only a prisoner, and his heart quivered with a longing, an intense desire to be taken prisoner by the French. A prisoner, he would be saved, fed, housed, sheltered from bullets and swords, without any apprehension whatsoever, in a good, well-kept prison. A prisoner! What a dream! His resolution was formed at once. I will constitute myself a prisoner. He rose, determined to put this plan into execution without a moment's delay. But he stood motionless, suddenly a prey to disturbing reflections and fresh terrors. Where would he make himself a prisoner, and how? In what direction? And frightful pictures, pictures of death, came into his mind. He would run terrible danger in venturing alone through the country with his pointed helmet. Supposing he should meet some peasants. Those peasants, seeing a Prussian who had lost his way, an unprotected Prussian, would kill him as if he were a stray dog. They would murder him with their forks, their picks, their scythes, and their shovels. They would make a stew of him, a pie, with the frenzy of exasperated, conquered enemies. If he should meet the sharpshooters... These sharpshooters, madmen without law or discipline, would shoot him just for amusement to pass an hour. It would make them laugh to see his head, and he fancied he was already leaning against a wall in front of four rifles whose little black apertures seemed to be gazing at him. Supposing he should meet the French army itself, the vanguard would take him for a scout, for some bold and sly trooper who had set off alone to reconnoitre, and they would fire at him, and he could already hear, in imagination, the irregular shots of soldiers lying in the brush, while he himself, standing in the middle of the field, was sinking to the earth, riddled like a sieve with bullets which he felt piercing his flesh. He sat down again in despair. His situation seemed hopeless. It was quite a dark, black, and silent night. He no longer budged, trembling at all the slight and unfamiliar sounds that occur at night. The sound of a rabbit crouching at the edge of his burrow almost made him run. The cry of an owl caused him positive anguish, giving him a nervous shock that pained like a wound. He opened his big eyes as wide as possible to try and see through the darkness, and he imagined every moment that he heard someone walking close beside him. After interminable hours in which he suffered the tortures of the damned, he noticed through his leafy cover that the sky was becoming bright. He at once felt an immense relief. His limbs stretched out, suddenly relaxed, his heart quieted down, his eyes closed, he fell asleep. When he awoke, the sun appeared to be almost at the meridian. It must be noon. No sound disturbed the gloomy silence. Walter Schnaffs noticed that he was exceedingly hungry. He yawned, his mouth watering at the thought of sausage, the good sausage the soldiers have, and he felt a gnawing in his stomach. He rose from the ground, walked a few steps, found that his legs were weak, and sat down to reflect. For two or three hours he again considered the pros and cons, changing his mind every moment, baffled, unhappy, torn by the most conflicting motives. Finally, he had an idea that seemed both logical and practical. It was to watch for a villager passing by alone, unarmed, and with no dangerous tools of his trade, and to run to him and give himself up making him understand that he was surrendering. He took off his helmet, the point of which might betray him, and put his head out of the hiding place with the utmost caution. No solitary pedestrian could be perceived on the horizon. Yonder, to the right, smoke rose from the chimney of a little village, smoke from kitchen fires, and yonder, to the left, he saw at the end of an avenue of trees a large turreted chateau. He waited till evening, suffering frightfully from hunger, seeing nothing but flights of crows, hearing nothing but the silent expostulation of his empty stomach and darkness once more fell on him. He stretched himself out in his retreat and slept a feverish sleep, haunted by nightmares, the sleep of a starving man. Dawn again broke above his head and he began to make his observations, but the landscape was deserted as on the previous day, and a new fear came into Walter Schnapp's mind, the fear of death by hunger. He pictured himself lying at full length on his back at the bottom of his hiding place, with his two eyes closed, and animals, little creatures of all kinds, approached and began to feed on his dead body, attacking it all over at once, gliding beneath his clothing to bite his cold flesh, and a big crow pecked out his eyes with its sharp beak. He almost became crazy, thinking he was going to faint and not be able to walk, and he was just preparing to rush off to the village, determined to dare anything, to brave everything, when he perceived three peasants walking to the fields with their forks across their shoulders, and he dived back into his hiding place. But as soon as it grew dark, he slowly emerged from the ditch and started off, stooping and fearful, with a beating heart, towards the distant chateau, preferring to go there rather than to the village, 
which seemed to him as formidable as a den of tigers. The lower windows were brilliantly lighted. One of them was open, and from it escaped a strong odor of roast meat, an odor which suddenly penetrated the olfactories and the stomach of Walter Schnaffs, tickling his nerves, making him breathe quickly, attracting him irresistibly and inspiring his heart with the boldness of desperation. And abruptly, without reflection, he placed himself, helmet on head, in front of the window. Eight servants were at dinner around a large table, but suddenly one of the maids sat there, her mouth agape, her eyes fixed and letting fall her glass. They all followed the direction of her gaze. They saw the enemy. Good God, the Prussians were attacking the chateau! There was a shriek, only one shriek made up of eight shrieks uttered in eight different keys, a terrific screaming of terror, then a tumultuous rising from their seats, a jostling, a scrimmage, and a wild rush to the door at the farther end. Chairs fell over, the men knocked the women down and walked over them. In two seconds, the room was empty, deserted, and the table, covered with eatables, stood in front of Walter Schnaffs, lost in amazement and still standing at the window. After some moments of hesitation, he climbed in at the window and approached the table. His fierce hunger caused him to tremble as if he were in a fever, but fear still held him back, numbed him. He listened. The entire house seemed to shudder. Doors closed, quick steps ran along the floor above. The uneasy Prussian listened eagerly to these confused sounds. Then he heard dull sounds, as though bodies were falling to the ground at the foot of the walls, human beings jumping from the first floor. Then all motion, all disturbance ceased, and the great chateau became as silent as a grave. Walter Schnaff sat down before a clean plate and began to eat. He took great mouthfuls, as if he feared he might be interrupted before he had swallowed enough. He shoveled the food into his mouth, open like a trap, with both hands, and chunks of food went into his stomach, swelling out his throat as it passed down. Now and then he stopped, almost ready to burst like a stopped-up pipe. Then he would take the cider jug and wash down his esophagus, as one washes out a clogged rain pipe. He emptied all the plates, all the dishes, and all the bottles. Then, intoxicated with drink and food, besotted, red in the face, shaken by hiccups, his mind clouded and his speech thick, he unbuttoned his uniform in order to breathe, or he could not have taken a step. His eyes closed, his mind became torpid, he leaned his heavy forehead on his folded arms on the table and gradually lost all consciousness of things and events. The last quarter of the moon above the trees in the park shed a faint light on the landscape. It was the chill hour that precedes the dawn. Numerous silent shadows glided among the trees, and occasionally a blade of steel gleamed in the shadow as a ray of moonlight struck it. The quiet chateau stood there in dark outline. Only two windows were still lighted on the ground floor. Suddenly, a voice thundered. Forward! Nom don nom! To the breach, my lads! And in an instant, the doors, shutters, and window panes fell in beneath a wave of men who rushed in, breaking, destroying everything, and took the house by storm. In a moment, fifty soldiers, armed to the teeth, bounded into the kitchen, where Walter Schnaffs was peacefully sleeping, and placing to his breast fifty loaded rifles, they overturned him, rolled him on the floor, seized him, and tied his head and feet together. He gasped in amazement, too besotted to understand, perplexed, bruised, and wild with fear. Suddenly a big soldier, covered with gold lace, put his foot on his stomach, shouting, "'You are my prisoner! Surrender!' The Prussian heard only the one word, prisoner, and he sighed, "'Yah, yah, yah!' He was raised from the floor, tied in a chair, and examined with lively curiosity by his victors, who were blowing like whales. Several of them sat down, done up with excitement and fatigue. He smiled, actually smiled, secure now that he was at last a prisoner. Another officer came into the room and said, "'Colonel, the enemy has escaped. Several seem to have been wounded. We are in possession.' The big officer, who was wiping his forehead, exclaimed, "'Victory!' And he wrote in a little business memorandum book which he took from his pocket. After a desperate encounter, the Prussians were obliged to beat a retreat, carrying with them their dead and wounded, the number of whom is estimated at fifty men. Several were taken prisoners. The young officer inquired, "'What steps shall I take, Colonel?' "'We will retire in good order,' replied the Colonel, "'to avoid having to return and make another attack with artillery and a larger force of men.' And he gave the command to set out. The column drew up in line in the darkness beneath the walls of the chateau and filed out, a guard of six soldiers, with revolvers in their hands, surrounding Walter Schnaffs, who was firmly bound. Scouts were sent ahead to Reconnoitre. They advanced cautiously, halting from time to time. At daybreak, they arrived in the district of La roche aux whose National Guard had accomplished this feat of arms. The uneasy and excited inhabitants were expecting them. When they saw the prisoner's helmet, tremendous shouts arose. The women raised their arms in wonder, the old people wept, an old grandfather threw his crutch at the Prussian and stuck the nose of one of their own defenders. The colonel roared, See that the prisoner is secure. At length they reached the town hall. The prison was opened, and Walter Schnaffs, freed from his bonds, cast into it. 
200 armed men mounted guard outside the building. Then, in spite of the indigestion that had been troubling him for some time, the Prussian, wild with joy, began to dance about, to dance frantically, throwing out his arms and legs and uttering wild shouts until he fell down, exhausted by the wall. He was a prisoner. Saved! That was how the Chateau de Champigny was taken from the enemy after only six hours of occupation. Colonel Rattier, a cloth merchant who had led the assault at the head of a body of the National Guard of La roche was decorated with an order. End of section 133. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 134 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 134. At Sea. The following paragraphs recently appeared in the papers. Boulogne sur Mer, January 22nd, our correspondent writes, A fearful accident has thrown our seafaring population, which has suffered so much in the last two years, into the greatest consternation. The fishing smack commanded by Captain Javel on entering the harbor was wrecked on the rocks of the harbor breakwater. In spite of the efforts of the lifeboat and the shooting of lifelines from the shore, four sailors and the cabin boy were lost. The rough weather continues. Fresh disasters are anticipated. Who is this Captain Javel? Is he the brother of the one-armed man? If the poor man tossed about in the waves, and dead, perhaps, beneath his wrecked boat, is the one I am thinking of, he took part, just eighteen years ago, in another tragedy, terrible and simple as are all these fearful tragedies of the sea. Javel, senior, was then master of a trawling smack. The trawling smack is the ideal fishing boat, so solidly built that it fears no weather, with a round bottom, tossed about unceasingly on the waves like a cork, always on top, always thrashed by the harsh salt winds of the English Channel, it plows the sea unweariedly with bellying sail, dragging along at its side a huge trawling net, which scores the depths of the ocean, and detaches and gathers in all the animals asleep on the rocks, the flat fish glued to the sand, the heavy crabs with their curved claws, and the lobsters with their pointed mustaches. When the breeze is fresh and the sea choppy, the boat starts in to trawl. The net is fastened all along to a big log of wood clamped with iron and is let down by two ropes on pulleys at either end of the boat. And the boat driven by the wind and the tide, draws along this apparatus which ransacks and plunders the depths of the sea. Javel had on board his younger brother, four sailors, and a cabin boy. He had set sail from Boulogne on a beautiful day to go trawling. But presently a wind sprang up, and a hurricane obliged the smack to run to shore. She gained the English coast, but high sea broke against the rocks and dashed on the beach, making it impossible to go into port, filling all the harbor entrances with foam and noise and danger." The smack started off again, riding on the waves, tossed, shaken, dripping, buffeted by masses of water, but game in spite of everything, accustomed to this boisterous weather, which sometimes kept it roving between the two neighboring countries without it being able to make port in either. At last the hurricane calmed down, just as they were in the open, and although the sea was still high, the captain gave orders to cast the net. So it was lifted overboard, and two men in the bows and two in the stern began to unwind the ropes that held it. It suddenly touched bottom, but a big wave made the boat heel, and Javel Jr., who was in the bows directing the lowering of the net, staggered, and his arm was caught in the rope which the shock had slipped from the pulley for an instant. He made a desperate effort to raise the rope with the other hand, but the net was down, and the taut rope did not give. The man cried out in agony. They all ran to his aid. His brother left the rudder. They all seized the rope, trying to free the arm it was bruising, but in vain. "'We must cut it,' said a sailor, and he took from his pocket a big knife." which, with two strokes, could save young Javel's arm. But if the rope were cut, the trawling net would be lost, and this net was worth money, a great deal of money, fifteen hundred francs, and it belonged to Javel Sr., who was tenacious of his property. "'No, do not cut. Wait, I will luff,' he cried, in great distress, and he ran to the helm and turned the rudder. But the boat scarcely obeyed it, being impeded by the net which kept it from going forward, and prevented also by the force of the tide and the wind." Javel Jr. had sunk on his knees, his teeth clenched, his eyes haggard. He did not utter a word. His brother came back to him in dread of the sailor's knife. "'Wait, wait,' he said. "'We will let down the anchor.' They cast anchor, and then began to turn the capstan to loosen the moorings of the net. They loosened them at length and disengaged the imprisoned arm in its bloody woolen sleeve. Young Javel seemed like an idiot. They took off his jersey and saw a horrible sight, a mass of flesh from which the blood spurted as if from a pump. Then the young man looked at his arm and muttered, Futu, done for. Then, as the blood was making a pool on the deck of the boat, one of the sailors cried, He will bleed to death, we must bind the vein. 
So they took a cord, a thick brown tarry cord, and twisting it around the arm above the wound, tightened it with all their might. The blood ceased to spurt by slow degrees and presently stopped altogether. Young Javel rose, his arm hanging at his side. He took hold of it with the other hand, raised it, turned it over, shook it. It was all mashed, the bones broken, the muscles alone holding it together. He looked at it sadly, reflectively. Then he sat down on a folded sail, and his comrades advised him to keep wetting the arm constantly to prevent it from mortifying. They placed a pail of water beside him, and every few minutes he dipped a glass into it and bathed the frightful wound, letting the clear water trickle onto it. "'You would be better in the cabin,' said his brother. He went down, but came up again in an hour, not caring to be alone. And besides, he preferred the fresh air. He sat down again on his sail and began to bathe his arm. They made a good haul. The broad fish with their white bellies lay beside him, quivering in the throes of death. He looked at them as he continued to bathe his crushed flesh. As they were about to return to Boulogne, the wind sprang up anew, and the little boat resumed its mad course, bounding and tumbling about, shaking up the poor wounded man. Night came on. The sea ran high until dawn. As the sun rose, the English coast was again visible, but, as the weather had abated a little, they turned back toward the French coast, tacking as they went. Towards evening, Javel Jr. called his comrades and showed them some black spots, all the horrible tokens of mortification, in the portion of the arm below the broken bones. The sailors examined it, giving their opinion. That might be black, thought one. He should put water on it, said another. They brought some salt water and poured it on the wound. The injured man became livid, ground his teeth and writhed a little, but did not exclaim. Then, as soon as the smarting had abated, he said to his brother, Give me your knife. The brother handed it to him. Hold my arm up quite straight and pull it. They did as he asked them. Then he began to cut off his arm. He cut gently, carefully, severing all the tendons with this blade that was sharp as a razor, and presently there was only a stump left. He gave a deep sigh and said, It had to be done. It was done for. He seemed relieved and breathed loud. Then he again began to pour water on the stump of the arm that remained. The sea was still rough and they could not make the shore. When the day broke, Javel Jr. took the severed portion of his arm and examined it for a long time. Gangrene had set in. His comrades also examined it and handed it from one to the other, feeling it, turning it over, and sniffing it. "'You must throw that into the sea at once,' said his brother. But Javel Jr. got angry. "'Oh, no! Oh, no, I don't want to. It belongs to me, does it not, as it is my arm?' And he took and placed it between his feet. "'It will putrefy just the same,' said the older brother. Then an idea came to the injured man." In order to preserve the fish when the boat was long at sea, they packed it in salt, in barrels. He asked, Why can I not put it in pickle? Why, that's a fact, exclaimed the others. They emptied one of the barrels, which was full from the hall of the last few days, and right at the bottom of the barrel they laid the detached arm. They covered it with salt, and then put back the fish one by one. One of the sailors said by way of joke, I hope we do not sell it at auction. And everyone laughed, except the two Javels. The wind was still boisterous, they tacked within sight of Boulogne until the following morning at ten o'clock. Young Javel continued to bathe his wound. From time to time, he rose and walked from one end to the other of the boat. His brother, who was at the tiller, followed him with glances and shook his head. At last, they ran into harbor. The doctor examined the wound and pronounced it to be in good condition. He dressed it properly and ordered the patient to rest. But Javel would not go back to bed until he got back his severed arm, and he returned at once to the dock to look for the barrel which he had marked with a cross. It was emptied before him, and he seized the arm, which was well preserved in the pickle, had shrunk and was freshened. He wrapped it up in a towel he had brought for this purpose and took it home. His wife and children looked for a long time at this fragment of their father, feeling the fingers and removing the grains of salt that were under the nails. Then they sent for a carpenter to make a little coffin. The next day, the entire crew of the trawling smack followed the funeral of the detached arm. The two brothers, side by side, led the procession. The parish beetle carried the corpse under his arm. Javel Jr. gave up the sea. He obtained a small position on the dock, and when he subsequently talked about his accident, he would say confidentially to his auditors, If my brother had been willing to cut away the net, I should still have my arm, that is sure, but he was thinking only of his property. End of section 134. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 135 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 135. Minuet. Great misfortunes do not affect me very much, said John Brudel, an old bachelor who passed for a skeptic. I have seen war at quite close quarters. I walked across corpses without any feeling of pity. The great brutal facts of nature, or of humanity, 
may call forth cries of horror or indignation, but do not cause us that tightening of the heart, that shudder that goes down your spine at sight of certain little heart-rending episodes. The greatest sorrow that anyone can experience is certainly the loss of a child to a mother, and the loss of his mother to a man. It is intense, terrible, it rends your heart and upsets your mind, but one is healed of these shocks, just as large bleeding wounds become healed. Certain meetings, certain things half-perceived or surmised, certain secret sorrows, certain tricks of fate which awaken us a whole world of painful thoughts, which suddenly unclose to us the mysterious door of moral suffering, complicated, incurable, all the deeper because they appear benign, all the more bitter because they are intangible, all the more tenacious because they appear almost factitious, leave in our souls a sort of trail of sadness, a taste of bitterness, a feeling of disenchantment, from which it takes a long time to free ourselves. I have always present to my mind two or three things that others would surely not have noticed, but which penetrated my being like fine, sharp, incurable stings. You might not perhaps understand the emotion that I retained from these hasty impressions. I will tell you one of them. She was very old, but as lively as a young girl. It may be that my imagination alone is responsible for my emotion. I am fifty. I was young then and studying law. I was rather sad, somewhat of a dreamer, full of a pessimistic philosophy and did not care much for noisy cafes, boisterous companions, or stupid girls. I rose early, and one of my chief enjoyments was to walk alone about eight o'clock in the morning in the nursery garden of the Luxembourg. You people never knew that nursery garden. It was like a forgotten garden of the last century, as pretty as the gentle smile of an old lady. Thick hedges divided the narrow, regular paths, peaceful paths between two walls of carefully trimmed foliage. The gardener's great shears were pruning unceasingly these leafy partitions, and here and there one came across beds of flowers, lines of little trees looking like schoolboys out for a walk, companies of magnificent rose bushes, or regiments of fruit trees. An entire corner of this charming spot was inhabited by bees. Their straw hives, skillfully arranged at distances on boards, had their entrances, as large as the opening of a thimble, turned toward the sun, and all along these paths one encountered these humming and gilded flies, the true masters of this peaceful spot the real promenaders of these quiet paths. I came there almost every morning. I sat down on a bench and read. Sometimes I let my book fall on my knees, to dream, to listen to the life of Paris around me, and to enjoy the infinite repose of these old-fashioned hedges. But I soon perceived that I was not the only one to frequent the spot as soon as the gates were opened, and I occasionally met face to face, at a turn in the path, a strange little man. He wore shoes with silver buckles, knee breeches, a snuff-colored frock coat, a lace jabot, and an outlandish gray hat with a wide brim and long-haired surface that might have come out of the ark. He was thin, very thin, angular, grimacing, and smiling. His bright eyes were restless beneath his eyelids, which blinked continuously. He always carried in his hand a superb cane with a gold knob, which must have been for him some glorious souvenir. This good man astonished me at first, then caused me the intensest interest. I watched him through the leafy walls, I followed him at a distance, stopping at a turn in the hedge so as not to be seen." and one morning, when he thought he was quite alone, he began to make the most remarkable motions. First he would give some little springs, then make a bow. Then, with his slim legs, he would give a lively spring into the air, clapping his feet as he did so, and then turn round cleverly, skipping and frisking about in a comical manner, smiling as if he had an audience, twisting his poor little puppet-like body, bowing pathetic and ridiculous little greetings into the empty air. He was dancing. I stood petrified with amazement, asking myself which of us was crazy, he or I. He stopped suddenly, advanced as actors do to the stage, then bowed and retreated with gracious smiles, and kissing his hand as actors do, his trembling hand to the two rows of trimmed bushes. Then he continued his walk with a solemn demeanor. After that I never lost sight of him, and each morning he began anew his outlandish exercises. I was wildly anxious to speak to him. I decided to risk it, and one day, after greeting him, I said, "'It is a beautiful day, monsieur.' He bowed. "'Yes, sir, the weather is just as it used to be.' A week later we were friends, and I knew his history. He had been a dancing master at the opera in the time of Louis XV. His beautiful cane was a present from the Comte de Clermont, and when we spoke about dancing, he never stopped talking. One day he said to me, I married La Castrie, monsieur. I will introduce you to her if you wish it, but she does not get here till later. This garden, you see, is our delight and our life. It is all that remains of former days. It seems as though we could not exist if we did not have it. It is old and distingue, is it not? I seem to breathe an air here that has not changed since I was young. My wife and I have passed all our evenings here, but I come in the morning because I get up early. As soon as I had finished luncheon, I returned to the Luxembourg, and presently perceived my friend offering his arm ceremoniously to a very old little lady dressed in black, to whom he introduced me. 
It was La Castrie, the great dancer, beloved by princes, beloved by the king, beloved by all that century of gallantry that seems to have left behind it in the world an atmosphere of love. We sat down on a bench. It was the month of May. An odor of flowers floated in the neat paths. A hot sun glided its rays between the branches and covered us with patches of light. The black dress of La Castrie seemed to be saturated with sunlight. The garden was empty. We heard the rattling of vehicles in the distance. "'Tell me,' I said to the old dancer, "'what was the minuet?' He gave a start. "'The minuet, monsieur, is the queen of dances, and the dance of queens, do you understand? Since there is no longer any royalty, there is no longer any minuet.' And he began in a pompous manner, a long dithyrambic eulogy which I could not understand. I wanted to have the steps, the movements, the positions explained to me. He became confused, was amazed at his inability to make me understand, became nervous and worried. Then, suddenly, turning to his old companion, who had remained silent and serious, he said, "'Elise, would you like—say, would you like—it would be very nice of you if you would show this gentleman what it was?' She turned eyes uneasily in all directions, then rose without saying a word and took her position opposite him. Then I witnessed an unheard-of thing. They advanced and retreated with childlike grimaces, smiling, swinging each other, bowing, skipping about like two automaton dolls moved by some old mechanical contrivance— somewhat damaged, but made by a clever workman, according to the fashion of his time. And I looked at them, my heart filled with extraordinary emotions, my soul touched with an indescribable melancholy. I seemed to see before me a pathetic and comical apparition, the out-of-date ghost of a former century. They suddenly stopped. They had finished all the figures of the dance. For some seconds they stood opposite each other, smiling in an astonishing manner. Then they fell on each other's necks, sobbing. I left for the provinces three days later. I never saw them again. When I returned to Paris two years later, the nursery had been destroyed. What became of them, deprived of the dear garden of former days, with its mazes, its odor of the past, and the graceful windings of its hedges? Are they dead? Are they wandering among modern streets like hopeless exiles? Are they dancing, grotesque specters, a fantastic minuet in the moonlight, amid the cypresses of a cemetery, along the pathways bordered by graves? Their memory haunts me, obsesses me, torments me, remains with me like a wound. Why? I do not know. No doubt you think that very absurd. End of section 135. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 136 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 136. The Sun. The two old friends were walking in the garden in bloom, where spring was bringing everything to life. One was a senator, the other a member of the French Academy, both serious men, full of very logical but solemn arguments, men of note and reputation. They talked first of politics, exchanging opinions, not on ideas but on men, personalities, in this regard taking the predominance over ability. Then they recalled some memories. Then they walked along in silence, enervated by the warmth of the air. A large bed of wallflowers breathed out a delicate sweetness. A mass of flowers of all species and color flung their fragrance to the breeze, while a cytosis, covered with yellow clusters, scattered its fine pollen abroad, a golden cloud with an odor of honey that bore its balmy seed across space, similar to the sachet powers of perfumers. The senator stopped, breathed in the cloud of floating pollen, looked at the fertile shrub, yellow as the sun, whose seed was floating in the air, and said, when one considers that these imperceptible fragrant atoms will create existences at a hundred leagues from here, will send a thrill through the fibers and sap of female trees and produce beings with roots, growing from a germ just as we do, mortal like ourselves, and who will be replaced by other beings of the same order, like ourselves again. And standing in front of the brilliant citizens, whose live pollen was shaken off by each breath of air, the senator added, Ah, old fellow, if you had to keep count of all your children, you would be mightily embarrassed. Here is one who generates freely, and then lets them go without a pang and troubles himself no more about them. We do the same, my friend, said the academician. Yes, I do not deny it. We let them go sometimes, resumed the senator. But we are aware that we do, and that constitutes our superiority. No, that is not what I mean, said the other, shaking his head. You see, my friend, that there is scarcely a man who has not some children that he does not know. Children, father unknown, whom he has generated almost unconsciously, just as this tree reproduces. If we had to keep account of our amours, we should be just as embarrassed as the cytosis which you apostrophized would be in counting up in his descendants, would we not? From eighteen to forty years, in fact, counting in every chance cursory acquaintanceship, 
we may well say that we have been intimate with two or three hundred women. Well then, my friend, among this number, can you be sure that you have not had children by at least one of them, and that you have not in the streets or in the bagnio some blackguard of a son who steals from and murders decent people, i.e. ourselves, or else a daughter in some disreputable place, or, if she has the good fortune to be deserted by her mother, as cook in some family? Consider also that almost all those whom we call prostitutes have one or two children of whose paternal parentage they are ignorant, generated by chance at the price of ten or twenty francs. In every business there is profit and loss. These wildings constitute the loss in their profession. Who generated them? You, I, we all did, the men called gentlemen. They are the consequences of our jovial little dinners, of our gay evenings, of those hours when our comfortable physical being impels us to chance liaisons. Thieves, marauders, all these wretches, in fact, are our children, and that is better for us than if we were their children, for these scoundrels generate also. I have in my mind a very horrible story that I will relate to you. It has caused me incessant remorse, and further than that, a continual doubt, a quieting uncertainty, that at times torments me frightfully. When I was twenty-five, I undertook a walking tour through Brittany with one of my friends, now a member of the cabinet. After walking steadily for fifteen or twenty days, and visiting the Côte du Nord and part of Finisterre, we reached Douarnenez. From there we went without halting into the wild promontory of Raz by the bay of Les Trapas, and passed the night in a village whose name ends in of. The next morning a strange lassitude kept my friend in bed. I say bed from habit, for our couch consisted simply of two bundles of straw. It would never do to be ill in this place. So I made him get up, and we reached Andierne in about four or five o'clock in the evening. The following day he felt a little better, and we set out again. But on the road he was seized with intolerable pain, and we could scarcely get as far as Pont Lab. Here at least there was an inn. My friend went to bed, and the doctor, who had been sent far from Cumpe, announced that he had a high fever, without being able to determine its nature. Do you know Pont Lab? No? Well, then it is most Breton of all this Breton Brittany, which extends from the promontory of Raz to the Morbihan, of this land which contains the essence of the Breton manners, legends, and customs. Even today, the corner of the country has scarcely changed. I say even today, for now I go there every year, alas. An old chateau laves the walls of its towers in a great melancholy pond, melancholy and frequented by flights of wild birds. It has an outlet in a river on which boats can navigate as far as the town. In the narrow streets with their old-time houses, the men wear big hats, embroidered waistcoats, and four coats, one on top of the other the inside one as large as your hand, barely covering the shoulder blades, and the outside one coming to just above the seat of the trousers. The girls, tall, handsome, and fresh, have their bosoms crushed in a cloth bodice which makes an armor, compresses them, not allowing one even to guess at their robust and tortured neck. They also wear a strange headdress. On their temples, two bands embroidered in colors frame their face, enclosing the hair, which falls in a shower at the back of their heads, and is turned up and gathered on top of the head under a singular cap often woven with gold or silver thread. The servant at our inn was eighteen at most, with very blue eyes, and pale blue with two tiny black pupils, short teeth close together, which she showed continually when she laughed, and which seemed strong enough to grind granite. She did not know a word of French, speaking only Breton, as did most of her companions. As my friend did not improve much, and although he had no definite malady, the doctor forbade him to continue his journey yet, ordering complete rest. I spent my days with him, and the little maid would come in incessantly, bringing either my dinner or some herb tea. I teased her a little, which seemed to amuse her, but we did not chat, of course, as we could not understand each other. But one night, after I had stayed quite late with my friend and was going back to my room, I passed the girl, who was going to her room. It was just opposite my open door, and, without reflection, more for fun than anything else, I abruptly seized her around the waist. Before she recovered from her astonishment, I had thrown her down and locked her in my room, she looked at me, amazed, excited, terrified, not daring to cry out for fear of a scandal and of probably being driven out, first by her employers, and then perhaps by her father. I did it as a joke at first. She defended herself bravely, and at the first chance she ran to the door, drew back the bolt, and fled. I scarcely saw her for a few days. She would not let me come near her. But when my friend was cured and we were to get out on our travels again, I saw her coming into my room about midnight the night before our departure, just after I had retired. She threw herself into my arms and embraced me passionately, giving me all the assurances of tenderness and despair that a woman can give when she does not know a word of our language. A week later I had forgotten this adventure, so common and frequent when one is traveling, the inn-servants being generally destined to amuse travelers in this way. I was thirty before I thought of it again, or returned to Pont Lab. But in 1876 I revisited it, by chance, along a trip to Brittany, 
which I made in order to look up some data for a book and to become permeated with the atmosphere of the different places. Nothing seemed changed. The chateau still laved its gray wall in the pond outside the little town. The inn was the same, though it had been repaired, renovated, and looked more modern. As I entered it, I was received by two young Breton girls of eighteen, fresh and pretty, bound up in their tight cloth bodices, with their silver caps with wide embroidered bands on their ears. It was about six o'clock in the evening. I sat down to dinner, and the host was assiduous in waiting on me himself. Fate, no doubt, impelled me to say, Did you know the former proprietors of this house? I spent about ten days here thirty years ago. I am talking old times. Those were my parents, monsieur, he replied. Then I told him why we had stayed over at that time, how my comrade had been declared by illness. He did not let me finish. Oh, I recollect perfectly. I was about fifteen or sixteen. You slept in the room at the end, and your friend in the one I have taken for myself, overlooking the street. It was only then that the recollection of the little maid came vividly to my mind. I asked, Do you remember a pretty little servant who was then in your father's employ, and if my memory does not deceive me, had pretty eyes and fresh-looking teeth? Yes, monsieur, she died in childbirth some time after. And, pointing to the courtyard where a thin, lame man was stirring up the manure, he added, That is her son. I began to laugh. He is not handsome and does not look much like his mother. No doubt he looks like his father. That is very possible, replied the innkeeper, but we never knew whose child it was. She died without telling anyone, and no one here knew of her having a beau. Everyone was hugely astonished when they heard she was enceinte, and no one would believe it. A sort of unpleasant chill came over me, one of those painful surface wounds that affect us like the shadow of an impending sorrow, and I looked at the man in the yard. He had just drawn water for the horses and was carrying two buckets, limping as he walked with a painful effort of his shorter leg. His clothes were ragged, he was hideously dirty, with long yellow hair, so tangled that it looked like strands of rope falling down at either side of his face. "'He is not worth much,' continued the innkeeper. "'We have kept him for charity's sake. Perhaps he would have turned out better if he had been brought up like other folks.' But what could one do, monsieur? No father, no mother, no money. My parents took pity on him, but he was not their child, you understand. I said nothing. I slept in my old room, and all night long I thought of this frightful stableman, saying to myself, Supposing it is my own son? Could I have caused that girl's death and procreated this being? It was quite possible. I resolved to speak to this man and to find out the exact date of his birth. A variation of two months would set my doubts at rest. I sent for him the next day, but he could not speak French. He looked as if he could not understand anything, being absolutely ignorant of his age, which I had inquired of him through one of the maids. He stood before me like an idiot, twirling his hat in his knotted, disgusting hands, laughing stupidly, with something of his mother's laugh in the corner of his mouth and his eyes. The landlord, appearing on the scene, went to look for the birth certificate of this wretched being. He was born eight months and twenty-six days after my stay at pont Lab, for I recollect perfectly that we reached Lorient on the 15th of August. The certificate contained this description— father unknown. The mother called herself Jeanne Karadec. Then my heart began to beat rapidly. I could not utter a word, for I felt as if I were choking. I looked at this animal, whose long yellow hair reminded me of a straw heap, and the beggar, embarrassed by my gaze, stopped laughing, turned his head aside, and wanted to get away. All day long I wandered beside the little river, giving way to painful reflections. But what was the use of reflection? I could be sure of nothing— for hours and hours I weighed all the pros and cons in favor of or against the probability of my being the father, growing nervous over inexplicable suppositions, only to return incessantly to the same horrible uncertainty, then to the still more atrocious conviction that this man was my son. I could eat no dinner and went to my room. I lay awake for a long time, and when I finally fell asleep I was haunted by horrible visions. I saw this laborer laughing in my face and calling me Papa. Then he changed into a dog and bit the calves of my legs and no matter how fast I ran, he still followed me, and instead of barking, talked and reviled me. Then he appeared before my colleagues at the academy, who had assembled to decide whether I was really his father, and one of them cried out, There can be no doubt about it, see how he resembles him. And indeed I could see that this monster looked like me, and I awoke with this idea fixed in my mind, and with an insane desire to see the man again, and assure myself whether or not we had similar features. I joined him as he was going to Mass, it was Sunday, and I gave him five francs, and I gazed at him anxiously. He began to laugh in an idiotic manner, took the money, and then, embarrassed afresh at my gaze, he ran off, after stammering an almost inarticulate word that, no doubt, meant thank you. My day passed in the same distress of mind as on the previous night. I sent for the landlord, and, with the greatest caution, skill, and tact, I told him that I was interested in this poor creature, so abandoned by everyone and deprived of everything, and I wished to do something for him. But the man replied, Oh, do not think of it, monsieur. He is of no account. 
You will only cause yourself annoyance. I employ him to clean out the stable, and that is all he can do. I give him his board and let him sleep with the horses. He needs nothing more. If you have an old pair of trousers, you might give them to him, but they will be rags in a week. I did not insist, intending to think it over. The poor wretch came home that evening frightfully drunk, came near setting fire to the house, killed a horse by hitting it with a pickaxe, and ended up lying down to sleep in the mud in the midst of the pouring rain, thanks to my donation. They begged me next day not to give him any more money. Brandy drove him crazy, and as soon as he had two sous in his pocket, he would spend it on drink. The landlord added, giving him money is like trying to kill him. The man had never, never in his life had more than a few centimes thrown to him by travelers, and he knew of no destination for this metal but the wine shop. I spent several hours in my room with an open book before me, which I pretended to read, but in reality looking at this animal, my son, my son, trying to discover if he looked anything like me. After careful scrutiny, I seemed to recognize a similarity in the lines of the forehead and the root of the nose, and I was soon convinced that there was a resemblance, concealed by the difference in garb and the man's hideous head of hair. I could not stay here any longer without arousing suspicion, and I went away, my heart crushed, leaving with the innkeeper some money to soften the existence of his servant. For six years now I have lived with this idea in my mind, this horrible uncertainty, this abominable suspicion, and each year an irresistible force takes me back to Pont Lob. Every year I condemn myself to the torture of seeing this animal raking the manure, imagining that he resembles me, and endeavoring, always vainly, to render him some assistance. And each year I return more uncertain, more tormented, more worried. I have tried to have him taught, but he is a hopeless idiot. I tried to make his life less hard. He is an irreclaimable drunkard, and spends in drink all the money one gives him, and knows enough to sell his new clothes in order to get brandy. I have tried to awaken his master's sympathy so he should look after him, offering to pay him for doing so. The innkeeper, finally surprised, said very wisely, All that you do for him, monsieur, will only help to destroy him. He must be kept like a prisoner. As soon as he has any spare time or any comfort, he becomes wicked. If you wish to do good, there is no lack of abandoned children, but select one who will appreciate your attention. What could I say? If I allowed the slightest suspicion of the doubts that tortured me to escape, this idiot would assuredly become cunning in order to blackmail me, to compromise me and ruin me. He would call out Papa as in my dream. And I said to myself that I had killed the mother and lost this atrophied creature, this larva of the stable, born and raised amid the manure, this man who, if brought up like others, would have been like others. And you cannot imagine what a strange, embarrassed, and intolerable feeling comes over me when he stands before me, and I reflect that he came from myself, that he belongs to me through the intimate bond that links father and son, that, thanks to the terrible law of heredity, he is my own self in a thousand ways, in his blood and his flesh, and that he even has the same germs of disease, the same leaven of emotions. I have an incessant, restless, distressing longing to see him, and the sight of him causes me intense suffering, as I look down from my window and watch him for hours, removing and carting horse manure, saying to myself, that is my son, and sometimes I feel an irresistible longing to embrace him. I have never even touched his dirty hand. The academician was silent. His companion, a tactful man, murmured, Yes, indeed, we ought to take closer interest in children who have no father. A gust of wind passing through the trees shook its yellow clusters, enveloping in a fragrant and delicate mist the two old men, who inhaled in the fragrance with deep breaths. The senator added, It is good to be twenty-five and even to have children like that. End of section 136. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 137 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 137. That Pig of a Morin. Here, my friend, I said to Labarbe, you have just repeated those five words, that pig of a morin. Why on earth do I never hear Morin's name mentioned without his being called a pig? Labarbe, who is a deputy, looked at me with his owl-like eyes and said, Do you mean to say that you do not know Morin's story, and you come from La Rochelle? I was obliged to declare that I did not know Morin's story, so Labarbe rubbed his hands and began his recital. You knew Morin, did you not, and you remember his large linen draper's shop on the Quai de la Rochelle? Yes, perfectly. Well, then, you must know that in 1862 or 63, Morin went to spend a fortnight in Paris for pleasure, or for his pleasures, but under the pretext of renewing his stock. And you know what a fortnight in Paris means to a country shopkeeper. It fires his blood. The theater every evening, women's dresses rustling up against you in continual excitement. One goes almost mad with it. One sees nothing but dancers in tights, actresses in very low dresses. 
round legs, fat shoulders, all nearly within reach of one's hands, without daring or being able to touch them, and one scarcely tastes food. When one leaves the city, one's heart is still all in a flutter and one's mind still exhilarated by a sort of longing for kisses which tickles one's lips. Morin was in that condition when he took his ticket for La Rochelle by the 8.40 Night Express. As he was walking up and down the waiting room at the station, he stopped suddenly in front of a young lady who was kissing an old one. She had her veil up, and Morin murmured with delight, "'By Jove, what a pretty woman!' When she had said goodbye to the old lady, she went into the waiting room, and Morin followed her. Then she went on the platform, and Morin still followed her. Then she got into an empty carriage, and he again followed her. There were very few travelers on the express. The engine whistled and the train started. They were alone. Morin devoured her with his eyes. She appeared to be about nineteen or twenty, and was fair, tall, with a bold look. She wrapped a railway rug around her and stretched herself on the seat to sleep. Morin asked himself, I wonder who she is. And a thousand conjectures, a thousand projects went through his head. He said to himself, So many adventures are told as happening on railway journeys that this may be one that is going to present itself to me. Who knows? A piece of good luck like that happens very suddenly, and perhaps I need only be a little venturesome. Was it not Danton who said, Audacity, more audacity, and always audacity? If it was not Danton, it was Mirabeau, but that does not matter. By then I have no audacity, and that is the difficulty. Oh, if only one knew, if one could only read people's minds. I will bet that every day one passes by magnificent opportunities without knowing it, though a gesture would be enough to let me know her mind. Then he imagined to himself combinations which conducted him to triumph. He pictured some chivalrous deed or merely some slight service which he rendered her, a lively, gallant conversation which ended in a declaration. But he could find no opening, had no pretext, and he waited for some fortunate circumstance with his heart beating and his mind topsy-turvy. The night passed and the pretty girl still slept while Morin was meditating his own fall. The day broke and soon the first ray of sunlight appeared in the sky, a long, clear ray which shone on the face of the sleeping girl and woke her. She sat up, looked at the country, then at Morin, and smiled. She smiled like a happy woman, with an engaging and bright look, and Morin trembled. Certainly that smile was intended for him. It was a discreet invitation, the signal which he was waiting for. The smile meant to say, "'How stupid! What a ninny! What adult! What a donkey you are to have sat there on your seat like a post all night! Just look at me, am I not charming? And you have sat like that for the whole night when you have been alone with a pretty woman, you great simpleton!' She was still smiling as she looked at him. She even began to laugh, and he lost his head trying to find something suitable to say, no matter what. But he could think of nothing, nothing. And then, seized with a coward's courage, he said to himself, "'So much the worse, I will risk everything.' And suddenly, without the slightest warning, he went toward her, his arms extended, his lips protruding, and seizing her in his arms, he kissed her. She sprang up immediately with a bound, crying out, "'Help! Help!' and screaming with terror." And then she opened the carriage door and waved her arm out, mad with terror and trying to jump out, while Morin, who was almost distracted and feeling sure that she would throw herself out, held her by the skirt and stammered, "'Oh, madame! Oh, madame!' The train slackened speed and then stopped. Two guards rushed up at the young woman's frantic signals. She threw herself into their arms, stammering, "'That man wanted—wanted to—to—' to... And then she fainted. They were at Mo's station, and the gendarme on duty arrested Morin. When the victim of his indiscreet admiration had regained her consciousness, she made her charge against him, and the police drew it up. The poor linen draper did not reach home till night, with a prosecution hanging over him for an outrage to morals in a public place. At that time I was an editor of the Fenal de Charente, and I used to meet Morin every day at the Café du Commerce, and the day after his adventure he came to see me, as he did not know what to do. I did not hide my opinion from him, but said to him, "'You are no better than a pig. No decent man behaves like that.' He cried. His wife had given him a beating, and he foresaw his trade ruined, his name dragged through the mire and dishonored, his friends scandalized and taking no notice of him. In the end, he excited my pity, and I sent for my colleague, Rive, a jocular but very sensible little man, to give his advice. He advised me to see the public prosecutor, who was a friend of mine, and so I sent Warren home and went to call on the magistrate. He told me that the woman who had been insulted was a young lady, Mademoiselle Henriette Bonnel, who had just received her certificate as governess in Paris, and spent her holidays with her uncle and aunt, who were very respectable tradespeople in Meuse. What made Morin's case all the more serious was that the uncle had lodged a complaint, but the public official had consented to let the matter drop if the complaint were withdrawn, so we must try and get him to do this. I went back to Morin's and found him in bed, ill with excitement and distress. His wife, a tall, raw-boned woman with a beard, was abusing him continually, and she showed me into the room, shouting at me, "'So, you have come to see that pig of a Morin. Well, there he is, the darling!' 
and she planted herself in front of the bed with her hands on her hips. I told him how matters stood, and he begged me to go and see the girl's uncle and aunt. It was a delicate mission, but I undertook it, and the poor devil never ceased repeating. I assure you I did not even kiss her. No, not even that. I will take my oath to it. I replied, It is all the same. You are nothing but a pig. And I took a thousand francs which she gave me to employ as I thought best. But as I did not care to venture to her uncle's house alone, I begged Rivet to go with me, which she agreed to do on condition that we went immediately, for he had some urgent business at La Rochelle that afternoon. So two hours later we rang at the door of a pretty country house. An attractive girl came and opened the door to us, assuredly the young lady in question. And I said to Rive in a low voice, "'Confound it! I begin to understand more in. The uncle, Monsieur Tonnelet, subscribed to the finale and was a fervent political co-religionist of ours. He received us with open arms and congratulated us and wished us joy. He was delighted at having the two editors in his house, and Rive whispered to me, "'I think we shall be able to arrange the matter of that pig of a Morin for him.' The niece had left the room, and I introduced the delicate subject— I waved the specter of a scandal before his eyes. I accentuated the inevitable depreciation which the young lady would suffer if such an affair became known, for nobody would believe in a simple kiss, and the good man seemed undecided, but he could not make up his mind about anything without his wife, who would not be in until late that evening. But suddenly he uttered an exclamation of triumph. "'Look here, I have an excellent idea. I will keep you here to dine and sleep, and when my wife comes home I hope we shall be able to arrange matters.' Rivet resisted at first, but the wish to extricate that pig of a Morin decided him, and we accepted the invitation, and the uncle got up, radiant, called his niece and proposed that we should take a stroll in his grounds, saying, We will leave serious matters until the morning. Rivet and he began to talk politics, while I soon found myself lagging a little behind with the girl, who was really charming, charming, and with the greatest precaution I began to speak to her about her adventure and try to make her my ally. She did not, however, appear the least confused, and listened to me like a person who was enjoying the whole thing very much. I said to her, "'Just think, mademoiselle, how unpleasant it will be for you. You will have to appear in court to encounter malicious looks, to speak before everybody, and to recount that unfortunate occurrence in the railway carriage in public. Do you not think, between ourselves, that it would have been much better for you to have put that dirty scoundrel back in his place without calling for assistance, and merely to change your carriage?' She began to laugh, and replied, "'What you say is quite true, but what could I do?' I was frightened, and when one is frightened, one does not stop to reason with oneself. As soon as I realized the situation, I was very sorry that I had called out, but then it was too late. You must also remember that the idiot threw himself upon me like a madman, without saying a word and looking like a lunatic. I did not even know what he wanted of me. She looked me full in the face without being nervous or intimidated, and I said to myself, She is a queer sort of girl, that. I can see how that pig Morin came to make a mistake. And I went on jokingly. Come, mademoiselle, confess that he was excusable, for after all, a man cannot find himself opposite such a pretty girl as you are without feeling a natural desire to kiss her. She laughed more than ever and showed her teeth and said, Between the desire and the act, monsieur, there is room for respect. It was an odd expression to use, although it was not very clear, and I asked abruptly, Well now, suppose I were to kiss you, what would you do? She stopped to look at me from head to foot and then said calmly, Oh, you, that is quite another matter. I knew perfectly well by Jove that it was not the same thing at all, as everybody in the neighborhood called me handsome La Barbe. I was thirty years old in those days. But I asked her, And why, pray? She shrugged her shoulders and replied, Well, because you are not so stupid as he is. And then she added, looking at me slyly, Nor so ugly either. And before she could make a movement to avoid me, I had implanted a hearty kiss on her cheek. She sprang aside, but it was too late. And then she said, well, you are not very bashful either, but don't do that sort of thing again. I put on a humble look and said in a low voice, Oh, mademoiselle, as for me, if I long for one thing more than another, it is to be summoned before a magistrate for the same reason as Morin. Why? she asked. And looking steadily at her, I replied, Because you are one of the most beautiful creatures living, because it would be an honor and a glory for me to have wished to offer you violence, and because people would have said, after seeing you, well, La Barbe has richly deserved what he has got, but he is a lucky fellow all the same. She began to laugh heartily again and said, How funny you are! And she had not finished the word funny before I had her in my arms and was kissing her ardently wherever I could find a place, on her forehead, on her eyes, on her lips, occasionally on her cheeks, all over her head, some part of which she was obliged to leave exposed, in spite of herself, to defend the others. But at last she managed to release herself, blushing and angry. "'You are very unmannerly, monsieur,' she said, "'and I am sorry I listened to you.' I took her hand in some confusion and stammered out, 
I, I beg your pardon. I, I beg your pardon, mademoiselle. I have offended you. I have acted like a brute. Do not be angry with me for what I have done. If you knew... I vainly sought for some excuse, and in a few moments she said, There is nothing for me to know, monsieur. But I had found something to say, and I cried, Mademoiselle, I love you! She was really surprised, and raised her eyes to look at me, and I went on, Yes, mademoiselle, and pray listen to me. I do not know Morin, and I do not care anything about him. It does not matter to me the least if he is committed for trial and locked up meanwhile. I saw you here last year, and I was so taken with you that the thought of you has never left me since, and it does not matter to me whether you believe me or not. I thought you adorable, and the remembrance of you took such a hold on me that I longed to see you again, and so I made use of that fool Morin as a pretext, and here I am. Circumstances have made me exceed the due limits of respect, and I can only beg you to pardon me. She looked at me to see if I was in earnest and was ready to smile again. Then she murmured, You humbug. But I raised my hand and said in a sincere voice, and I really believe that I was sincere, I swear to you that I am speaking the truth. And she replied quite simply, Don't talk nonsense. We were alone, quite alone, as Rive and her uncle had disappeared down a sidewalk, and I made her a real declaration of love while I squeezed and kissed her hands, and she listened to it as something new and agreeable, without exactly knowing how much of it she was to believe, while in the end I felt agitated, and at last really myself believed what I said. I was pale, anxious, and trembling, and I gently put my arm round her waist and spoke to her softly, whispering into the little curls over her ears. She seemed in a trance, so absorbed in thought was she. Then her hand touched mine, and she pressed it, and I gently squeezed her waist with a trembling and gradually firmer grasp. She did not move now, and I touched her cheek with my lips, and suddenly, without seeking them, my lips met hers. It was a long, long kiss, and it would have lasted longer still if I had not heard a <clears throat> just behind me, at which she made her escape through the bushes, and turning round I saw Rive coming toward me, and, standing in the middle of the path, he said without even smiling, So that is the way you settle the affair of that pig of a Morin. And I replied conceitedly, One does what one can, my dear fellow, but what about the uncle? How have you got on with him? I will answer for the niece. I have not been so fortunate with him, he replied, whereupon I took his arm and we went indoors. Dinner made me lose my head altogether. I sat beside her, and my hand continually met hers under the tablecloth. My foot touched hers, and our glances met. After dinner, we took a walk by moonlight, and I whispered all the tender things I could think of to her. I held her close to me, kissed her every moment, while her uncle and Rive were arguing as they walked in front of us. They went in, and soon a messenger brought a telegram from her aunt, saying that she would not return until the next morning, at seven o'clock, by the first train. "'Very well, Henriette,' her uncle said. "'Go and show the gentlemen their rooms.' She showed Rive his first and she whispered to me, there was no danger of her taking us into yours first. Then she took me to my room, and as soon as she was alone with me, I took her in my arms again and tried to arouse her emotion, but when she saw the danger, she escaped out of the room, and I retired very much put out and excited and feeling rather foolish, for I knew that I should not sleep much, and I was wondering how I could have committed such a mistake, when there was a gentle knock at my door, and on my asking who was there, a low voice replied, I... I dressed myself quickly and opened the door, and she came in. I forgot to ask what you take in the morning, she said. Chocolate, tea, or coffee? I put my arms round her impetuously and said, devouring her with kisses, I will take, I will take. But she freed herself from my arms, blew out my candle, and disappeared, and left me alone in the dark, furious, trying to find some matches and not being able to do so. At last I got some, and I went into the passage, feeling half mad with my candlestick in my hand. What was I about to do? I did not stop to reason, I only wanted to find her, and I would. I went a few steps without reflecting, but then I suddenly thought, suppose I should walk into the uncle's room, what should I say? And I stood still, with my head avoid and my heart beating. But in a few moments I thought of an answer. Of course, I shall say that I was looking for Rive and trying to speak to him about an important matter. And I began to inspect all the doors, trying to find hers. And at last I took hold of a handle at a venture, turned it, and went in. There was Henriette sitting on her bed and looking at me in tears. So I gently turned the key, and going up to her on tiptoe, I said, I forgot to ask you for something to read, mademoiselle. I was stealthily returning to my room when a rough hand seized me, and a voice, it was Rive's, whispered in my ear, So you have not yet quite settled that affair of Morin's. At seven o'clock the next morning, Henriette herself brought me a cup of chocolate. I have never drunk anything like it. Soft, velvety, perfumed, delicious... I could hardly take away my lips from the cup, and she had hardly left the room when Rive came in. He seemed nervous and irritable, like a man who had not slept, and he said to me crossly, 
If you go on like this, you will end up spoiling the affair of that pig of a Morin. At eight o'clock, the aunt arrived. Our discussion was very short, for they withdrew their complaint, and I left five hundred francs for the poor of the town. They wanted to keep us for the day, and they arranged an excursion to go and see some ruins. Henriette made signs for me to stay, behind her parents' back, and I accepted. But Rivet was determined to go, and though I took him aside and begged and prayed him to do this for me, he appeared quite exasperated, and kept saying to me, I have had enough of that pig of a Morin's affair, do you hear? Of course, I was obliged to leave also, and it was one of the hardest moments of my life. I could have gone on arranging that business as long as I lived, and when we were in the railway carriage, after shaking hands with her in silence, I said to Rivet, You are a mere brute! And he replied, My dear fellow, you were beginning to annoy me confoundedly. On getting to the Fanal office, I saw a crowd waiting for us, and as soon as they saw us, they all exclaimed, Well, have you settled the affair of that pig of a Morin? All La Rochelle was excited about it, and Rivet, who had got over his ill humor on the journey, had great difficulty in keeping himself from laughing as he said, Yes, we have managed it, thanks to La Barbe, and we went to Morin's. He was sitting in an easy chair with mustard plasters on his legs and cold bandages on his head, nearly dead with misery. He was coughing with the short cough of a dying man, without anyone knowing how he had caught it, and his wife looked at him like a tigress ready to eat him, and as soon as he saw us, he trembled so violently as to make his hands and knees shake, so I said to him immediately, "'It is all settled, you dirty scamp, but don't do such a thing again.' He got up, choking, took my hands and kissed them as if they had belonged to a prince, cried, nearly fainted, embraced Rivet, and even kissed Madame Morin, who gave him such a push as to send him staggering back into his chair, but he never got over the blow, his mind had been too much upset. In all the country round, moreover, he was called nothing but that pig of a Morin, and that epithet went through him like a sword thrust every time he heard it. When a street boy called after him, Pig! he turned his head instinctively. His friends also overwhelmed him with horrible jokes, and used to ask him, whenever they were eating ham, Is it a bit of yourself? He died two years later. As for myself, when I was a candidate for the Chamber of Deputies in 1875, I called on the new notary at Fousser, Monsieur Belangle, to solicit his vote, and a tall, handsome, and evidently wealthy lady received me. You do not know me again? she said, and I stammered out, Why, no, madame. Henriette Bonnell. Ah, and I felt myself turning pale, while she seemed perfectly at her ease and looked at me with a smile. As soon as she had left me alone with her husband, he took both my hands, and, squeezing them as if he meant to crush them, he said, I have been intending to go and see you for a long time, my dear sir, for my wife has very often talked to me about you. I know, yes, I know under what painful circumstances you made her acquaintance, and I know how perfectly you behaved, how full of delicacy, tact, and devotion you showed yourself in that affair. He hesitated, and then said in a lower tone, as if he had been saying something low and coarse, In the affair of that pig of a Morin. End of section 137. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 138 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 138. St. Anthony. They called him St. Anthony because his name was Anthony, and also, perhaps, because he was a good fellow, jovial, a lover of practical jokes, a tremendous eater and a heavy drinker, and a gay fellow, although he was sixty years old. He was a big peasant of the district of Co with a red face, large chest and stomach, and perched on two legs that seemed too slight for the bulk of his body. He was a widower and lived alone with his two men servants and a maid on his farm, which he conducted with shrewd economy. He was careful of his own interests, understood business and the raising of cattle, and farming. His two sons and his three daughters, who had married well, were living in the neighborhood and came to dine with their father once a month. His vigor of body was famous in all the countryside. He was as strong as St. Anthony had become a kind of proverb. At the time of the Prussian invasion, St. Anthony, at the wine shop, promised to eat an army, for he was a braggart, like a true Norman, a bit of a coward and a blusterer. He banged his fist on the wooden table, making the cups and the brandy glasses dance, and cried with the assumed wrath of a good fellow, with a flushed face and a sly look in his eye, I shall have to eat some of them, nom de Dieu. He reckoned that the Prussians would not come as far as Tanville, but when he heard they were at Roteau, he never went out of the house and constantly watched the door from the little window of his kitchen, expecting at any moment to see the bayonets go by. One morning, as he was eating his luncheon with the servants, the door opened, and the mayor of the community, Maître Chicot, appeared, followed by a soldier wearing a black copper-pointed helmet. 
St. Anthony bounded to his feet, and his servants all looked at him, expecting to see him slash the Prussian. But he merely shook hands with the mayor, who said, Here is one for you, St. Anthony. They came last night. Don't do anything foolish, above all things, for they talked of shooting and burning everything if there is the slightest unpleasantness. I have given you warning. Give him something to eat. He looks like a good fellow. Good day. I am going to call on the rest. There are enough for all. And he went out. St. Anthony, who had turned pale, looked at the Prussian. He was a big, young fellow with plump white skin, blue eyes, fair hair, unshaven to his cheekbones, who looked stupid, timid, and good. The shrewd Norman read him at once, and, reassured, he made him a sign to sit down. Then he said, "'Will you take some soup?' The stranger did not understand. Anthony then became bolder, and pushing a plateful of soup right under his nose, he said, "'Here, swallow that, big pig!' The soldier answered, "'Yah!' and began to eat greedily, while the farmer, triumphant, feeling he had regained his reputation, winked his eye at the servants, who were making strange grimaces, what with their terror and their desire to laugh. When the Prussian had devoured his soup, St. Anthony gave him another plateful, which disappeared in like manner, but he flinched at the third which the farmer tried to insist on his eating, saying, "'Come, put that into your stomach. T'will fatten you, or it is your own fault, eh, pig?' The soldier, understanding only that they wanted to make him eat all his soup, laughed in a contented manner, making a sign to show that he could not hold any more. Then St. Anthony became quite familiar, tapped him on the stomach, saying, "'My, there's plenty in my pig's belly!' But suddenly he began to writhe with laughter, unable to speak. An idea had struck him which made him choke with mirth. "'That's it! That's it! St. Anthony and his pig! There's my pig!' And the three servants burst out laughing in their turn. The old fellow was so pleased that he had the brandy brought in. Good stuff. Filon guise, and treated everyone. They clinked glasses with the Prussian, who clacked his tongue by way of flattery to show that he enjoyed it. And St. Anthony exclaimed in his face, "'Eh, is not that super fine? You don't get anything like that in your home, pig!' From that time, Father Anthony never went out without his Prussian. He had got what he wanted. This was his vengeance, the vengeance of an old rogue. And the whole countryside, which was in terror, laughed to split its sides at St. Anthony's joke. Truly, there was no one like him when it came to humor. No one but he would have thought of a thing like that. He was a born joker. He went to see his neighbors every day, arm in arm with his German, whom he introduced in a jovial manner, tapping him on the shoulder. See, here is my pig. Look and see if he is not growing fat, the animal. And the peasants would beam with smiles. He is so comical, that reckless fellow Antoine. I will sell him to you, Césaire, for three pistoles, thirty francs. I will take him, Antoine, and I invite you to eat some black pudding. What I want is his feet. Feel his belly, you will see that it is all fat. And they all winked at each other, but dared not laugh too loud, for fear the Prussian might finally suspect they were laughing at him. Anthony, alone growing bolder every day, pinched his thighs, exclaiming, Nothing but fat, tapped on on his back, shouting, That is all bacon, lifted him up in his arms as an old colossus that could have lifted an anvil, declaring, He weighs six hundred and no waste. He had gotten to the habit of making people offer his pig something to eat wherever they went together. This was the chief pleasure, the great diversion every day. Give him whatever you please, he will swallow everything. And they offered the man bread and butter, potatoes, cold meat, chitterlings, which caused the remark, some of your own, and choice ones. The soldier, stupid and gentle, ate from politeness, charmed at these attentions, making himself ill rather than refuse, and he was actually growing fat, and his uniform became too tight for him. This delighted St. Anthony, who said, You know, my pig, that we shall have to have another cage made for you. They had, however, become the best friends in the world, and when the old fellow went to attend his business in the neighborhood, the Prussian accompanied him for the simple pleasure of being with him. The weather was severe, it was freezing hard, the terrible winter of 1870 seemed to bring all the scourges on France at one time. St. Anthony, who made provision beforehand and took advantage of every opportunity, foreseeing that manure would be scarce for the spring farming, bought it from a neighbor a cart, which happened to be in need of all the money that he had, and it was agreed that he should go every evening with his cart to get a load. So every day at twilight he set out for the farm of Hull, half a league distant, always accompanied by his pig, and each time it was a festival feeding the animal. All the neighbors ran over there as they would go to high mass on Sunday. But the soldier began to suspect something, be mistrustful, and when they laughed too loud he would roll his eyes uneasily, and sometimes they lighted up with anger. One evening when he had eaten his fill he refused to swallow another morsel and attempted to rise to leave the table, but St. Anthony stopped him by a turn of the wrist, and, placing his two powerful hands on his shoulders, he sat him down again so roughly that the chair smashed under him. A wild burst of laughter broke forth, and Anthony, beaming, picked up his pig, acted as though he were dressing his wounds, and exclaimed, 
Since you will not eat, you shall drink, nom de Dieu. And they went to the wine shop to get some brandy. The soldier rolled his eyes, which had a wicked expression, but he drank nevertheless. He drank as long as they wanted him, and St. Anthony held his head to the great delight of his companions. The Norman, red as a tomato, his eyes ablaze, filled up the glasses and clinked, saying, Here's to you! And the Prussian, without speaking a word, poured down one after another glassfuls of cognac. It was a contest, a battle, a revenge. Who would drink the most? Nom don nom! They could neither of them stand any more when the leader was emptied, but neither was conquered. They were tied, that was all. They would have to begin again the next day. They went out staggering and started for home, walking beside the dung cart which was drawn along slowly by two horses. Snow began to fall and the moonless night was sadly lighted by this dead whiteness on the plain. The men began to feel the cold, and this aggravated their intoxication. St. Anthony, annoyed at not being the victor, amused himself by shoving his companion so as to make him fall over into the ditch. The other would dodge backwards, and each time he did he uttered some German expression in an angry tone, which made the peasant roar with laughter. Finally the Prussian lost his temper, and just as Anthony was rolling towards him he responded with such a terrific blow with his fist that the colossus staggered. Then, excited by the brandy, the old man seized the pugilist round the waist, shook him for a few moments as he would have done with a child, and pitched him at random to the other side of the road. Then, satisfied with this piece of work, he crossed his arms and began to laugh afresh. But the soldier picked himself up in a hurry, his head bare, his helmet having rolled off, and drawing his sword he rushed over to St. Anthony. When he saw him coming, the peasant seized his whip by the top of the handle, his big Hollywood whip, straight, strong, and supple as the sinew of an ox. The Prussian approached, his head down, making a lunge with his sword, sure of killing his adversary. But the old fellow, squarely hitting the blade, the point of which would have pierced his stomach, turned it aside, and with the butt end of the whip struck the soldier a sharp blow on the temple, and he fell to the ground. Then he gazed aghast, stupefied with amazement, at the body, twitching convulsively at first, and then lying prone and motionless. He bent over it, turned it on its back, and gazed at it for some time. The man's eyes were closed, and blood trickled from a wound at the side of his forehead. Although it was dark, St. Anthony could distinguish the blood stain on the white snow. He remained there at his wit's end while his cart continued slowly on its way. What was he to do? He would be shot. They would burn his farm, ruin his district. What should he do? What should he do? How could he hide the body, conceal the fact of the death, deceive the Prussians? He heard voices in the distance, amid the utter stillness of the snow. All at once he roused himself, and picking up the helmet he placed it on his victim's head. Then, seizing him round the body, he lifted himself up in his arms, and thus running with him he overtook his team, and threw the body on top of the manure. Once in his own house he would think up some plan. He walked slowly, racking his brain, but without result. He saw, he felt, that he was lost. He entered his courtyard. A light was shining in one of the attic windows. His maid was not asleep. He hastily backed his wagon to the edge of the manure hollow. He thought that by overturning the manure, the body lying on top of it would fall into the ditch and be buried beneath it, and he dumped the cart. As he had foreseen, the man was buried beneath the manure. Anthony evened it down with his fork, which he stuck in the ground beside it. He called his stableman, told him to put up the horses, and went to his room. He went to bed, still thinking of what he had best do, but no ideas came to him. His apprehension increased in the quiet of his room. They would shoot him. He was bathed in perspiration from fear. His teeth chattered. He rose shivering, not being able to stay in bed. He went downstairs to the kitchen, took the bottle of brandy from the sideboard, and carried it upstairs. He drank two large glasses, one after the other, adding a fresh intoxication to the late one, without quieting his mental anguish. He had done a pretty stroke of work, nom de Dieu, idiot! He paced up and down, trying to think of some stratagem, some explanation, some cunning trick, and from time to time he rinsed his mouth with a swallow of filandis to give him courage. But no ideas came to him, not one. Towards midnight, his watchdog, a kind of cross wolf called Devorant, began to howl frantically. St. Anthony shuddered to the marrow of his bones, and each time the beast began his long and lugubrious wail, the old man's skin turned to goose flesh. He had sunk into a chair, his legs weak, stupefied, done up, waiting anxiously for Deverant to set up another howl, and starting convulsively from nervousness caused by terror. The clock downstairs struck five. The dog was still howling. The peasant was almost insane. He rose to go and let the dog loose so that he should not hear him. He went downstairs, opened the hall door, and stepped out into the darkness. The snow was still falling. The earth was all white, the farm buildings standing out like black patches. He approached the kennel. The dog was dragging at its chain. He unfastened it. Deverant gave a bound, then stopped short, his hair bristling, his legs rigid, his muzzle in the air, his nose pointed toward the manure heap. St. Anthony, trembling from head to foot, faltered. What's the matter with you, you dirty hound? 
and he walked a few steps forward, gazing at the indistinct outlines, the somber shadow of the courtyard. Then he saw a form, the form of a man sitting on the manure heap. He gazed at it, paralyzed by fear and breathing hard. But all at once he saw, close by, the handle of the manure fork, which was sticking in the ground. He snatched it up, and in one of those transports of fear that will make the greatest coward brave, he rushed forward to see what it was. It was he, his Prussian, come to life, covered with filth from his bed of manure which had kept him warm. He had sat down mechanically, and remained there in the snow which sprinkled down, all covered with dirt and blood as he was, and still stupid from drinking, dazed by the blow, and exhausted from his wound. He perceived Anthony, and too sodden to understand anything, he made an attempt to rise, but at the moment the old man recognized him, he foamed with rage like a wild animal. "'Ah, pig, pig!' he sputtered. "'You are not dead! You are going to denounce me now! Wait! Wait!' And rushing on the German with all the strength of his arms, he flung the raised fork like a lance and buried the four prongs full length in his breast. The soldier fell over on his back, uttering a long death moan, while the old peasant, drawing the fork out of his breast, plunged it over and over again into his abdomen, his stomach, his throat, like a madman, piercing the body from head to foot, as it still quivered and the blood gushed out in streams. Finally, he stopped, exhausted by his arduous work, swallowing great mouthfuls of air, calmed down at the completion of a murder. As the cocks were beginning to crow in the poultry yard and it was near daybreak, he set to work to bury the man. He dug a hole in the manure till he reached the earth, dug down further, working wildly, in a frenzy of strength with frantic motions of his arms and body. When the pit was deep enough, he rolled the corpse into it with the fork, covered it with earth, which he stamped down for some time, and then put back the manure, and he smiled as he saw the thick snow finishing his work and covering up its traces with a white sheet. He then stuck the fork in the manure and went into the house. His bottle, still half full of brandy, stood on the table. He emptied it at a draught, threw himself in his bed, and slept heavily. He woke up sober, his mind calm and clear, capable of judgment and thought. At the end of an hour, he was going about the country making inquiries everywhere for his soldier. He went to see a Prussian officer to find out why they had taken away his man. As everyone knew what great friends they were, no one suspected him. He even directed the research, declaring that the Prussian went to see the girls every evening. An old retired gendarme, who had an inn in the next village, and a pretty daughter, was arrested and shot. End of section 138 Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 139 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 139. Lasting Love. It was the end of the dinner that opened the shooting season. The Marquis de Bertrand, with his guests, sat around a brightly lighted table, covered with fruit and flowers. The conversation drifted to love. Immediately there arose an animated discussion, the same eternal discussion as to whether it were possible to love more than once. Examples were given of persons who had loved once. These were offset by those who had loved violently many times. The men agreed that passion, like sickness, may attack the same person several times unless it strikes to kill. This conclusion seemed quite incontestable. The women, however, who based their opinion on poetry rather than on practical observation, maintain that love, the great passion, may come once only to mortals. It resembles lightning, they said, this love. A heart once touched by it becomes forever such a waste, so ruined, so consumed, that no other strong sentiment can take root here, not even a dream. The Marquis, who had indulged in many love affairs, disputed this belief. I tell you it is possible to love several times with all one's heart and soul. You quote examples of persons who have killed themselves for love, to prove the impossibility of a second passion. I wager that if they had not foolishly committed suicide, and so destroyed the possibility of a second experience, they would have found a new love, and still another, and so on, till death. It is with love as with drink. He who has once indulged is forever a slave. It is a thing of temperament. They chose the old doctor as umpire. He thought it was, as the Marquis had said, a thing of temperament. As for me, he said, I knew once of a love which lasted fifty-five years without one day's respite, and which ended only with death. The wife of the Marquis clasped her hands. That is beautiful. Ah, what a dream to be loved in such a way. What bliss to live for fifty-five years enveloped in an intense, unwavering affection. How this happy being must have blessed his life to be so adored. The doctor smiled. You are not mistaken, madame. On this point, the loved one was a man. You even knew him. It was Monsieur Chouquet, the chemist. As to the women, you also know her, the old chairmender who came every year to the chateau. The enthusiasm of the women fell. Some expressed their contempt with, Pouah! for the loves of common people did not interest them. The doctor continued. 
Three months ago, I was called to the deathbed of the old chairmender. The priest had preceded me. She wished to make us the executors of her will. In order that we might understand her conduct, she told us the story of her life. It is most singular and touching. Her father and mother were both chairmenders. She had never lived in a house. As a little child, she wandered about with them, dirty, unkempt, hungry. They visited many towns, leaving their horse, wagon, and dog just outside the limits, where the child played in the grass alone until her parents had repaired all the broken chairs in the place. They seldom spoke, except to cry, Chairs! Chairs! Chairmender! When the little one strayed too far away, she would be called back by the harsh, angry voice of her father. She never heard a word of affection. When she grew older, she fetched and carried the broken chairs. Then it was she made friends with the children in the street, but their parents always called them away and scolded them for speaking to the barefooted child. Often the boys threw stones at her. Once a kind woman gave her a few pennies. She saved them most carefully. One day, she was then eleven years old, as she was walking through a country town, she met behind the cemetery little Chouquet, weeping bitterly because one of his playmates had stolen two precious mills. The tears of the small bourgeois, one of those much-envied mortals, who, she imagined, never knew trouble, completely upset her. She approached him, and as soon as she learned the cause of his grief, she put into his hands all her savings. He took them without hesitation and dried his eyes. Wild with joy, she kissed him. He was busy counting his money and did not object. Seeing that she was not repulsed, she threw her arms round him and gave him a hug. Then he ran away. What was going on in her poor little head? Was it because she had sacrificed all her fortune that she became madly fond of this youngster? Or was it because she had given him the first tender kiss? The mystery is alike for children and for those of riper years. For months she dreamed of that corner near the cemetery and of the little chap. She stole a sou here and there from her parents on the chair money or the groceries she was sent to buy. When she returned to the spot near the cemetery, she had two francs in her pocket, but he was not there. Passing his father's drug store, she caught sight of him behind the counter. He was sitting between a large red globe and a blue one. She only loved him the more, quite carried away at the sight of the brilliant colored globes. She cherished the recollection of it forever in her heart. The following year, she met him near the school playing marbles. She rushed up to him, threw her arms round him, and kissed him so passionately that he screamed in fear. To quiet him, she gave him all her money. Three francs and twenty centimes, a real gold mine, at which he gazed with staring eyes. After this, he allowed her to kiss him as much as she wished. During the next four years, she put into his hands all her savings, which he pocketed conscientiously in exchange for kisses. At one time it was thirty sous, at another two francs. Again, she only had twelve sous. She wept with grief and shame, explaining brokenly that it had been a poor year. The next time she brought five francs in one whole piece, which made her laugh with joy. She no longer thought of anyone but the boy, and he watched for her with impatience. Sometimes he would run to meet her. This made her heart thump with joy. Suddenly he disappeared. He had gone to boarding school. She found this out by careful investigation. Then she used great diplomacy to persuade her parents to change their route and pass by this way again during vacation. After a year of scheming, she succeeded. She had not seen him for two years and scarcely recognized him. He was so changed. He had grown taller, better looking, and was imposing in his uniform with its brass buttons. He pretended not to see her and passed by without a glance. She wept for two days and from that time loved and suffered unceasingly. Every year he came home and she passed him, not daring to lift her eyes. He never condescended to turn his head toward her. She loved him madly, hopelessly. She said to me, He is the only man whom I have ever seen. I don't even know if another exists. Her parents died. She continued their work. One day, on entering the village where her heart always remained, she saw Chouquet coming out of his pharmacy with a young lady leaning on his arm. She was his wife. That night the chairmender threw herself into the river. A drunkard passing the spot pulled her out and took her to the drugstore. Young Chouquet came down in his dressing gown to revive her. Without seeming to know who she was, he undressed her and rubbed her. Then he said to her, in a harsh voice, "'You are mad. People must not do stupid things like that.' His voice brought her to life again. He had spoken to her. She was happy for a long time. He refused remuneration for his trouble, although she insisted. All her life passed in this way. She worked, thinking always of him. She began to buy medicines at his pharmacy. This gave her a chance to talk to him and to see him closely.' In this way, she was still able to give him money. As I said before, she died this spring. When she had closed her pathetic story, she entreated me to take her earnings to the man she loved. She had worked only that she might leave him something to remind him of her after her death. I gave the priest fifty francs for her funeral expenses. The next morning I went to see the Chouquets. They were finishing breakfast, sitting opposite each other, fat and red, important and self-satisfied. They welcomed me and offered me some coffee, which I accepted. Then I began my story in a trembling voice, sure that they would be softened even to tears. 
As soon as Chouquet understood that he had been loved by that vagabond, that chairmender, that wanderer, he swore with indignation as though his reputation had been sullied, the respect of decent people lost, his personal honor, something precious and dearer to him than life, gone. His exasperated wife kept repeating, "'That beggar, that beggar.' Seeming unable to find words suitable to the enormity, he stood up and began striding about. He muttered, "'Can you understand anything so horrible, doctor? Oh, if I had only known it while she was alive, I should have had her thrown into prison. I promise you, she would not have escaped.' I was dumbfounded. I hardly knew what to think or say, but I had to finish my mission. She commissioned me, I said, to give you her savings, which amount to 3,500 francs. As what I have just told you seems to be very disagreeable, perhaps you would prefer me giving this money to the poor. They looked at me, that man and that woman, speechless with amazement. I took the few thousand francs from out of my pocket, wretched-looking money from every country, pennies and gold pieces all mixed together. Then I asked, What is your decision? Madame Chouquet spoke first. Well, since it is the dying woman's wish, it seems to be impossible to refuse it. Her husband said, in a shame-faced manner, We could buy something for our children with it. I answered dryly, As you wish. He replied, Well, give it to us anyhow, since she commissioned you to do so, we will find a way to put it to some good use. I gave them the money, bowed, and left. The next day, Chouquet came to me and said brusquely, That woman left her wagon here. What have you done with it? Nothing. Take it if you wish. It's just what I wanted, he added, and walked off. I called him back and said, She also left her old horse and two dogs. Don't you need them? He stared at me, surprised. Well, no, really, what would I do with them? Dispose of them as you like. He laughed and held out his hand to me. I shook it. What could I do? The doctor and the druggist in a country village must not be at enmity. I have kept the dogs. The priest took the old horse. The wagon is useful to Chouquet, and with the money he has bought railroad stock. That is the only deep, sincere love that I have ever known in all my life. The doctor looked up. The Marquise, whose eyes were full of tears, sighed and said, There is no denying the fact only women know how to love. End of section 139 Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 140 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 140. Pierrot. Madame Lefebvre was a country dame, a widow, one of those half-peasants with ribbons and bonnets with trimming on them, one of those persons who clipped her words and put on great airs in public, concealing the soul of a pretentious animal beneath a comical and bedizened exterior, just as the country folks hide their coarse red hands in ecru silk gloves. She had a servant, a good simple peasant called Rose. The two women lived in a little house with green shutters by the side of the high road in Normandy, in the center of the country of Caux. As they had a narrow strip of garden in front of the house, they grew some vegetables. One night someone stole twelve onions. As soon as Rose became aware of the theft, she ran to tell Madame, who came downstairs in her woolen petticoat. It was a shame and a disgrace. They had robbed her, Madame Lefebvre. As these were thieves in the country, they might come back. And the two frightened women examined the foot tracks, talking and supposing all sorts of things. See, they went that way, they stepped on the wall, they jumped into the garden. And they became apprehensive for the future. How could they sleep in peace now? The news of the theft spread. The neighbors came, making examinations and discussing the matter in their turn, while the two women explained to each newcomer what they had observed and their opinion. A farmer who lived near said to them, You ought to have a dog. That is true. They ought to have a dog, if it were only to give the alarm. Not a big dog. Heavens, what would they do with a big dog? He would eat their heads off. But a little dog, a little puppy, who would bark. As soon as everyone had left, Madame Lefebvre would discuss this idea of a dog for some time. On reflection, she made a thousand objections, terrified at the idea of a bowl full of soup, for she belonged to that race of parsimonious country women who always carry on teams in their pocket to give alms in public to beggars on the road and to put in the Sunday collection plate. Rose, who loved animals, gave her opinion and defended it shrewdly, so it was decided that they should have a dog, a very small dog. They began to look for one, but could find nothing but big dogs, who would devour enough soup to make one shudder. The grocer of Rovia had one, a tiny one, but he demanded two francs to cover the cost of sending it. Madame Lefebvre declared that she would feed a dog, but would not buy one. The baker, who knew all that occurred, brought in his wagon one morning a strange little yellow animal, almost without paws, with the body of a crocodile, the head of a fox, and a curly tail, a true cockade as big as all the rest of him. 
Madame Lefebvre thought this common cur that cost nothing was very handsome. Rose hugged it and asked what its name was. Pierrot, replied the baker. The dog was installed in an old soap box, and they gave it some water, which it drank. They then offered it a piece of bread. He ate it. Madame Lefebvre, uneasy, had an idea. When he is thoroughly accustomed to the house, we can let him run. He can find something to eat, roaming about the country. They let him run, in fact, which did not prevent him from being famished. Also, he never barked, except to beg for food, and then he barked furiously. Anyone might come into the garden, and Pierrot would run up and fawn on each one in turn and not utter a bark. Madame Lefebvre, however, had become accustomed to the animal. She even went so far as to like it, and gave it from time to time pieces of bread soaked in the gravy on her plate. But she had not once thought of the dog tax, and when they came to collect eight francs, eight francs, madame, for this puppy who never even barked, she almost fainted from the shock. It was immediately decided that they must get rid of Pierrot. No one wanted him. Everyone declined to take him for ten leagues around. They then resolved, not knowing what else to do, to make him piqué du mât. Piqué du mât means to eat chalk. When one wants to get rid of a dog, they make him piqué du mât. In the midst of an immense plain, one sees a kind of hut, or rather a very small roof standing above the ground. This is the entrance to the clay pit. A big perpendicular hole is sunk for twenty meters underground and ends in a series of long subterranean tunnels. Once a year, they go down into the quarry at the time they fertilize the ground. The rest of the year, it serves as a cemetery for condemned dogs, and as one passed by this hole, plaintive howls, furious or despairing barks, and lamentable appeals reach one's ear. Sportsmen's dogs and sheep dogs flee in terror from this mournful place, and when one leans over it, one perceives a disgusting odor of putrefaction. Frightful dramas are enacted in the darkness. When an animal has suffered down there for ten or twelve days, nourished on the foul remains of his predecessors, another animal, larger and more vigorous, is thrown into the hole. There they are, alone, starving, with glittering eyes. They watch each other, follow each other, hesitate in doubt. But hunger impels them. They attack each other, fight desperately for some time, and the stronger eats the weaker, devours him alive. When it was decided to make Pierrot Piquet du Mas, they looked round for an executioner. The laborer who mended the road demanded six sous to take the dog there. That seemed wildly exorbitant to Madame Lefebvre. The neighbor's hired boy wanted five sous, that was still too much. So Rose, having observed that they had better carry it there themselves, as in that way it would not be brutally treated on the way and made to suspect its fate, they resolved to go together at twilight. They offered the dog that evening a good dish of soup with a piece of butter in it. He swallowed every morsel of it, and as he wagged his tail with delight, Rose put him in her apron. They walked quickly, like thieves, across the plain. They soon perceived the chalk pit and walked up to it. Madame Lefebvre leaned over it to hear if any animal was moaning. No, there were none there. Pierrot would be alone. Then Rose, who was crying, kissed the dog and threw him into the chalk pit, and they both leaned over, listening. First they heard a dull sound, then the sharp, bitter, distracting cry of an animal in pain, then a succession of little mournful cries, then despairing appeals, the cries of a dog who is entreating, his head raised toward the opening of the pit. He yelped. Oh, how he yelped. They were filled with remorse and terror, with wild inexplicable fear, and ran away from the spot. As Rose went faster, Madame Lefebvre cried, Wait for me, Rose, wait for me. At night they were haunted by frightful nightmares. Madame Lefebvre dreamed she was sitting down at table to eat her soup, but when she uncovered the tureen, Pierrot was in it. He jumped out and bit her nose. She awoke and thought she heard him yelping still. She listened, but she was mistaken. She fell asleep again and found herself on a high road, an endless road, which she followed. Suddenly, in the middle of the road, she perceived a basket, a large farmer's basket, lying there, and this basket frightened her. She ended by opening it, and Pierrot, concealed in it, seized her hand and would not let go. She ran away in terror with the dog hanging to the end of her arm, which she held between his teeth. At daybreak, she arose, almost beside herself, and ran to the chalk pit. He was yelping, yelping still, he had yelped all night. She began to sob and called him by all sorts of endearing names. He answered her with all the tender inflections of his dog's voice. Then she wanted to see him again, promising herself that she would give him a good home till he died. She ran to the chalk digger, whose business it was to excavate for chalk, and told him the situation. The man listened, but said nothing. When she had finished, he said, "'You want your dog? That will cost four francs.' She gave a jump. All her grief was at an end at once. Four francs?' she said. You would die of it, four francs? Do you suppose I am going to bring my ropes, my windlass, and set it up, and go down there with my boy, and let myself be bitten, perhaps, by your cursed dog for the pleasure of giving it back to you? You should not have thrown it down there. 
She walked away, indignant. Four francs. As soon as she entered the house, she called Rose and told her of the quarryman's charges. Rose, always resigned, repeated, Four francs, that is a good deal of money, madame. Then she added, If we could throw him something to eat, the poor dog, so he will not die of hunger. Madame Lefebvre approved of this and was quite delighted, so they set out again with a big piece of bread and butter. They cut it in mouthfuls, which they threw down one after the other, speaking by turns to Pierrot. As soon as the dog finished one piece, he yelped for the next. They returned that evening and the next day, and every day, but they only made one trip. One morning, as they were letting fall the first mouthful, they heard a tremendous barking in the pit. There were two dogs there. Another had been thrown in, a large dog. Pierrot, cried Rose, and Pierrot yelped and yelped. Then they began to throw down some food, but each time they noticed distinctly a terrible struggle going on, then plaintive cries from Pierrot, who had been bitten by his companion, who ate up everything as he was stronger. It was in vain that they specified, saying, That is for you, Pierrot. Pierrot evidently got nothing. The two women, dumbfounded, looked at each other, and Madame Lefebvre said in a sour tone, I could not feed all the dogs they throw in there. We must give it up. And, suffocating at the thought of all the dogs living at her expense, she went away, even carrying back what remained of the bread which she ate as she walked along. Rose followed her, wiping her eyes on the corner of her blue apron. End of section 140. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 141 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 141. A Normandy Joke. It was a wedding procession that was coming along the road between the tall trees that bounded the farms and cast their shadow on the road. At the head were the bride and groom, then the family, then the invited guests, and last of all the poor of the neighborhood. The village urchins who hovered about the narrow road like flies ran in and out of the ranks and climbed up the trees to see it better. The bridegroom was a good-looking young fellow, Jean Patou, the richest farmer in that neighborhood, but he was above all things an ardent sportsman who seemed to take leave of his senses in order to satisfy that passion, and who spent large sums on his dogs, his keepers, his ferrets, and his guns. The bride, Rosalie Roussel, had been courted by all the likely young fellows in the district, for they all thought her handsome, and they knew that she would have a good dowry. But she had chosen Patou, partly, perhaps, because she liked him better than she did the others, but still more, like a careful Normandy girl, because he had more crown pieces. As they entered the white gateway of the husband's farm, forty shots resounded without their seeing those who fired, as they were hidden in the ditches. The noise seemed to please the men, who were slouching along heavily in their best clothes, and Patou left his wife, and running up to a farm servant whom he perceived behind a tree, took his gun and fired a shot himself, as frisky as a young colt. Then they went on beneath the apple trees, which were heavy with fruit, through the high grass and through the midst of the calves, who looked at them with their great eyes, got up slowly and remained standing, with their muzzles turned toward the wedding party. The men became serious when they came within measurable distance of the wedding dinner. Some of them, the rich ones, had on tall, shining silk hats, which seemed altogether out of place there. Others had old head coverings with a long nap, which might have been taken for moleskin, while the humblest among them wore caps. All the women had on shawls, which they wore loosely on their back, holding the tips unceremoniously under their arms. They were red, parti-colored, flaming shawls, and their brightness seemed to astonish the black fowls on the dung heap, the ducks on the side of the pond, and the pigeons on the thatched roofs. The extensive farm buildings seemed to be waiting there at the end of that archway of apple trees, and a sort of vapor came out of the open door and windows, and an almost overpowering odor of eatables was exhaled from the vast building, from all its openings and from its very walls. The string of guests extended through the yard, but when the foremost of them reached the house, they broke the chain and dispersed, while those behind were still coming in at the open gate. The ditches were now lined with urchins and curious poor people, and the firing did not cease, but came from every side at once, and a cloud of smoke, and that odor which has the same intoxicating effect as absinthe, blended with the atmosphere. The women were shaking their dresses outside the door to get rid of the dust, were undoing their cap strings and pulling their shawls over their arms, and then they went into the house to lay them aside together for the time. The table was laid in the great kitchen that would hold a hundred persons. They sat down to dinner at two o'clock, and at eight o'clock they were still eating, and the men in their shirt sleeves, with their waistcoats unbuttoned and with red faces, were swallowing down the food and drink as if they had been whirlpools. The cider sparkled merrily, clear and golden in the large glasses, by the side of the dark, blood-colored wine, and between every dish they made a hole, 
the Normandy hole, with a glass of brandy which inflamed the body and put foolish notions into the head. Low jokes were exchanged across the table until the whole arsenal of peasant wit was exhausted. For the last hundred years, the same broad stories had served for similar occasions, and, although everyone knew them, they still hit the mark and made both rows of guests roar with laughter. At the end of the table, four young fellows who were neighbors were preparing some practical jokes for the newly married couple, and they seemed to have got hold of a good one by the way they whispered and laughed, and suddenly one of them, profiting by a moment of silence, exclaimed, "'The poachers will have a good time tonight with this moon. I say, Jean, you will not be looking at the moon, will you?' The bridegroom turned to him quickly and replied, "'Only let them come, that's all.' But the other young fellow began to laugh, and said, "'I do not think you will pay much attention to them.' The whole table was convulsed with laughter, so that the glasses shook, but the bridegroom became furious at the thought that anybody would profit by his wedding to come and poach on his land, and repeated, "'I only say, just let them come.' Then there was a flood of talk with a double meaning which made the bride blush somewhat, although she was trembling with expectation, and when they had emptied the kegs of brandy they all went to bed. The young couple went to their own room, which was on the ground floor, as most rooms in farmhouses are. As it was very warm, they opened the window and closed the shutters. A small lamp in bad taste, a present from the bride's father, was burning on the chest of drawers, and the bed stood ready to receive the young people. The young woman had already taken off her wreath and her dress, and she was in her petticoat, unlacing her boots, while Jean was finishing his cigar and looking at her out of the corners of his eyes. Suddenly, with a brusque movement, like a man who was about to set to work, he took off his coat. She had already taken off her boots and was now pulling off her stockings, and then she said to him, "'Go and hide yourself behind the curtains while I get into bed.' He seemed as if he were about to refuse, but at last he did as she asked him, and in a moment she unfastened her petticoat, which slipped down, fell at her feet, and lay on the ground. She left it there, stepped over it in her loose chemise, and slipped into the bed, whose springs creaked beneath her weight. He immediately went up to the bed, and stooping over his wife, he sought her lips, which she hid beneath the pillow— when a shot was heard in the distance, in the direction of the forest of Rapis, as he thought. He raised himself anxiously with his heart beating, and running to the window he opened the shutters. The full moon flooded the yard with yellow light, and the reflection of the apple trees made black shadows at their feet, while in the distance the fields gleamed, covered with ripe corn. But as he was leaning out, listening to every sound in the still night, two bare arms were put round his neck, and his wife whispered, trying to pull him back, "'Do leave them alone. It has nothing to do with you. Come to bed.' He turned round, put his arms around her, and drew her toward him, but just as he was laying her on the bed, which yielded beneath her weight, they heard another report, considerably nearer this time, and Jean, giving way to his tumultuous rage, swore aloud, "'Damn it! They will think I do not go out and see what it is because of you. Wait, wait a few minutes.' He put on his shoes again, took down his gun, which was always hanging within reach against the wall, and, as his wife threw herself on her knees in her terror, imploring him not to go, he hastily freed himself, ran to the window, and jumped into the yard. She waited one hour, two hours, until daybreak, but her husband did not return. Then she lost her head, aroused the house, related how angry Jean was, and said that he had gone after the poachers, and immediately all the male farm servants, even the boys, went in search of their master. They found him two leagues from the farm, tied hand and foot, half dead with rage, his gun broken, his trousers turned inside out, and with three dead hairs hanging round his neck, and a placard on his chest with these words, Who goes on the chase loses his place. In later years, when he used to tell the story of his wedding night, he usually added, Ah, as far as a joke went, it was a good joke. They caught me in a snare as if I had been a rabbit, the dirty brutes, and they shoved my head into a bag. But if I can only catch them some day, they had better look out for themselves. That is how they amuse themselves in Normandy on a wedding day. End of section 141 Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 142 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 142. Father Matthew. We had just left Rouen and were galloping along the road to Jumige. A light carriage flew along across the level country. Presently the horse slackened his pace to walk up the hill of Cantelaine. One sees there one of the most magnificent views in the world. Behind us lay Rouen, the city of churches, with its gothic belfries, sculpted like ivory trinkets. Before us, saint Sever, the manufacturing suburb, whose thousands of smoking chimneys rise amid the expanse of sky, opposite the thousand sacred steeples of the old city. On the one hand, the spire of the cathedral, the highest of human monuments. On the other, the engine of the powerhouse, its rival, 
and almost as high, and a meter higher than the tallest pyramid in Egypt. Before us wound the Seine, with its scattered islands bordered by white banks, covered with a forest on the right, and on the left immense meadows, bounded by another forest yonder in the distance. Here and there large ships lay at anchor along the banks of the wide river. Three enormous steamboats were starting out, one behind the other, for Havre, and the chain of boats, a bark, two schooners, and a brig were going upstream to Rouen, drawn by a little tug that emitted a cloud of black smoke. My companion, a native of the country, did not glance at this wonderful landscape, but he smiled continually. He seemed to be amused at his thoughts. Suddenly he cried, "'Ah, you will soon see something comical. Father Matthew's chapel. That is a sweet morsel, my boy.' I looked at him in surprise. He continued, "'I will give you a whiff of Normandy that will stay by you. Father Matthew is the handsomest Norman in the province, and his chapel is one of the wonders of the world, nothing more or less. But I will give you first a few words of explanation.' Father Matthew, who is also called Father La Boisson, is an old sergeant major who has come back to his native land. He combines in admirable proportions, making a perfect whole, the humbug of the old soldier and the sly roguery of the Norman. On his return to Normandy, thanks to influence and incredible cleverness, he was made doorkeeper of a votive chapel, a chapel dedicated to the Virgin and frequented chiefly by young women who have gone astray. He composed and had painted a special prayer to his good Virgin. This prayer is a masterpiece of unintentional irony, of Norman wit, in which jest is blended with fear of the saint and with the superstitious fear of the secret influence of something. He has not much faith in his protectress, but he believes in her a little through prudence, and he is considerate of her through policy. This is how the wonderful prayer begins. Our good Madame Virgin Mary, natural protectress of girl mothers in this land and all over the world, protect your servant who erred in a moment of forgetfulness. It ends thus. Do not forget me, especially when you are with your holy spouse, and intercede with God the Father that he may grant me a good husband like your own. This prayer, which was suppressed by the clergy of the district, is sold by him privately, and is said to be very efficacious for those who recite it with unction. In fact, he talks of the good version as the valet de chambre of a redoubted prince might talk of his master, who confided in him all his little private secrets. He knows a number of amusing anecdotes at his expense, which he tells confidentially among friends as they sit over their glasses. But you will see for yourself. As the fees coming from the Virgin did not appear sufficient to him, he added to the main figure a little business in saints. He has them all, or nearly all. There was not room enough in the chapel, so he stored them in the woodshed and brings them forth as the faithful ask for them. He carved these little wooden statues himself, they are comical in the extreme, and painted them all bright green one year when they were painting his house. You know that saints cure diseases, but each saint has his specialty, and you must not confound them or make any blunders. They are as jealous of each other as mountebanks. In order that they may make no mistake, the old women come and consult Matthew. For diseases of the ear, which saint is the best? Why, Saint Ozime is good, and Saint Pamphilius is not bad. But that is not all. As Matthew has some time to spare, he drinks, but he drinks like a professional, with conviction, and so much so that he is intoxicated regularly every evening. He is drunk, but he is aware of it. He is so well aware of it that he notices each day his exact degree of intoxication. That is his chief occupation, the chapel is a secondary matter. And he has invented, listen and catch on, he has invented the saulometre. There is no such instrument, but Matthew's observations are as precise as those of a mathematician, you may hear him repeating incessantly, Since Monday I have had more than forty-five, or else I was between fifty-two and fifty-eight, or else I had at least sixty-six to seventy, or Hello, cheat, I thought I was in the fifties, and here I find I had had seventy-five. He never makes a mistake. He declares that he never reached his limit, but as he acknowledges that his observations cease to be exact when he is past ninety, one cannot depend absolutely on the truth of that statement. When Matthew acknowledges that he had passed ninety, you may rest assured that he is blind drunk. On these occasions, his wife, Melie, another marvel, flies into a fury. She waits for him at the door of the house, and as he enters, she roars at him. So there you are, slut, hog, giggling sot. Then Matthew, who is not laughing any longer, plants himself opposite her and says in a severe tone, Be still, Melie, this is no time to talk. Wait till tomorrow. If she keeps shouting at him, he goes up to her and says in a shaky voice, Don't bawl any more. I've had about ninety. I'm not counting any more. Look out, I'm going to hit you. Then Melee beats a retreat. If, on the following day, she reverts to the subject, he laughs in her face and says, Come, come, we have said enough. It is past. As long as I have not reached my limit, there is no harm done. 
but if I go past that, I will allow you to correct me, my word on it. We had reached the top of the hill. The road entered the delightful forest of Rumer. Autumn, marvelous autumn, blended its gold and purple with the remaining traces of verdure. We passed through Duclair. Then, instead of going on to Jumige, my friend turned to the left, and, taking a cross-cut, drove in among the trees. And presently, from the top of a high hill, we saw again the magnificent valley of the Seine and the winding river beneath us. At our right, a very small slate-covered building, with a bell tower as large as the sunshade, adjoined a pretty house with green Venetian blinds, and all covered with honeysuckles and roses. "'Here are some friends!' cried a big voice, and Matthew appeared on the threshold. He was a man about sixty, thin and with a goatee and a long white mustache. My friend shook him by the hand and introduced me, and Matthew took us into a clean kitchen, which also served as a dining room. He said, "'I have no elegant apartment, monsieur. I do not like to get too far away from the food.' The saucepans, you see, keep me company. Then, turning to my friend, Why did you come on Thursday? You know quite well that this is the day I consult my guardian saint. I cannot go out this afternoon. And running to the door, he uttered a terrific roar. Melly, Which must have startled the sailors in the ships along the stream in the valley below. Melly did not reply. Then Matthew winked his eye knowingly. She is not pleased with me, you see, because yesterday I was in the nineties. My friend began to laugh. In the nineties, Matthew, how did you manage it? I will tell you, said Matthew. Last year I found only twenty rassiers, an old dry measure, of apricots. There are no more, but those are the only things to make cider of. So I made some, and yesterday I tapped the barrel. Talk of nectar. That was nectar. You shall tell me what you think of it. Polite was here, and we sat down and drank a glass and another without being satisfied. One could go on drinking it until tomorrow. And at last, with glass after glass, I felt a chill at my stomach. I said to Polite, Supposing we drink a glass of cognac to warm ourselves? He agreed. But this cognac, it sets you on fire, so that we had to go back to the cider. But by going from chills to heat and heat to chills, I saw that I was in the nineties. Polite was not far from his limit. The door opened and Melee appeared. At once, before bidding us good day, she cried, Great hog, you have both of you reached your limit. Don't say that, Milly, don't say that, said Matthew, getting angry. I have never reached my limit. They gave us a delicious luncheon outside beneath two lime trees, beside the little chapel and overlooking the vast landscape, and Matthew told us, with a mixture of humor and unexpected credulity, incredible stories and miracles. We had drunk a good deal of delicious cider, sparkling and sweet, fresh and intoxicating, which he preferred to all other drinks, and were smoking our pipes astride our chairs when two women appeared. They were old, dried up and bent. After greeting us, they asked for Saint Blanc. Matthew winked at us as he replied, I will get him for you. And he disappeared in his woodshed. He remained there fully five minutes. Then he came back with an expression of consternation. He raised his hands. I don't know where he is. I cannot find him. I am quite sure that I had him. Then, making a speaking trumpet of his hands, he roared once more. Melly? What's the matter? replied his wife from the end of the garden. Where's Saint Blanc? I cannot find him in the woodshed. Then Melly explained it this way. Was not that the one you took last week to stop up a hole in the rabbit hutch? Matthew gave a start. By thunder, that may be. Then turning to the women, he said, follow me. They followed him. We did the same, almost choking with suppressed laughter. Saint Blanc was indeed stuck into the earth like an ordinary stake, covered with mud and dirt, and forming a corner for the rabbit hutch. As soon as they perceived him, the two women fell on their knees, crossed themselves, and began to murmur in Ormus. But Matthew darted toward them. Wait, he said, you are in the mud. I will get you a bundle of straw. He went to fetch the straw and made him a preview. Then, looking at his muddy saint, and doubtless afraid of bringing discredit on his business, he added, I will clean him off a little for you. He took a pail of water and a brush, and began to scrub the wooden image vigorously, while the two old women kept praying. When he had finished, he said, Now he is all right and he took us back to the house to drink another glass. As he was carrying the glass to his lips, he stopped and said in a rather confused manner, All the same, when I put Saint Blanc out with the rabbits, I thought he would not make any more money. For two years, no one had asked for him. But the saints, you see, they are never out of date. End of section 142. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 143 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 143. The Umbrella. 
Madame Aurea was a very economical woman. She knew the value of a centime and possessed a whole storehouse of strict principles with regard to the multiplication of money, so that her cook found the greatest difficulty in making what her servants call their market penny, and her husband was hardly allowed any pocket money at all. They were, however, very comfortably off and had no children, but it really pained Madame Aurea to see any money spent. It was like tearing at her heart strings when she had to take any of those nice crown pieces out of her pocket, and whenever she had to spend anything, no matter how necessary it might be, she slept badly the next night. Aurea was continually saying to his wife, "'You really might be more liberal, as we have no children and never spend our income.' "'You don't know what may happen,' she used to reply. "'It is better to have too much than too little.' She was a little woman of about forty, very active, rather hasty, wrinkled, very neat and tidy, and with a very short temper. Her husband frequently complained of all the privations she made him endure. Some of them were particularly painful to him, as they touched his vanity. He was one of the head clerks in the war office, and only stayed there in obedience to his wife's wish, to increase their income which they did not nearly spend. For two years he had always come to the office with the same old patched umbrella, to the great amusement of his fellow clerks. At last he got tired of their jokes and insisted upon his wife buying him a new one. She bought one for eight francs and a half, one of those cheap articles which large houses sell as an advertisement. When the men in the office saw the article, which was being sold in Paris by the thousand, they began their jokes again, and Aurea had a dreadful time of it. They even made a song about it, which he heard from morning till night all over the immense building. Aurea was very angry, and preemptorily told his wife to get him a new one, a good silk one for twenty francs, and to bring him the bill, so that he might see it was all right. She bought him one for eighteen francs, and said, getting red with anger as she gave it to her husband, "'This will last you for five years at least.' Aurea felt quite triumphant, and received a small ovation at the office with his new acquisition. When he went home in the evening, his wife said to him, looking at the umbrella uneasily, "'You should not leave it fastened up with the elastic. It will very likely cut the silk. You must take care of it, for I shall not buy you a new one in a hurry.' She took it, unfastened it, and remained dumbfounded with astonishment and rage. In the middle of the silk there was a hole as big as a six-penny piece. It had been made with the end of a cigar. "'What is that?' she screamed. Her husband replied quietly, without looking at it. "'What is it? What do you mean?' She was choking with rage and could hardly get out a word. "'You! You have burned your umbrella! Why, you must be mad! Do you wish to ruin us outright?' He turned round and felt that he was growing pale. "'What are you talking about?' "'I say you have burned your umbrella. Just look here.' And rushing at him, as if she were going to beat him, she violently thrust the little circular burned hole under his nose. He was so utterly struck dumb at the sight of it that he could only stammer out, "'What? What is it? How should I know? I I've done nothing. I will swear. I don't know what is the matter with the umbrella.' "'You have been playing tricks with it at the office. You have been playing the fool and opening it to show it off,' she screamed." I only opened it once to let them see what a nice one it was. That is all, I swear. But she shook with rage and got up one of those conjugal scenes which make a peaceable man dread the domestic hearth more than a battlefield where bullets are raining. She mended it with a piece of silk cut out of the old umbrella, which was of a different color, and the next day Aurea went off very humbly with the mended article in his hand. He put it into a cupboard and thought no more of it than of some unpleasant recollection. But he had scarcely got home that evening when his wife took the umbrella from him, opened it, and nearly had a fit when she saw what had befallen it, for the disaster was irreparable. It was covered with small holes, which evidently proceeded from burns, just as if someone had emptied the ashes from a light pipe onto it. It was done for utterly, irreparably. She looked at it without a word, in too great a passion to be able to say anything. He also, when he saw the damage, remained almost dumbfounded, in a state of frightened consternation. They looked at each other, then he looked at the floor, and the next moment she threw the useless article at his head, screaming out in transport of the most violent rage, for she had recovered her voice by that time. Oh, you brute, you brute, you did it on purpose, but I will pay you out for it. You shall not have another. And then the scene began again, and after the storm had raged for an hour, he was at last able to explain himself. He declared that he could not understand it at all, and that it could only proceed from malice or from vengeance. A ring at the bell saved him. It was a friend whom they were expecting to dinner. Madame Aurea submitted the case to him, as for buying a new umbrella, that was out of the question. Her husband should not have another. The friend very sensibly said that in case his clothes would be spoiled, they were certainly worth more than the umbrella. But the little woman, who was still in a rage, replied, Well then, when it rains he may have the kitchen umbrella, for I shall not give him a new silk one. Aurea utterly rebelled at such an idea. 
All right, he said, then I shall resign my post. I am not going to the office with the kitchen umbrella. The friend interposed. Have this one recovered. It will not cost much. But Madame Aurea, being in the temper that she was, said, It will cost at least eight francs to recover it. Eight and eighteen are twenty-six. Just fancy, twenty-six francs for an umbrella. It is utter madness. The friend, who was only a poor man of the middle classes, had an inspiration. Make your fire assurance pay for it. The companies pay for all articles that are burned as long as the damage has been done in your own house. On hearing this advice, the little woman calmed down immediately, and then, after a moment's reflection, she said to her husband, "'Tomorrow, before going to your office, you will go to the Maternal Assurance Company, show them the state your umbrella is in, and make them pay for the damage.' Monsieur Aurea fairly jumped, he was so startled at the proposal. "'I would not do it for my life. It is eighteen francs lost, that is all. It will not ruin us.' The next morning he took a walking stick when he went out, and luckily it was a fine day." Left at home alone, Madame Aurea could not get over the loss of her eighteen francs by any means. She had put the umbrella on the dining-room table, and she looked at it without being able to come to any determination. Every moment she thought of the assurance company, but she did not dare to encounter the quizzical looks of the gentleman who might receive her, for she was very timid before people, and blushed at a mere nothing, and was embarrassed when she had to speak to strangers. But the regret at the loss of the eighteen francs pained her as if she had been wounded. She tried not to think of it any more, and yet every moment the recollection of the loss struck her painfully. What was she to do, however? Time went on and she could not decide, but suddenly, like all cowards, on making a resolve, she became determined. I will go and we will see what happened. But first of all, she was obliged to prepare the umbrella so that the disaster might be complete, and the reason of it quite evident. She took a match from the mantelpiece, and between the ribs she burned a hole as big as the palm of her hand. Then she delicately rolled it up, fastened it with the elastic band, put on her bonnet and shawl, and went quickly toward the Rue du Rivoli, where the assurance office was. But the nearer she got, the slower she walked. What was she going to say, and what reply would she get? She looked at the numbers of the houses. There were still twenty-eight. That was all right, so she had time to consider, and she walked slower and slower. Suddenly she saw a door on which was a large brass plate with La Maternelle Fire Assurance Office engraved on it. Already! She waited a moment, for she felt nervous and almost ashamed. Then she walked past, came back walked past, and came back again. At last she said to herself, I must go in, however, so I may as well do it sooner as later. She could not help noticing, however, how her heart beat as she entered. She went into an enormous room with grated doors all around it, and above them little openings at which a man's head appeared, and as a gentleman carrying a number of papers passed her, she stopped him and said timidly, I beg your pardon, monsieur, but can you tell me where I must apply for payment for anything that has been accidentally burned? He replied in a sonorous voice, the first door on the left, that is the apartment you want. This frightened her still more, and she felt inclined to run away, to put in no claim, to sacrifice her eighteen francs, but the idea of that sum revived her courage, and she went upstairs, out of breath, stopping at almost every other step. She knocked at the door which she saw on the first landing, and a clear voice said, in answer, Come in. She obeyed mechanically, and found herself in a large room where three solemn gentlemen, all with the decoration in their buttonholes, were standing talking. One of them asked her, what do you want, madame? She could hardly get out her words, but stammered, I have come, I have come on account of an accident, something, he very politely pointed out a seat to her. If you will kindly sit down, I will attend to you in a moment. And, returning to the other two, he went on with the conversation. The company, gentlemen, does not consider that it is under any obligation to you for more than four hundred thousand francs, and we can pay no attention to your claim to the further sum of a hundred thousand, which you wish to make us pay, Besides that, the surveyor's valuation— One of the others interrupted him. That is quite enough, monsieur. The law courts will but decide between us, and we have nothing further to do than to take our leave. And they went out after mutual ceremonious bows. Oh, if she could only have gone away with them, how gladly she would have done it. She would have run away and given up everything. But it was too late, for the gentleman came back and said, bowing, What can I do for you, madame? She could scarcely speak, but at last she managed to say, I have come— for this. The manager looked at the object which she held out to him in mute astonishment. With trembling fingers she tried to undo the elastic, and succeeding, after several attempts, she hastily opened the damaged remains of the umbrellas. It looks to me to be in a very bad state of health, he said compassionately. It cost me twenty francs, she said with some hesitation. He seemed astonished. Really? As much as that? Yes, it was a capital article, and I wanted you to see the condition it is in. 
Yes, yes, I see you very well, but I really do not understand what it can have to do with me. She began to feel uncomfortable. Perhaps this company did not pay for such small articles, and she said, But it is burned. He could not deny it. I see that very well, he replied. She remained open-mouthed, not knowing what to say next. Then, suddenly recollecting that she had left out the main thing, she said hastily, I am Madame Aurea, we are assured in La Maternelle, and I have come to claim the value of this damage. I only want you to have it recovered, she added quickly, fearing a positive refusal. The manager was rather embarrassed and said, But really, Madame, we do not sell umbrellas, we cannot undertake such kinds of repairs. The little woman felt her courage reviving. She was not going to give up without a struggle. She was not even afraid any more, and said, I only want you to pay me the cost of repairing it. I can quite well get it done myself. The gentleman seemed rather confused. Really, madame, it is such a very small matter. We are never asked to give compensation for such trivial losses. You must allow that we cannot make good pocket handkerchiefs, gloves, broom slippers, all the small articles which are every day exposed to the chances of being burned. She got red in the face and felt inclined to fly into a rage. But, monsieur, last December one of our chimneys caught fire and caused at least five hundred francs damage. Monsieur Aurea made no claim on the company, and so it is only just that it should pay for my umbrella now. The manager, suspecting that she was telling a lie, said with a smile on his face, You must acknowledge, madame, that it is very surprising that Monsieur Aurea should have asked no compensation for damages amounting to five hundred francs, and should now claim five or six francs for mending an umbrella. She was not the least put out, and replied, I beg your pardon, monsieur, the five hundred francs affected Monsieur Aurea's pocket, whereas the damage, amounting to eighteen francs, concerns Madame Aurea's pocket only, which is a totally different matter. As he saw that he had no chance of getting rid of her, and that he would only be wasting his time, he said resignedly, Will you kindly tell me how the damage was done? She felt that she had won the victory, and said, This is how it happened, monsieur. In our hall there is a bronze stick and umbrella stand, and the other day when I came in I put my umbrella into it. I must tell you that just above there is a shelf for the candlesticks and matches. I put out my hand, took two or three matches, and struck one, but it missed fire, so I struck another, which ignited but went out immediately, and a third did the same. The manager interrupted her to make a joke. I suppose they were government matches, then. She did not understand him, and went on. Very likely. At any rate, the fourth caught fire, I lit my candle, and went into the room to go to bed, but in a quarter of an hour I fancied that I smelt something burning, and I have always been terribly afraid of fire. If ever we have an accident, it will not be my fault, I assure you. I am terribly nervous since our chimney was on fire, as I told you, so I got up and hunted about everywhere, sniffing like a dog after game, and at last I noticed that my umbrella was burning. Most likely a match had fallen between the folds and burned it. You can see how it has damaged it. The manager had taken his cue and asked her, "'What do you estimate the damage at?' She did not know what to say, as she was not certain what value to put on it, but at last she replied, "'Perhaps you had better get it done yourself. I will leave it to you.' He, however, naturally refused. "'No, madame, I cannot do that. Tell me the amount of your claim, that is all I want to know.' "'Well, I think that—' "'Look here, monsieur, I do not want to make any money out of you, so I will tell you what we will do.' I will take my umbrella to the maker, who will recover it in good, durable silk, and I will bring the bill to you. Will that suit you, monsieur? Perfectly, madame. We will settle it so. Here is a note for the cashier, who will repay you whatever it costs you. He gave madame Aurea a slip of paper, who took it, got up and went out, thanking him, for she was in a hurry to escape lest he should change his mind. She went briskly through the streets, looking out for a really good umbrella maker, and when she found the shop which appeared to be a first-class one, she went in and said, confidently, I want this umbrella recovered in silk, good silk. Use the very best and strongest you have. I don't mind what it costs. End of section 143. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 144 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 144. Belhomme's Beast. The coach for half was ready to leave Creek Toad, and all the passengers were waiting for their names to be called out in the courtyard of the commercial hotel kept by Monsieur Malandang, Jr. It was a yellow wagon mounted on wheels which had once been yellow, but were now almost gray through the accumulation of mud. The front wheels were very small, the back ones high and fragile, 
carried the body of the vehicle, which was swollen like the belly of an animal. Three white horses, with enormous heads and great round knees, were the first things one noticed. They were harnessed ready to draw this coach, which had something of the appearance of a monster in its massive structure. The horses seemed already asleep in front of the strange vehicle. The driver, Césaire Horleville, a little man with a big paunch, supple nevertheless, through his constant habit of climbing over the wheels to the top of the wagon, his face all aglow from exposure to the brisk air of the plains, to rain and storms, and also from the use of brandy, his eyes twitching from the effect of constant contact with wind and hail, appeared in the doorway of the hotel, wiping his mouth on the back of his hand. Large round baskets full of frightened poultry were standing in front of the peasant women. Césaire Horleville took them one after the other and packed them on top of his coach. Then, more gently, he loaded on those containing eggs. Finally, he tossed up from below several little bags of grain, small packages wrapped in handkerchiefs, pieces of cloth or paper. Then he opened the back door, and drawing a list from his pocket, he called, Monsieur le curé de Gorgeville? The priest advanced. He was a large, powerful, robust man with a red face and a genial expression. He hitched up his cassock to lift his foot, just as the women held up their skirts, and climbed into the coach. The schoolmaster of Rolbeau's le Grenet. The man hastened forward, tall, timid, wearing a long frock coat which fell to his knees, and he in turn disappeared through the open door. Maitre Poiré, two seats? Poiré approached, a tall, round-shouldered man, bent by the plow, emaciated through abstinence, bony, with the skin dried by a sparing use of water. His wife followed him, small and thin, like a tired animal, carrying a large green umbrella in her hands. Maître Rebeau, two seats. Rebeau hesitated, being of an undecided nature. He asked, You mean me? The driver was going to answer with a jest when Rabeau dived headfirst toward the door, pushed forward by a vigorous shove from his wife, a tall, square woman with a large, round stomach like a barrel, and hands as large as hams. Rabeau slipped into the wagon like a rat entering a hole. Maître Carnivaux? A large peasant, heavier than an ox, made the springs bend, and was in turn engulfed in the interior of the yellow chest. Maître Bellon? Bellam, tall and thin, came forward, his neck bent, his head hanging, a handkerchief held to his ear as if he were suffering from a terrible toothache. All these people wore the blue blouse over quaint and antique coats of a black or greenish cloth, Sunday clothes which they would only uncover in the streets of Havre. Their heads were covered by silk caps as high as towers, the emblem of supreme elegance in the small villages of Normandy. Césaire Horlevia closed the door, climbed on his box, and snapped the whip. The three horses awoke, and, tossing their heads, shook their bells. The driver, then yelling, get up, as loud as he could, whipped up his horses. They shook themselves, and, with an effort, started off at a slow, halting gait, and behind them came the coach, rattling its shaky windows and iron springs, making a terrible clatter of hardware and glass, while the passengers were tossed hither and thither like so many rubber balls. At first, all kept silent out of respect for the priest, that they might not shock him. Being of a loquacious and genial disposition, he started the conversation. Well, Maître Caniveau, he said, how are you getting along? The enormous farmer, who, on account of his size, girth, and stomach, felt a bond of sympathy for the representative of the church, answered with a smile, "'Pretty well, Monsieur le Curé, pretty well. And how are you?' "'Oh, I'm always well and healthy.' "'And you, Maître Poiré?' asked the abbé. "'Oh, well, I'd be all right, only the coals as ain't a-goin' to save much this year, and times are so hard that they are the only things worthwhile raisin.' "'Well, what can you expect? Times are hard.' "'Hub, I should say they were hard.' sounded the rather virile voice of Rabot's big consort. As she was from a neighboring village, the priest only knew her by name. "'Is that you, Blondel?' he said. "'Yes, I'm the one that married Rabot. Rabot, slender, timid, and self-satisfied, bowed smilingly, bending his head forward as though to say, "'Yes, I'm the Rabot whom Blondel married.' Suddenly, Maitre Bellam, still holding his handkerchief to his ear, began groaning in a pitiful fashion. He was going, "'Oh!' and stamping his foot in order to show his terrible suffering. "'You must have an awful toothache,' said the priest. The peasant stopped moaning for a minute and answered, "'No, Monsieur le Curé, it is not the teeth. It's my ear, away down at the bottom of my ear.' "'Well, what have you got in your ear? A lump of wax?' "'I don't know whether it's wax, but I know that it is a bug, a big bug, that crawled in while I was asleep in the haystack.' "'A bug? Are you sure?' "'Am I sure? As sure as I am of heaven, Monsieur le Curé.' I can feel it gnawing at the bottom of my ear. It's eating my head for sure. It's eating my head. Oh, and he began to stamp his foot again. Great interest had been aroused among the spectators. Each one gave his bit of advice. Poiret claimed that it was a spider. The teacher thought it might be a caterpillar. 
He had already seen such a thing once at Camp Murray in Orne, where he had been for six years. In his case, the caterpillar had gone through the head and out of the nose, but the man remained deaf in that ear ever after, the drum having been pierced. It's more likely to be a worm, said the priest. Maitre Bellam, his head resting against the door, for he had been the last one to enter, was still moaning. Oh, oh, oh I think it must be an ant, a big ant. There it is biting again. Oh, Monsieur le Curé, how it hurts, how it hurts. Have you seen the doctor? asked Caniveau. I should say not. Why? The fear of the doctor seemed to cure Bellam. He straightened up without, however, dropping his handkerchief. What? You have money for them, for these loafers? He would have come once, twice, three times, four times, five times. That means two five-franc pieces. Two five-franc pieces for sure. And what would he have done, the loafer? Tell me, what would he have done? Can you tell me? Caniveau was laughing. No, uh, I don't know. Where are you going? I'm going to have to see Chambrelan. Who is Chambrelan? The healer, of course. What healer? The healer who cured my father. Your father? Yes, the healer who cured my father years ago. What was the matter with your father? A draught caught him in the back so that he couldn't move hand or foot. Well, what did your friend Chamberlain do to him? He kneaded his back with both hands as though he were making bread, and he was all right in a couple of hours. Alam thought that Chamberlain must have also used some charm, but he did not dare say so before the priest. Caniveau replied, laughing, Are you sure it isn't a rabbit that you have in your ear? He might have taken that hole for his home. Wait, I'll make him run away. Whereupon Caniveau, making a megaphone of his hands, began to mimic the barking of hounds. He snapped, howled, growled, barked, and everybody in the carriage began to roar, even the schoolmaster, who, as a rule, never ever smiled. However, as Bellam seemed angry at their making fun of him, the priest changed the conversation, and turning to Rabot's big wife, said, You have a large family, haven't you? Oh yes, monsieur le curé, and it's a pretty hard matter to bring them up. Rabot agreed, nodding his head as though to say, Oh yes, it's a hard thing to bring up. How many children? She replied authoritatively in a strong voice. Sixteen children, Monsieur le Curé, fifteen of them by my husband. And Rabot smiled broadly, nodding his head. He was responsible for fifteen, he alone. Rabot, his wife said so. Therefore there could be no doubt about it, and he was proud. And whose was the sixteenth? She didn't tell. It was doubtless the first. Perhaps everybody knew, for no one was surprised. Even Caniveau kept mum. But Bellam began to moan again. Oh, it's scratching about the bottom of my ear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. The coach just then stopped at the Café Polito. The priest said, If someone were to pour a little water into your ear, perhaps it might drive it out. Do you want to try? Sure, I am willing. And everybody got out in order to witness the operation. The priest asked for a bowl, a napkin, and a glass of water. Then he told the teacher to hold the patient's head over on one side, and, as soon as the liquid should have entered the ear, to turn his head suddenly to the other side. But Caniveau, who was already peering into Bellam's ear to see if he couldn't discover the beast, shouted, "'Gosh, what a mess! You'll have to clear that out, old man. Your rabbit could never get through that. His feet would stick.' The priest, in turn, examined the passage and saw that it was too narrow and too congested for him to attempt to expel the animal. It was the teacher who cleared out this passage by means of a match and a bit of cloth. Then, in the midst of the general excitement, the priest poured into the passage half a glass of water, which trickled over the face, through the hair, and down the neck of the patient. Then the schoolmaster quickly twisted the head round over the bowl, as though he were trying to unscrew it. A couple of drops dripped into the white bowl. All the passengers roughed it forward. No insect had come out. However, Bellam exclaimed, I don't feel anything any more. The priest triumphantly exclaimed, Certainly it has been drowned. Everybody was happy and got back into the coach. But hardly had they started when Bellam began to cry out again. The bug had aroused itself and become furious. He even declared that it had now entered his head and was eating his brain. He was howling with such contortions that Poiret's wife, thinking him possessed by the devil, began to cry and cross herself. Then, the pain abating a little, the sick man began to tell how it was running round in his ear. With his finger, he imitated the movements of the body, seeming to see it, to follow it with his eyes. There it goes up again. Oh, what torture! Caniveau was getting impatient. It's the water that is making the bug angry. It's probably more accustomed to wine. Everybody laughed, and he continued. When we get to the Café Bourbleu, give it some brandy and it won't bother you any more, I wager. But Bellam could contain himself no longer. He began howling as though his soul were being torn from his body. The priest was obliged to hold his head for him. They asked Césaire Horlevia to stop at the nearest house. 
It was a farmhouse at the side of the road. Bellon was carried into it and laid on the kitchen table in order to repeat the operation. Kennevo advised mixing brandy and water in order to benumb and perhaps kill the insect, but the priest preferred vinegar. They poured the liquid in drop by drop this time that it might penetrate down to the bottom, and they left it several minutes in the organ that the beast had chosen for its home. A bull had once more been brought, Bellon was turned over bodily by the priest and Kennevo, while the schoolmaster was tapping on the healthy ear in order to empty the other. Cesare Horlevia himself, whip in hand, had come to observe the proceedings. Suddenly, at the bottom of the bowl appeared a little brown spot, no bigger than a tiny seed. However, it was moving. It was a flea. First there were cries of astonishment, and then shouts of laughter. A flea! Well, that was a good joke, a mighty good one. Kennevo was slapping his thigh, Cesare Horlevia snapped his whip, and the priest laughed like a braying donkey. The teacher cackled as though he were sneezing, and the two women were giving little screams of joy like the clucking of hens. Bellam had seated himself on the table and had taken the bowl between his knees. He was observing with serious attention and eventual anger in his eye the conquered insect which was twisting round in the water. He grunted, You rotten little beast, and he spat on it. The driver, wild with joy, kept repeating, A flea! A flea! Ah, there you are! A damned little flea! Damned little flea! Damned little flea! Then having calmed down a little, he cried, Well, back to the coach. We've lost enough time. End of section 144 Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 145 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 145. Discovery. The steamer was crowded with people, and the crossing promised to be good. I was going from half to Trouville. The ropes were thrown off, the whistle blew for the last time, and the whole boat started to tremble, and the great wheels began to revolve, slowly at first, and then with ever-increasing rapidity. We were gliding along the pier, black with people. Those on board were waving their handkerchiefs as though they were leaving for America, and their friends on shore were answering in the same manner. The big July sun was shining down on the red parasols, the light dresses, the joyous faces, and on the ocean, barely stirred by a ripple. When we were out of the harbor, the little vessel swung round the big curve and pointed her nose toward the distant shore, which was barely visible through the early morning mist. On our left was the broad estuary of the Seine, her muddy water, which never mingles with that of the ocean, making large yellow streaks clearly outlined against the immense sheet of the pure green sea. As soon as I am on a boat, I feel the need of walking to and fro, like a sailor on watch. Why? I do not know. Therefore I began to thread my way along the deck through the crowd of travelers, Suddenly I heard my name called. I turned around. I beheld one of my old friends, Henri Sidouane, whom I had not seen for ten years. We shook hands and continued our walk together, talking of one thing or another. Suddenly Sidouane, who had been observing the crowd of passengers, cried out angrily, It's disgusting. The boat is full of English people. It was indeed full of them. The men were standing about, looking over the ocean with an all-important air, as though to say, We are the English, the lords of the sea. Here we are. The young girls, formless, with shoes which reminded one of the naval constructions of their fatherland, wrapped in multicolored shawls, were smiling vacantly at the magnificent scenery. Their small heads, planted at the top of their long bodies, wore English hats of the strangest build. And the old maids, thinner yet, opening their characteristic jaws to the wind, seemed to threaten one with their long, yellow teeth. On passing them, one could notice the smell of rubber and tooth wash. Sidwan repeated, with growing anger, "'Disgusting!' Can we never stop their coming to France? I asked, smiling. What have you got against them? As far as I'm concerned, they don't worry me. He snapped out. Of course they don't worry you, but I married one of them. I stopped and laughed at him. Go ahead and tell me about it. Does she make you very unhappy? He shrugged his shoulders. No, not exactly. Then she is not true to you? Unfortunately, she is. That would be a cause for divorce and I could get rid of her. Then I'm afraid I don't understand. You don't understand? I'm not surprised. Well, she simply learned how to speak French, that's all. Listen, I didn't have the least desire of getting married when I went to spend the summer at Tretat two years ago. There's nothing more dangerous than watering places. You have no idea how it suits young girls. Paris is the place for women and the country for young girls. Donkey rides, surf bathing, breakfast on the grass, all these things are traps set for the marriageable man. And really, there is nothing prettier than a child about 18 running through a field or picking flowers along the road. I made the acquaintance of an English family who were stopping at the same hotel where I was. 
The father looked like those men you see over there, and the mother was like all other English women. They had two sons, the kind of boys who play rough games with balls, bats, or rackets from morning till night. Then came two daughters, the elder a dry, shriveled-up Englishwoman, the younger a dream of beauty, a heavenly blonde. When those chits make up their minds to be pretty, they are divine. This one had blue eyes, the kind of blue which seems to contain all the poetry, all the dreams, all the hopes and happiness of the world. What an infinity of dreams is caused by two such eyes. How well they answer the dim, eternal question of our heart. It must not be forgotten either that we Frenchmen adore foreign women. As soon as we meet a Russian, an Italian, a Swede, a Spaniard, or an Englishwoman with a pretty face, we immediately fall in love with her. We enthuse over everything which comes from outside. Clothes, hats, gloves, guns, and women. But what a blunder. I believe that that which pleases us in foreign women is their accent. As soon as a woman speaks our language badly, we think she is charming. If she uses the wrong word, she is exquisite. And if she jabbers in an entirely unintelligible jargon, she becomes irresistible. My little English girl, Kate, spoke a language to be marveled at. At the beginning, I could understand nothing. She invented so many new words. Then I felt absolutely in love with this queer, amusing dialect. All maimed, strange, ridiculous terms became delightful in her mouth. Every evening, on the terrace of the casino, we had long conversations which resembled spoken enigmas. I married her. I loved her wildly, as one can only love in a dream. For true lovers only love a dream which has taken the form of a woman. Well, my dear fellow, the most foolish thing I ever did was to give my wife a French teacher. As long as she slaughtered the dictionary and tortured the grammar, I adored her. Our conversations were simple. They revealed to me her surprising gracefulness and matchless elegance. They showed her to me as a wonderful speaking jewel, a living doll made to be kissed, knowing after a fashion how to express what she loved. She reminded me of the pretty little toys which say Papa and Mama when you pull a string. Now she talks badly, very badly. She makes as many mistakes as ever, but I can understand her. I have opened my doll to look inside, and I have seen. And now I have to talk to her. Oh, you don't know as I do. The opinions, the ideas, the theories of a well-educated young English girl, whom I can blame in nothing, and who repeats to me from morning till night sentences from a French reader prepared in England for the use of young ladies' schools. You have seen those cotillon favors, those pretty gilt papers which enclose candies with an abominable taste. I have one of them. I tore it open. I wished to eat what was inside, and it disgusted me so that I feel nauseated at seeing her compatriots. I have married a parrot to whom some old English governess might have taught French. Do you understand? The harbor of Trouville was now showing its wooden piers covered with people. I said, Where is your wife? He answered, I took her back to Etretat. And you, where are you going? I? Oh, I'm going to rest up here at Trouville. Then after a pause, he added, you have no idea what a fool a woman can be at times. End of section 145. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 146 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 146. The Accursed Bread. Daddy Taya had three daughters, Anna, the eldest, who is scarcely ever mentioned in the family, Rose, the second girl, who was eighteen, and Clara, the youngest, who was a girl of fifteen. Old Taya was a widower and a foreman in Monsieur Le Brumont's button manufactory, and a very upright man, well thought of, abstemious, in fact, a sort of model workman. He lived at Half in the Rue d'Angouem. When Anna ran away from home, the old man flew into a fearful rage. He threatened to kill the head clerk in a large draper's establishment in that town, whom he suspected. After a time, when he was told by various people that she was very steady in investing money in government securities, that she was no gad about, but was a great friend of Monsieur Dubois, who was a judge of the Tribunal of Commerce, the father was appeased. He even showed some anxiety as to how she was getting on, and asked some of her old friends who had been to see her, and when told that she had her own furniture, and that her mantelpiece was covered with vases and the walls with pictures, that there were clocks and carpets everywhere, he gave a broad, contented smile. He had been working for thirty years to get together a wretched five or six thousand francs. This girl was evidently no fool. One fine morning, the son of Touchard, the cooper, at the other end of the street, came and asked him for the hand of Rose, the second girl. The old man's heart began to beat, for the Touchards were rich and in good position. He was decidedly lucky with his girls. The marriage was agreed upon, and it was settled that it should be a grand affair, and the wedding dinner was to be held at Saint-Adresse, at Mother Jusse's restaurant. 
It would cost a lot, certainly, but never mind. It did not matter just for once in a way. But one morning, just as the old man was going home to luncheon with his two daughters, the door opened suddenly, and Anna appeared. She was well-dressed and looked undeniably pretty and nice. She threw her arms round her father's neck before he could say a word, then fell into her sister's arms with many tears, and then asked for a plate so that she might share the family soup. Taya was moved to tears in his turn and said several times, "'That is right, dear, that is right.' Then she told him about herself. She did not wish Rose's wedding to take place at Saint Adres, certainly not. It should take place at her house and would cost her father nothing. She had settled everything and arranged everything, so it was no good to say any more about it. There. Very well, my dear, very well, the old man said. We will leave it so. But then he felt some doubt. Would the two shards consent? But Rose, the bride of Lecht, was surprised and asked, Why should they object, I should like to know? Just leave that to me. I will talk to Philip about it. She mentioned it to her lover the very same day, and he declared it would suit him exactly. Father and mother Touchard were naturally delighted at the idea of a good dinner which would cost them nothing, and said, You may be quite sure that everything will be in first-rate style. They asked to be allowed to bring a friend, Madame Florence, the cook on the first floor, and Anna agreed to everything. The wedding was fixed for the last Tuesday of the month. After the civil formalities and the religious ceremony, the wedding party went to Anna's house. Among those whom the Tias had brought was a cousin of a certain age, a Monsieur Sauvatanin, a man given to philosophical reflections, serious and always very self-possessed, and Madame Lomondois, an old aunt. Monsieur Sautevanin had been told to give Anna his arm, and they were looked upon as the two most important persons in the company. As soon as they had arrived at the door of Anna's house, she let go her company's arm, and ran on ahead, saying, I will show you the way, and ran upstairs while the invited guests followed more slowly. And, when they got upstairs, she stood on one side to let them pass, and they rolled their eyes and turned their heads in all directions to admire this mysterious and luxurious dwelling. The table was laid in the drawing room, as the dining room had been thought too small. Extra knives, forks, and spoons had been hired from a neighboring restaurant, and decanters stood full of wine under the rays of the sun which shone in through the window. The ladies went into the bedroom to take off their shawls and bonnets, and Father Touchard, who was standing at the door, made funny and suggestive signs to the men, with many a wink and nod. Daddy Taya, who thought a great deal of himself, looked with fatherly pride at his child's well-furnished rooms, and went from one to the other, holding his hat in his hand, making a mental inventory of everything, and walking like a verger in a church. Anna went backward and forward, ran about giving orders, and hurrying on the wedding feast. Soon she appeared at the door of the dining room and cried, "'Come here, all of you, for a moment,' and as the twelve guests entered the room, they saw twelve glasses of Madeira on a small table." Rose and her husband had their arms round each other's waists and were kissing each other in every corner. Monsieur Sauvatanin never took his eyes off Anna. They sat down and the wedding breakfast began, the relations sitting at one end of the table and the young people at the other. Madame Touchard, the mother, presided on the right and the bride on the left. Anna looked after everybody, saw that the glasses were kept filled and the plates well supplied. The guests evidently felt a certain respectful embarrassment at the sight of all the sumptuousness of the rooms and at the lavish manner in which they were treated. They all ate heartily of the good things provided, but there were no jokes such as are prevalent at weddings of that sort. It was all too grand, and it made them feel uncomfortable. Old Madame Touchard, who was fond of a bit of fun, tried to enliven matters a little, and at the beginning of the dessert she exclaimed, "'I say, Philip, do sing us something.' The neighbors in their street considered that he had the finest voice in all of half. The bridegroom got up, smiled, and turning to his sister-in-law from politeness and gallantry, tried to think of something suitable for the occasion, something serious and correct, to harmonize with the seriousness of the repast. Anna had a satisfied look on her face and leaned back in her chair to listen, and all assumed looks of attention, though prepared to smile, should smiles be called for. The singer announced the accursed bread, and, extending his right arm, which made his coat ruck up into his neck, he began. It was decidedly long, three verses of eight lines each, with the last line and the last but one repeated twice. All went well for the first two verses, they were the usual commonplaces about bread gained by honest labor and by dishonesty. The aunt and the bride wept outright. The cook, who was present at the end of the first verse, looked at a roll which she held in her hand with streaming eyes as if it applied to her, while all applauded vigorously. At the end of the second verse, the two servants, who were standing with their backs to the wall, joined loudly in the chorus, and the aunt and the bride wept outright. Daddy Taya blew his nose with the noise of a trombone, an old Touchard brandished a whole loaf half over the table, and the cook shed silent tears on the crust which she was still holding. Amid the general emotion, Monsieur Sauvatanin said, This is the right sort of song, very different from the nasty, risky things one generally hears at weddings. 
Anna, who was visibly affected, kissed her hand to her sister and pointed to her husband with an affectionate nod, as if to congratulate her. Intoxicated by his success, the young man continued, and unfortunately the last verse contained words about the bread of dishonor gained by young girls who had been led astray. No one took up the refrain about this bread, supposed to be eaten with tears, except old Touchard and the two servants. Anna had grown deadly pale and cast down her eyes, while the bridegroom looked from one to the other, without understanding the reason for this sudden coldness, and the cook hastily dropped the crust as if it were poisoned. Monsieur Salvatenin said solemnly, in order to save the situation, that last couplet is not at all necessary, and Daddy Taya, who had got red up to his ears, looked around the table fiercely. Then Anna, her eyes swimming in tears, told the servants in, the faltering voice of a woman trying to stifle her sobs, to bring the champagne. All the guests were suddenly seized with exuberant joy, and all their faces became radiant again. And when old Touchard, who had seen, felt, and understood nothing of what was going on, and pointing to the guests so as to emphasize his words, sang the last words of the refrain, "'Children, I warn you all not to eat of that bread,' the whole company, when they saw the champagne bottles, with their necks covered with gold foil, appear, burst out singing as if electrified by the sight. "'Children, I warn you all not to eat of that bread.'" End of section 146. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 147 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 147. The Dowry. The marriage of Maître Simon Le Brumont with Mademoiselle Jeanne Cordier was a surprise to no one. Maître Le Brumont had brought out the practice of Maître Papillon. Naturally, he had to have money to pay for it, and Mademoiselle Jeanne Cordier had 300,000 francs clear in currency and in bonds payable to bearer. Maître Le Brumont was a handsome man. He was stylish, although in a provincial way, but nevertheless he was stylish, a rare thing at boutigny le Rubourg. Mademoiselle Cordier was graceful and fresh-looking, although a trifle awkward. Nevertheless, she was a handsome girl and one to be desired. The marriage ceremony turned all Boutigny topsy-turvy. Everyone admired the young couple, who quickly returned home to domestic felicity, having decided simply to take a short trip to Paris after a few days of retirement. This tête-à-tête -tête was delightful, Maître Le Brumont having shown just the proper amount of delicacy. He had taken as his motto, everything comes to him who waits. He knew how to be at the same time patient and energetic. His success was rapid and complete. After four days, Madame Le Brumont adored her husband. She could not get along without him. She would sit on his knees, and taking him by the ears, she would say, Open your mouth and shut your eyes. He would open his mouth wide and partly close his eyes, and he would try to nip her fingers as she slipped some dainty between his teeth. Then she would give him a kiss, sweet and long, which would make chills run up and down his spine. And then in his turn, he would not have enough caresses to please his wife from morning to night and from night to morning. When the first week was over, he said to his young companion, If you wish, we will leave for Paris next Tuesday. We will be like two lovers. We will go to the restaurants, the theaters, the concert halls, everywhere. Everywhere. She was ready to dance for joy. Oh, yes, yes, let us go as soon as possible. He continued. And then, as we must forget nothing, ask your father to have your dowry ready. I shall pay Maitre Papillon on this trip. She answered, All right, I will tell him tomorrow morning. And he took her in his arms once more to renew those sweet games of love which she had so enjoyed for the past week. The following Tuesday, father-in-law and mother-in-law went to the station with their daughter and their son-in-law, who were leaving for the capital. The father-in-law said, I tell you, it is very imprudent to carry so much money about in a pocketbook. And the young lawyer smiled. Don't worry, I am accustomed to such things. You understand that in my profession, I sometimes have as much as a million about me. In this manner, at least we avoid a great amount of red tape and delay. You needn't worry. The conductor was crying, All aboard for Paris! They scrambled into a car, where two old ladies were already seated. Le Brumont whispered into his wife's ear, "'What a bother! I won't be able to smoke!' She answered in a low voice, "'It annoys me too, but not on account of your cigar.' The whistle blew and the train started. The trip lasted about an hour, during which time they did not say very much to each other, as the two old ladies did not go to sleep. As soon as they were in front of the Saint-Lazare station, Maître Le Brumont said to his wife, "'Dearie, let us first go over to the boulevard and get something to eat.' Then we can quietly return and get our trunk and bring it to the hotel. She immediately assented. Oh, yes, let's eat at the restaurant. Is it far? He answered, yes, it's quite a distance, but we will take the omnibus. She was surprised. 
Why don't we take a cab? He began to scold her smilingly. Is that the way you save money? A cab for a five minutes ride at six cents a minute? You would deprive yourself of nothing. That's so, she said, a little embarrassed. A big omnibus was passing by, drawn by three big horses, which were trotting along. Le Brumont called out, Conductor! Conductor! The heavy carriage stopped, and the young lawyer, pushing his wife, said to her quickly, Go inside. I'm going up on top so that I may smoke at least one cigarette before lunch. She had no time to answer. The conductor, who had seized her by the arm to help her up the step, pushed her inside, and she fell into a seat, bewildered, looking through the back window at the feet of her husband as she climbed to the top of the vehicle. And she sat there motionless, between a fat man who smelled of cheap tobacco and an old woman who smelled of garlic. All the other passengers were lined up in silence. A grocer's boy, a young girl, a soldier, a gentleman with gold-rimmed spectacles and a big silk hat, two ladies with a self-satisfied and crab look, which seemed to say, We are riding in this thing, but we don't have to. Two sisters of charity and an undertaker. They looked like a collection of caricatures. The jolting of the wagon made them wag their heads, and the shaking of the wheels seemed to stupefy them. They all looked as though they were asleep. The young woman remained motionless. Why didn't he come inside with me? She was saying to herself. An unaccountable sadness seemed to be hanging over her. He really need not have acted so. The sisters motioned to the conductor to stop, and they got off one after the other, leaving in their wake the pungent smell of camphor. The bus started to up and soon stopped again. And in got a cook, red-faced and out of breath. She sat down and placed her basket of provisions on her knees. A strong odor of dishwater filled the vehicle. It's further than I imagined, thought she Anne. The undertaker went out and was replaced by a coachman who seemed to bring the atmosphere of the stable with him. The young girl had as a successor a messenger, the odor of whose feet showed that he was continually walking. The lawyer's wife began to feel ill at ease, nauseated, ready to cry without knowing why. Other persons left and others entered. The stage went on through interminable streets, stopping at stations and starting again. How far it is, thought Jeanne. I hope he hasn't gone to sleep. He's been so tired the past few days. Little by little, all the passengers left. She was left alone, all alone. The conductor cried, Vaugirard. Seeing that she did not move, he repeated, Vaugirard. She looked at him, understanding that he was speaking to her, as there was no one else there. For the third time, the man said, Vaugirard. Then she asked, Where are we? He answered gruffly, Were it Vaugirard, of course, I have been yelling it for the last half hour. Is it far from the boulevard? She said. Which boulevard? The boulevard des Italiens. We passed that a long time ago. Would you mind telling my husband? Your husband? Where is he? On the top of the bus. On the top? There hasn't been anyone there for a long time. She started, terrified. What? That's impossible. He got on with me. Look well. He must be there. The conductor was becoming uncivil. Come on, little one. You've talked enough. You can find ten men for every one that you lose. Now run along. You'll find another one somewhere. Tears were coming to her eyes. She insisted. But, monsieur, you are mistaken. I assure you that you must be mistaken. He had a big portfolio under his arm. The man began to laugh. A big portfolio? Oh, yes. He got off at the Madeleine. He got rid of you, all right. The stage had stopped. She got out, and, in spite of herself, she looked up instinctively at the roof of the bus. It was absolutely deserted. She began to cry without thinking that anybody was listening or watching her, and she said out loud, What is going to become of me? An inspector approached. What's the matter? The conductor answered in a bantering tone of voice. It's a lady who got left behind by her husband during the trip. The other continued. Oh, that's nothing. You go about your business. Then he turned on his heels and walked away. She began to walk straight ahead, too bewildered, too crazed to even understand what had happened to her. Where was she to go? What could she do? What could have happened to him? How could he have made such a mistake? How could he have been so forgetful? She had two francs in her pocket. To whom could she go? Suddenly, she remembered her cousin Baral, one of the assistants in the offices of the Ministry of the Navy. She had just enough to pay for a cab. She drove to his house. He met her just as she was leaving for his office. He was carrying a large portfolio under his arm, just like Le Brumont. She jumped out of the carriage. Henry, she cried. He stopped, astonished. Jeanne, here all alone? What are you doing? Where have you come from? Her eyes full of tears, she stammered. My husband just got lost. Lost? Where? On an omnibus. On an omnibus? Weeping, she told him her whole adventure. He listened, thought, and then asked, Was his mind clear this morning? Yes. Good. Did he have much money with him? 
Yes, he was carrying my dowry. Your dowry? The whole of it? The whole of it, in order to pay for the practice which he bought. Well, my dear cousin, by this time your husband must be well on his way to Belgium. She could not understand. She kept repeating. My husband? You say... I say that he has disappeared with your, your capital, that's all. She stood there, a prey to conflicting emotions, sobbing. Then he is... he is... he's a villain! And, faint from excitement, she leaned her head on her cousin's shoulder and wept. As people were stopping to look at them, he pushed her gently into the vestibule of his house, and, supporting her with his arm around her waist, he led her up the stairs, and as his astonished servant opened the door, he ordered, "'Sophie, run to the restaurant and get a luncheon for two. I am not going to the office today.'" End of section 147. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 148 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 148, The Diary of a Madman. He was dead, the head of a high tribunal, the upright magistrate whose irreproachable life was a proverb in all the courts of France. Advocates, young counselors, judges had greeted him at the sight of his large, thin, pale face lighted up by two sparkling, deep-set eyes, bowing low in token of respect. He had passed his life in pursuing crime and in protecting the weak. Swindlers and murderers had no more redoubtable enemy, for he seemed to read the most secret thoughts of their minds. He was dead now, at the age of 82, honored by the homage and followed by the regrets of a whole people. Soldiers in red trousers had escorted to the tomb, and men in white cravats had spoken words and shed tears that seemed to be sincere beside his grave. But here is the strange paper found by the dismayed notary in the desk where he'd kept the records of great criminals. It was entitled... Why? 20th June, 1851. I have just left court. I have condemned Blondel to death. Now, why did this man kill his five children? Frequently one meets with people to whom the destruction of life is a pleasure. Yes. Yes, it should be a pleasure. The greatest of all, perhaps. For is not killing the next thing to creating? To make and destroy. These two words contain the history of the universe. All the history of worlds, that is. All. Why is it not intoxicating to kill? 25th June. To think that there is a being who lives, who walks, who runs. A being? What is a being? That animated thing that bears in it the principle of motion and a will ruling that motion. It is attached to nothing, this thing. Its feet do not belong on the ground. It is a grain of life that moves on the earth, and this grain of life, coming I know not whence, one can destroy at one's will. Then nothing, nothing more. It perishes, it is finished. 26th June. Why, then, is it a crime to kill? Yes, why? On the contrary, it is the law of nature. The mission of every being is to kill. He kills to live, and he kills to kill. The beast kills without ceasing, all day, every instant of his existence. Man kills without ceasing to nourish himself, but since he needs, besides, to kill for pleasure, he has invented hunting. The child kills the insects he finds, the little birds, all the little animals that come in his way. But this does not suffice for the irresistible need to massacre that is in us. It is not enough to kill beasts, we must kill man, too. Long ago, this need was satisfied by human sacrifices. Now the requirements of social life have made murder a crime. We condemn and punish the assassin. But as we cannot live without yielding to this natural and imperious instinct of death, we relieve ourselves from time to time by wars. Then a whole nation slaughters another nation. It is a feast of blood, a feast that maddens armies and that intoxicates civilians, women, and children, who read, by lamplight at night, the feverish story of massacre. One might suppose that those destined to accomplish these butcheries of men would be despised. No, they are loaded with honors. They are clad in gold and in resplendent garments. They wear plumes on their heads and ornaments on their breasts. And they are given crosses, rewards, titles of every kind. They are proud, respected, loved by women, cheered by the crowd, solely because their mission is to shed human blood. They drag through the streets their instruments of death that the passerby, clad in black, looks on with envy. For to kill is the great law set by nature in the heart of existence. There is nothing more beautiful and honorable than killing. 30th June. To kill is the law, because nature loves eternal youth. She seems to cry in all her unconscious acts. Quick! 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 The more she destroys, the more she renews herself. 2nd July. A human being. What is a human being? Through thought, it is a reflection of all that is. Through memory and science, it is an abridged edition of the universe whose history it represents, a mirror of things and of nations, each human being becomes a microcosm in the macrocosm. 3rd July. It must be a pleasure, unique and full of zest, to kill. 
to have there before one the living, thinking being, to make therein a little hole, nothing but a little hole, to see that red thing flow which is the blood, which makes life, and to have before one only a heap of limp flesh, cold, inert, void of thought. 5th August. I, who have passed my life in judging, condemning, killing by the spoken word, killing by the guillotine those who had killed with the knife, I, I, if I should do, as all the assassins have done whom I have smitten, I, I, who would know it? 10th August. Who would ever know? Who would ever suspect me, 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 especially if I should choose a being I had no interest in doing away with? 15th August. The temptation has come to me. It pervades my whole being. My hands tremble with the desire to kill. 22nd August. I could resist no longer. I killed a little creature as an experiment for a beginning. Jean, my servant, had a goldfinch in a cage hung in the office window. I sent him on an errand, and I took the little bird in my hand, in my hand where I felt its heart beat. It was warm. I went up to my room. From time to time I squeezed it tighter, its heart beat faster. This was atrocious and delicious. I was near choking it, but I could not see the blood. Then I took scissors, short nail scissors, and I cut its throat with three slits, quite gently. It opened its bill. It struggled to escape me, but I held it. Oh, I held it. I could have held a mad dog, and I saw the blood trickle. And then I did as assassins do, real ones. I washed the scissors. I washed my hands. I sprinkled water and took the body, the corpse, to the garden to hide it. I buried it under a strawberry plant. It will never be found. Every day I shall eat a strawberry from that plant. How one can enjoy life when one knows how. My servant cried. He thought his bird flown. How could he suspect me? 25th August. I must kill a man. I must. 30th August. It is done. But what a little thing. I had gone for a walk in the forest of Vern. I was thinking of nothing, literally nothing. A child was in the road, a little child eating a slice of bread and butter. He stops to see me pass and says, Good day, Mr. President. And the thought enters my head. Shall I kill him? I answer, You are alone, my boy? Yes, sir. All alone in the wood? Yes, sir. The wish to kill him intoxicated me like wine. I approached him quite softly, persuaded that he was going to run away, and suddenly I seized him by the throat. He looked at me with terror in his eyes. Such eyes! He held my wrist in his little hands, and his body writhed like a feather over the fire. Then he moved no more. I threw his body in the ditch and some weeds on top of it. I returned home and dined well. What a little thing it was! In the evening I was very gay, light, rejuvenated. I passed the evening at the prefects. They found me witty but I have not seen blood. I am tranquil. 31st August. The body has been discovered. They are hunting for the assassin. 1st September. Two tramps have been arrested. Proofs are lacking. 2nd September. The parents have been to see me. They wept. 6th October. Nothing has been discovered. Some strolling vagabond must have done the deed. Ah, ah, if I had seen the blood flow, it seems to me I should be tranquil now. The desire to kill is in my blood. It is like the passion of youth at twenty. 20th October. Yet another. I was walking by the river after breakfast, and I saw, under a willow, a fisherman asleep. It was noon. A spade was standing in a potato field nearby, as if expressly for me. I took it. I returned. I raised it like a club, and with one blow of the edge I cleft the fisherman's head. Oh, he bled, this one. Rose-colored blood. It flowed into the water quite gently, and I went away with a grave step. If I had been seen, I should have made an excellent assassin. 25th October. The affair of the fisherman makes a great stir. His nephew, who fished with him, is charged with the murder. 26th October. The examining magistrate affirms that the nephew is guilty. Everybody in town believes it. 27th October. The nephew makes a very poor witness. He had gone to the village to buy bread and cheese, he declared. He swore that his uncle had been killed in his absence. Who would believe him? 28th October. The nephew has all but confessed they have badgered him so. Justice. 15th November. There are overwhelming proofs against the nephew, who was his uncle's heir. I shall provide at the sessions. 25th January. To death. To death. To death. I have had him condemned to death. The advocate general spoke like an angel. Yet another. I shall go to see him executed. 10th March. It is done. They guillotined him this morning. He died very well. Very well. That gave me pleasure. How fine it is to see a man's head cut off. Now I shall wait. I can wait. It would take such a little thing to let myself be caught. The manuscript contained yet other pages, but without relating any new crime. 
Alienist physicians to whom the awful story has been submitted declare that there are in the world many undiscovered bad men as adroit and as much to be feared as this monstrous lunatic. End of section 148. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 149 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 149. The Mask. There was a masquerade ball at the Elysee Montmartre that evening. It was the mi carême, and the crowds were pouring into the brightly lighted passage which leads to the dance ball, like water flowing through the open lock of a canal. The loud call of the orchestra, bursting like a storm of sound, shook the rafters, swelled through the whole neighborhood, and awoke, in the streets and in the depths of the houses, an irresistible desire to jump, to get warm, to have fun, which slumbers within each human animal. The patrons came from every quarter of Paris. There were people of all classes who loved noisy pleasures, a little low and tinged with debauch. There were clerks and girls, girls of every description, some wearing common cotton, some the finest batiste, rich girls, old and covered with diamonds, and poor girls of sixteen, full of the desire to revel, to belong to men, to spend money. Elegant black evening suits, in search of fresh or faded but appetizing novelty, wandering through the excited crowds, looking, searching, while the masqueraders seemed moved above all by the desire for amusement. Already the far-famed quadrilles had attached around them a curious crowd. The moving hedge which encircled the four dancers swayed in and out like a snake, sometimes nearer and sometimes farther away, according to the motions of the performers. The two women, whose lower limbs seemed to be attached to their bodies by rubber springs, were making wonderful and surprising motions with their legs. Their partners hopped and skipped about, waving their arms. One could imagine their panting breath beneath their masks. One of them, who had taken his place in the most famous quadrille, as a substitute for an absent celebrity, the handsome Songa Gos, was trying to keep up with the tireless arete de veau and was making strange fancy steps which aroused the joy and sarcasm of the audience. He was thin, dressed like a dandy, with a pretty varnished mask on his face. It had a curly blonde mustache and a wavy wig. He looked like a wax figure from the Musée Gravan, like a strange and fantastic caricature of the charming young man of fashion plates, and he danced with visible effort, clumsily, with a comical impetuosity. He appeared rusty beside the others when he tried to imitate their gambols. He seemed overcome by rheumatism, as heavy as a great Dane playing with greyhounds. Mocking bravos encouraged him. And he, carried away with enthusiasm, jigged about with such frenzy, that suddenly, carried away by a wild spurt, he pitched head foremost into the living wall formed by the audience, which opened up before him to allow him to pass, then closed around the inanimate body of the dancer, stretched out on his face. Some men picked him up and carried him away, calling for a doctor. A gentleman stepped forward, young and elegant, in well-fitting evening clothes, with large pearl studs. "'I am a professor of the Faculty of Medicine,' he said in a modest voice. He was allowed to pass, and he entered a small room full of little cardboard boxes, where the still lifeless dancer had been stretched out on some chairs. The doctor at first wished to take off his mask, and he noticed that it was attached in a complicated manner, with a perfect network of small metal wires which cleverly bound it to his wig and covered the whole head. Even the neck was imprisoned in a false skin which continued the chin and was painted the color of flesh, being attached to the collar of the shirt. All this had to be cut with strong scissors. When the physician had slid open the surprising arrangement from the shoulder to the temple, he opened this armor and found the face of an old man, worn out, thin and wrinkled. The surprise among those who had brought in this seemingly young dancer was so great that no one laughed, no one said a word. All were watching this sad face as he lay on the straw chairs, his eyes closed, his face covered with white hair, some long, falling from the forehead over the face, others short, growing around the face and the chin, and beside this poor head, that pretty little, neat, varnished, smiling mask. The man regained consciousness after being inanimate for a long time, but he still seemed to be so weak and sick that the physician feared some dangerous complication. He asked, "'Where do you live?' The old dancer seemed to be making an effort to remember, and then he mentioned the name of his street, which no one knew. He was asked for more definite information about the neighborhood. He answered with a great slowness, indecision and difficulty, which revealed his upset state of mind. The physician continued, I will take you home myself. Curiosity had overcome him to find out who this strange dancer, this phenomenal jumper, might be. Soon the two rolled away in a cab to the other side of Montmartre. They stopped before a high building of poor appearance. They went up a winding staircase. The doctor held to the banister, which was so grimy that the hand stuck to it, and he supported the dizzy old man, whose forces were beginning to return. They stopped at the fourth floor. 
The door at which they had knocked was opened by an old woman, neat-looking, with a white nightcap enclosing a thin face with sharp features. One of those good, rough faces of hard-working and faithful women. She cried out, "'For goodness sake, what's the matter?' He told her the whole affair in a few words. She became reassured and even calmed the physician himself by telling him that the same thing had happened many times. She said, "'He must be put to bed, monsieur, that is all. Let him sleep, and tomorrow he will be all right.' The doctor continued, "'But he can hardly speak.' "'Oh, that's just a little drink, nothing more. He has eaten no dinner in order to be nimble, and he took a few absinths in order to work himself up to do the proper pitch. You see, drink gives strength to his legs, but it stops his thoughts and words. He is too old to dance as he does. Really, his lack of common sense is enough to drive one mad.' The doctor, surprised, insisted, "'But why does he dance like that at his age?' She shrugged her shoulders and turned red from anger, which was slowly rising within her, and she cried out, "'Ah, yes, why? So that the people will think him young under his mask, so that the women will still take him for a young dandy and whisper nasty things into his ears, so that he can rub up against all their dirty skins with their perfumes and powders and cosmetics? Oh, it's a fine business. What a life I have had for the last forty years. But we must first get him to bed so that he may have no ill effects.' Would you mind helping me? When he's like that, I can't do anything with him alone. The old man was sitting on his bed with a tipsy look, his long white hair falling over his face. His companion looked at him with tender yet indignant eyes. She continued, Just see the fine head he has for his age, and yet he has to go and disguise himself in order to make people think that he is young. It's a perfect shame. Really, he has a fine head, monsieur. Wait, I'll show it to you before putting him to bed. She went to a table on which stood a wash basin, a pitcher of water, a soap, and a comb and brush. She took the brush, returned to the bed, and pushed back the drunkard's tangled hair. In a few seconds, she made him look like a model fit for a great painter, with his long white locks flowing on his neck. Then she stepped back in order to observe him, saying, "'There, isn't he fine for his age?' "'Very,' agreed the doctor, who was beginning to be highly amused. She added, "'And if you had known him when he was twenty-five, but we must get him to bed, otherwise the drink will make him sick. Do you mind drawing off that sleeve?' higher like that that's right now the trousers wait i'll take his shoes off that's right now hold him upright while i open the bed there let us put him in if you think that he is going to disturb himself when it is time for me to get in you are mistaken i have to find a little corner any place i can that doesn't bother him bah you old pleasure seeker as soon as he felt himself stretched out in his sheets the old man closed his eyes opened them closed them again and over his whole face appeared an energetic resolve to sleep. The doctor examined him with an ever-increasing interest, and asked, "'Does he go to all the fancy balls and try to be a young man?' "'To all of them, monsieur, and he comes back to me in the morning in a deplorable condition. You see, it's regret that leads him on and that makes him put a pasteboard face over his own. Yes, the regret of no longer being what he was and of no longer making any conquests.' He was sleeping now and beginning to snore. She looked at him with a pitying expression and continued, Oh, how many conquests that man has made! More than one could believe, monsieur, more than the finest gentleman of the world, than all the tenors and all the generals. Really? What did he do? Oh, it will surprise you at first, as you did not know him in his palmy days. When I met him it was also at a ball, for he has always frequented them. As soon as I saw him I was caught, caught like a fish on a hook. Ah, oh, how pretty he was, monsieur, with his curly raven locks and black eyes as large as saucers. Indeed, he was good-looking. He took me away that evening, and I have never left him since, never, not even for a day, no matter what he did to me. Oh, he has often made it hard for me. The doctor asked, Are you married? She answered simply, Yes, monsieur, otherwise he would have dropped me as he did the others. I have been his wife and his servant, everything, everything that he wished. How he has made me cry, tears which I did not show him, for he would tell all his adventures to me, to me, monsieur, without understanding how it hurt me to listen. But what was his business? That's so. I forgot to tell you. He was a foreman at Martel's, a foreman such as they had never had, an artist who averaged ten francs an hour. Martel? Who is Martel? The hairdresser, monsieur, the great hairdresser of the opera, who had all the actresses for customers. Yes, sir, all the smartest actresses had their hair dressed by Ambrose, and they would give him tips that made a fortune for him. Ah, monsieur, all the women are alike. Yes, all of them. When a man pleases their fancy, they offer themselves to him. It is so easy— and it hurts me so to hear about it, for he would tell me everything. He simply could not hold his tongue. It was impossible. Those things please men so much. They seem to get even more enjoyment out of telling than doing. 
When I would see him coming in the evening, a little pale, with a pleased look and a bright eye, I would say to myself, one more. I am sure that he has caught one more. Then I felt a wild desire to question him, and then again, not to know, to stop his talking if he should begin again, and we would look at each other. I knew that he would not keep still, that he would come to the point. I could feel that from his manner, which seemed to laugh and say, I had a fine adventure today, Madeline. I would pretend to notice nothing, to guess nothing. I would set the table, bring the soup, and sit down opposite him. At those times, monsieur, it was as if my friendship for him had been crushed in my body as with a stone. It hurt. But he did not understand. He did not know. He felt a need to tell all those things to someone, to boast, to show how much he was loved, and I was the only one he had to whom he could talk. The only one. And I would have to listen and drink it in like poison. He would begin to take his soup, and then he would say, One more, Madeline. And I would think, here it comes. Goodness, what a man. Why did I ever meet him? Then he would begin. One more, and a beauty, too. And it would be someone from the vaudeville, or else from the varieties, or some of the big ones, too, some of the most famous. He would tell me their names, how their apartments were furnished, everything. Everything, monsieur. Heartbreaking details. And he would go over them and tell his story over again from beginning to end, so pleased with himself that I would pretend to laugh so that he would not get angry with me. Everything may not have been true, he liked to glorify himself and was quite capable of inventing such things. They may perhaps also have been true. On those evenings, he would pretend to be tired and wish to go to bed after supper. We would take supper at eleven, monsieur, for he could never get back from work earlier. When he had finished telling about his adventure, he would walk around the room and smoke cigarettes. And he was so handsome, with his mustache and curly hair, that I would think, it's true, just the same, what he is telling. Since I myself am crazy about that man, why should not others be the same? Then I would feel like crying, shrieking, running away, jumping out of the window while I was clearing the table and he was smoking. He would yawn in order to show how tired he was, and he would say two or three times before going to bed, Ah, how well I shall sleep this evening. I bear him no ill will, because he did not know how he was hurting me. No, he couldn't know. He loved to boast about the women just as a peacock loves to show his feathers. He got to the point where he thought that all of them looked at him and desired him. It was hard when he grew old. Oh, monsieur, when I saw his first white hair, I felt a terrible shock and then a great joy, a wicked joy, but so great, so great. I said to myself, it's the end, it's the end. It seemed as if I were about to be released from prison. At last I could have him to myself, all to myself, when the others would no longer want him. It was one morning in bed, he was sleeping, and I leaned over him to wake him up with a kiss, when I noticed in his curls over his temple a little thread which shone like silver. What a surprise! I should not have thought it possible. At first I thought of tearing it out so that he would not see it, but as I looked carefully I noticed another farther up. White hair! He was going to have white hair! My heart began to thump and perspiration stood out all over me, but away down at the bottom I was happy. It was mean to feel thus, but I did my housework with a light heart that morning, without waking him up, and as soon as he opened his eyes of his own accord, I said to him, Do you know what I discovered while you were asleep? No. I found white hairs. He started up as if I had tickled him and said angrily, It's not true. Yes, it is. There are four of them over your left temple. He jumped out of bed and ran over to the mirror. He could not find them. Then I showed him the first one, the lowest, the little curly one, and I said, It's no wonder, after the life that you have been leading, in two years all will be over for you. Well, monsieur, I had spoken true. Two years later one could not recognize him. How quickly a man changes! He was still handsome, but he had lost his freshness, and the women no longer ran after him. Ah, what a life I led at that time! How he treated me! Nothing suited him! He left his trade to go into the hat business in which he ate up all his money, then he unsuccessfully tried to be an actor, and finally he began to frequent public balls. Fortunately, he had common sense enough to save a little something on which we now live. It is sufficient, but it is not enormous, and to think that at one time he had almost a fortune. Now you see what he does. This habit holds him like a frenzy. He has to be young. He has to dance with women who smell of perfume and cosmetics. You poor old darling. She was looking at her old snoring husband fondly, ready to cry. Then, gently tiptoeing up to him, she kissed his hair. The physician had risen and was getting ready to leave, finding nothing to say to this strange couple. Just as he was leaving, she asked, Would you mind giving me your address? If he should grow worse, I could go and get you. End of section 149. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 150 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 150. 
the Penguins Rock. This is the season for penguins. From April to the end of May, before the Parisian visitors arrive, one sees, all at once, on the little beach at Etretat, several old gentlemen, booted and belted in shooting costume. They spend four or five days at the Hotel Hovia, disappear, and return again three weeks later. Then, after a fresh sojourn, they go away together. One sees them again the following spring. These are the last penguin hunters, what remain of the old set. There were about 20 enthusiasts 30 or 40 years ago. Now there are only a few of the enthusiastic sportsmen. The penguin is a very rare bird of passage with peculiar habits. It lives the greater part of the year in the latitude of Newfoundland and the islands of Saint-Pierre and Miquelon. But in the breeding season, a flight of emigrants crosses the ocean and comes every year to the same spot to lay their eggs, to the penguin's rock near Etretat. They are found nowhere else, only there. They have always come there, have always been chased away, but return again, and will always return. As soon as the young birds are grown, they all fly away and disappear for a year. Why do they not go elsewhere? Why not choose some other spot on a long, white, unending cliff that extends from the Pas de Calais to Havre? What force, what invincible instinct, what custom of centuries impels these birds to come back to this place? What first migration, what tempest, possibly, once cast their ancestors on this rock? And why do the children, the grandchildren, all the descendants of the first parents always return here? There are not many of them, a hundred at most, as if one single family, maintaining the tradition, made this annual pilgrimage. And each spring, as soon as the little wandering tribe has taken up its abode on the rock, the same sportsmen also reappear in the village. One knew them formerly, when they were young, now they are old, but constant to the regular appointment which they have kept for thirty or forty years. They would not miss it for anything in the world. It was an April evening in one of the later years. Three of the old sportsmen had arrived. One was missing, Monsieur Darnell. He had written to no one, given no account of himself, but he was not dead like so many of the rest. They would have heard of it. At length, tired of waiting for him, the other three sat down at the table. Dinner was almost over when a carriage drove into the yard of the hotel, and the latecomer presently entered the dining room. He sat down in a good humor, rubbing his hands, and ate with zest. When one of his comrades remarked with surprise at his being in a frock coat, he replied quietly, Yes, I had no time to change my clothes. They retired on leaving the table, for they had to set out before daybreak in order to take the birds unawares. There is nothing so pretty as this sport, this early morning expedition. At three o'clock in the morning, the sailors awoke the sportsmen by throwing sand against the windows. They were ready in a few minutes and went down to the beach. Although it was still dark, the stars had paled a little. The sea ground the shingle on the beach. There was such a fresh breeze that it made one shiver slightly in spite of one's heavy clothing. Presently, two boats were pushed down the beach by the sailors, with a sound as of tearing cloth, and were floated on the nearest waves. The brown sail was hoisted, swelled a little, fluttered, hesitated, and swelling out again as round as a paunch, carried the boats towards the large arched entrance that could be faintly distinguished in the darkness. The sky became clearer, the shadows seemed to melt away. The coast still seemed veiled, the great white coast, perpendicular as a wall. They passed through the Manport, an enormous arch beneath which a ship could sail. They doubled the promontory of La Courtine, passed the little valley of Antifer and the cape of the same name, and suddenly caught sight of a beach on which some hundreds of seagulls were perched. That was the penguin's rock. It was just a little protuberance of the cliff, and on the narrow ledges of rock the birds' heads might be seen watching the boats. They remained there, motionless, not venturing off to fly off yet. Some of them perched on the edges, seated upright, looked almost like bottles, for their little legs are so short that when they walk they glide along as if they were on rollers. When they start to fly, they cannot make a spring, and let themselves fall like stones, almost down to the very men who are watching them. They know their limitation, and the danger to which it subjects them, and cannot make up their minds to fly away. But the boatmen began to shout, beating the sides of the boat with the wooden boat pins, and the birds, in a fright, fly one by one into space until they reach the level of the waves. Then, moving their wings rapidly, they scud, scud along until they reach the open sea, if a shower of lead does not knock them into the water. For an hour, the firing is kept up, obliging them to give up, one after another. Sometimes the mother birds will not leave their nests and are riddled with shot, causing drops of blood to spurt on the white cliff, and the animal dies without having deserted her eggs. The first day, Monsieur Darnell fired at the birds with his habitual zeal. But when the party returned toward ten o'clock, beneath a brilliant sun which cast great triangles of light on the white cliffs along the coast, he appeared a little worried and absent-minded, contrary to his accustomed manner. As soon as they got on shore, a kind of servant dressed in black came up to him and said something in a low tone. He seemed to reflect, hesitate, and then replied, No, tomorrow. 
The following day, they set out again. This time, Monsieur Darnell frequently missed his aim, although the birds were close by. His friends teased him, asked if he were in love, if some secret sorrow was troubling his mind and heart. At length, he confessed. Yes, indeed, I have to leave soon, and that annoys me. What? You must leave? And why? Oh, I have some business that calls me back. I cannot stay any longer. They talked of other matters. As soon as breakfast was over, the valet in black appeared. Monsieur Darnell ordered his carriage, and the man was leaving the room when the three sportsmen interfered, insisting, begging, and praying their friend to stay. One of them at last said, Come now, this cannot be a matter of such importance, for you have already waited two days. Monsieur Darnell, altogether perplexed, began to think, evidently baffled, divided between pleasure and duty, unhappy and disturbed. After reflecting for some time, he stammered, The fact is, the fact is, I am not alone here. I have my son-in-law. There were exclamations and shouts of, Your son-in-law? Where is he? He suddenly appeared confused, and his face grew red. What? You do not know? Why, why, he's in the coach house. He's dead. They were all silent in amazement. Monsieur Darnell continued, more and more disturbed. I had the misfortune to lose him, and as I was taking the body to my house in Brisevia, I came round this way so as not to miss our appointment. But you can see that I cannot wait any longer. Then one of the sportsmen, bolder than the rest, said, Well, but since he is dead, it seems to me that he can wait a day longer. The others chimed in. That cannot be denied. Monsieur Darnell appeared to be relieved of a great weight, but a little uneasy nevertheless, he asked. But frankly, do you think... The three others, as one man, replied, Parbleu, my dear boy, two days more or less can make no difference in his present condition. And, perfectly calmly, the father-in-law turned to the undertaker's assistant and said, Well then, my friend, it will be the day after tomorrow. End of section 150 Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 151 of Complete Original Short Stories, Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 151. A Family. I was to see my old friend, Simone Radovan, of whom I had lost sight for fifteen years. At one time he was my most intimate friend, the friend who knows one's thoughts, with whom one passes long, quiet, happy evenings, to whom one tells one's secret love affairs, and who seems to draw out those rare, ingenious, delicate thoughts born of that sympathy that gives a sense of repose. For years we had been scarcely separated. We had lived, traveled, thought, and dreamed together, had liked the same things, had admired the same books, understood the same authors, trembled with the same sensations, and very often laughed at the same individuals whom we understood completely by merely exchanging a glance. Then he married. He married quite suddenly a little girl from the provinces who had come to Paris in search of a husband. How in the world could that little thin, insipidly fair girl with her weak hands, her light vacant eyes, and her clear silly voice, who was exactly like a hundred thousand marriageable dolls, have picked up that intelligent, clever young fellow? Can anyone understand these things? No doubt he had hoped for happiness simple, quiet, and long-enduring happiness, in the arms of a good, tender, and faithful woman. He had seen all that in the transparent looks of that schoolgirl with light hair. He had not dreamed of the fact that an active, living, and vibrating man grows weary of everything as soon as he understands the stupid reality, unless, indeed, he becomes so brutalized that he understands nothing whatever. What would he be like when I meet him again? Still lively, witty, light-hearted, and enthusiastic, or in a state of mental torpor induced by provincial life? A man may change greatly in the course of fifteen years. The train stopped at a small station, and as I got out of the carriage, a stout, very stout man with red cheeks and big stomach rushed up to me with open arms, exclaiming, George! I embraced him, but I had not recognized him, and then I said in astonishment, By Jove, you have not grown thin! And he replied with a laugh, What did you expect? Good living, a good table, and good nights. Eating and sleeping, that is my existence. I looked at him closely, trying to discover in that broad face the features I held so dear. His eyes alone had not changed, but I no longer saw the same expression in them, and I said to myself, If the expression be the reflection of the mind, the thoughts in that head are not what they used to be formerly, those thoughts which I knew so well. Yet his eyes were bright, full of happiness and friendship, but they had not that clear, intelligent expression which shows us as much as words the brightness of the intellect. Suddenly, he said, Here are my two eldest children. A girl of fourteen, who was almost a woman, 
and a boy of thirteen, in the dress of a boy from the lycée, came forward in a hesitating and awkward manner, and I said in a low voice, Are they yours? Of course they are, he replied, laughing. How many have you? Five, there are three more at home. He said this in a proud, self-satisfied, almost triumphant manner, and I felt profound pity mingled with a feeling of vague contempt for this vainglorious and simple reproducer of his species. I got into a carriage, which he drove himself, and we set off through the town, a dull, sleepy, gloomy town where nothing was moving in the streets except a few dogs and two or three maidservants. Here and there, a shopkeeper, standing at his door, took off his hat, and Simone returned his salute and told me the man's name, no doubt to show me that he knew all the inhabitants personally, and the thought struck me that he was thinking of becoming a candidate for the Chamber of Deputies, that dream of all those who bury themselves in the provinces. We were soon out of the town, and the carriage turned into a garden that was an imitation of a park, and stopped in front of a turreted house, which tried to look like a chateau. "'That is my den,' said Simone, so that I might compliment him on it. "'It is charming,' I replied." A lady appeared on the steps, dressed for company, and with company phrases already prepared. She was no longer the light-haired, insipid girl I had seen in church fifteen years previously, but a stout lady in curls and flounces, one of those ladies of uncertain age, without intellect, without any of those things that go to make a woman. In short, she was a mother, a stout, commonplace mother, a human breeding machine which procreates without any other preoccupation but her children and her cookbook. She welcomed me, and I went into the hall, where three children, ranged according to their height, seemed set out for review, like firemen before the mayor. And I said, Ah, ah, so there are the others. Simone, radiant with pleasure, introduced them. Jean, Sophie, and Gontran. The door of the drawing room was open. I went in, and in the depths of an easy chair I saw something trembling. A man, an old, paralyzed man. Madame Redivan came forward and said, This is my grandfather, monsieur. He is eighty-seven and then she shouted into the shaking old man's ears, "'This is a friend of Simone's, Papa.' The old gentleman tried to say, "'Good day to me,' he muttered, "'Oh, oh, oh,' and waved his hand. So I took a seat, saying, "'You are very kind, monsieur.' Simone had just come in, and he said with a laugh, "'So, you have met Grandpapa's acquaintance. He is a treasure, that old man. He is the delight of the children. But he is so greedy that he almost kills himself at every meal. You have no idea what he would eat if he were allowed to do as he pleased.' But you'll see, you'll see. He looks at all the sweets as if they were so many girls. You never saw anything so funny. You will see presently. I was then shown to my room to change my dress for dinner, and hearing a great clatter behind me on the stairs, I turned round and saw that all the children were following me behind their father, to do me honor, no doubt. My windows looked out across a dreary, interminable plain, an ocean of grass, of wheat, and of oats, without a clump of trees or any rising ground a striking and melancholy picture of the life which they must be leading in that house. A bell rang. It was for dinner, and I went downstairs. Madame Radevan took my arm in a ceremonious manner, and we passed into the dining room. A footman wheeled in the old man in his wheelchair. He gave a greedy and curious look at the dessert, and as he turned his shaking head with difficulty from one dish to the other, Simone rubbed his hands. "'You will be amused,' he said." and all the children, understanding that I was going to be indulged with the sight of their greedy grandfather, began to laugh, while their mother merely smiled and shrugged her shoulders, and Simone, making a speaking trumpet of his hands, shouted at the old man, "'This evening there is sweet cream and rice!' The wrinkled face of the grandfather brightened, and he trembled more violently from head to foot, showing that he had understood and was very pleased. The dinner began. "'Just look,' Simone whispered. The old man did not like the soup and refused to eat it, but was obliged to do it for the good of his health, and the footman forced the spoon into his mouth, while the old man blew so energetically so as not to swallow the soup that it was scattered like a spray all over the table and over his neighbors. The children writhed with laughter at the spectacle, while their father, who was also amused, said, Is not the old man comical? During the whole meal they were taken up solely with him. He devoured the dishes on the table with his eyes, and tried to seize them and pull them over to him with his trembling hands. They put them almost within his reach, to see his useless efforts, his trembling clutches at them, the piteous appeal of his whole nature, of his eyes, of his mouth, and of his nose as he smelt them, and he slobbered on his table napkin with eagerness, while uttering inarticulate grunts, and the whole family was highly amused at this horrible and grotesque scene. Then they put a tiny morsel on his plate, and he ate with feverish gluttony, in order to get something more as soon as possible, and when the sweetened rice was brought in, he nearly had a fit, and groaned with greediness and Gontran called out to him, "'You have eaten too much already. You can have no more,' and they pretended not to give him any. 
Then he began to cry. He cried and trembled more violently than ever, while all the children laughed. At last, however, they gave him his helping, a very small piece, and as he ate the first mouthful, he made a comical noise in his throat, and a movement with his neck as ducks do when they swallow too large a morsel, and when he had swallowed it, he began to stamp his feet so as to get more. I was seized with pity for this saddening and ridiculous tantalus, and interposed on his behalf. Come, give him a little more rice. But Simone replied, Oh, no, my dear fellow, if he were to eat too much, it would harm him at his age. I held my tongue and thought over those words. Oh, ethics, oh, logic, oh, wisdom, at his age. So they deprived him of his only remaining pleasure out of regard for his health. His health, what would he do with it, inert and trembling wreck that he was? They were taking care of his life, so they said. His life? How many days? Ten, twenty, fifty, or a hundred? Why? For his own sake? Or to preserve for some time longer the spectacle of his impotent greediness in the family? There was nothing left for him to do in this life, nothing whatever. He had one single wish left, one sole pleasure. Why not grant him that last solace until he died? After we had played cards for a long time, I went up to my room and to bed. I was low-spirited and sad, and I sat at my window. Not a sound could be heard outside but the beautiful warbling of a bird in a tree somewhere in the distance. No doubt the bird was singing in a low voice during the night to lull his mate who was asleep on her eggs, and I thought of my poor friend's five children and pictured him to myself, snoring by the side of his ugly wife. End of section 151. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 152 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 152. Suicides. To Georges Legrand. Hardly a day goes by without our reading a news item like the following in some newspaper. On Wednesday night, the people living in number 40, Rue de Blanc, were awakened by two successive shots. The explosion seemed to come from the apartment occupied by Monsieur X. The door was broken in and the man was found bathed in his blood, still holding in one hand the revolver with which he had taken his life. Monsieur X was 57 years of age, enjoying a comfortable income, and had everything necessary to make him happy. No cause can be found for his action. What terrible grief, what unknown suffering, hidden despair, secret wounds drive these presumably happy persons to suicide. We search, we imagine tragedies of love, we suspect financial troubles, and, as we never find anything definite, we apply to these deaths the word mystery. A letter found on the desk of one of these suicides without cause, and written during his last night, beside his loaded revolver, has come into our hands. We deem it rather interesting. It reveals none of these great catastrophes, which we always expect to find behind these acts of despair, but it shows us the slow succession of the little vexations of life, the disintegration of a lonely existence, whose dreams have disappeared. It gives the reason for these tragic ends, which only nervous and high-strung people can understand. Here it is. It is midnight. When I have finished this letter, I shall kill myself. Why? I shall attempt to give the reasons, not for those who may read these lines, but for myself, to kindle my waning courage, to impress upon myself the fatal necessity of this act, which can at best be only deferred. I was brought up by simple-minded parents who were unquestioning believers, and I believed as they did. My dream lasted a long time. The last veil has just been torn from my eyes. During the last few years, a strange change has been taking place within me. All the events of life, which formerly had to me the glow of a beautiful sunset, are now fading away. The true meaning of things has appeared to me in its brutal reality, and the true reason for love has bred in me disgust even for this poetic sentiment. We are the eternal toys of foolish and charming illusions which are always being renewed. On growing older, I had become partly reconciled to the awful mystery of life, to the uselessness of effort, when the emptiness of everything appeared to me in a new light this evening at dinner. Formerly I was happy. Everything pleased me. The passing women, the appearance of the streets, the place where I lived, and I even took an interest in the cut of my clothes. But the repetition of the same sights has had the result of filling my heart with weariness and disgust, just as one would feel were one to go on every night to the same theatre. For the last thirty years I have been rising at the same hour, and, at the same restaurant, for thirty years, I have been eating at the same hours, the same dishes, brought to me by different waiters. I have tried travel. The loneliness which one feels in strange places terrified me. I felt so alone, so small on the earth, that I quickly started on my homeward journey. But here, the unchanging expression of my furniture, which has stood for thirty years in the same place, the smell of my apartments, for, with time, each dwelling takes on a particular odor, 
Each night, these and other things disgust me and make me sick of living thus. Everything repeats itself endlessly. The way in which I put my key in the lock, the place where I always find my matches, the first object which meets my eye when I enter the room, make me feel like jumping out of the window and putting an end to these monotonous events from which we can never escape. Each day when I shave, I feel an inordinate desire to cut my throat, and my face, which I see in the little mirror, always the same, with soap on my cheeks, has several times made me weak from sadness. Now I even hate to be with people whom I used to meet with pleasure. I know them so well, I can tell just what they are going to say and what I am going to answer. Each brain is like a circus, where the same horse keeps circling around eternally. We must circle round always, around the same ideas, the same joys, the same pleasures, the same habits, the same beliefs, the same sensations of disgust. The fog was terrible this evening. It enfolded the boulevard where the street lights were dimmed and looked like smoking candles. A heavier weight than usual oppressed me. Perhaps my digestion was bad. For good digestion is everything in life. It gives inspiration to the artist, amorous desires to young people, clear ideas to thinkers, the joy of life to everybody, and it also allows one to eat heartily, which is one of the greatest pleasures. A sick stomach induces skepticism, unbelief, nightmares, and the desire for death. I have often noticed this fact. Perhaps I would not kill myself if my digestion had been good this evening. When I sat down in the armchair where I have been sitting every day for thirty years, I glanced around me, and just then I was seized by such terrible distress that I thought I must go mad. I tried to think of what I could do to run away from myself. Every occupation struck me as being worse even than inaction. Then I bethought me of putting my papers in order. For a long time I have been thinking of clearing out my drawers, for, for the last thirty years, I have been throwing my letters and bills pell-mell into the same desk, and this confusion has often caused me considerable trouble. But I feel such moral and physical laziness at the sole idea of putting anything in order that I have never had the courage to begin this tedious business. I therefore open my desk, intending to choose among my old papers and destroy the majority of them. At first I was bewildered by this array of documents, yellowed by age, then I chose one. Oh, if you cherish life, never disturb the burial place of old letters. And if, perchance, you should, take the contents by the handful, close your eyes that you may not read a word, so that you may not recognize some forgotten handwriting which may plunge you suddenly into a sea of memories. Carry these papers to the fire, and when they are in ashes, crush them to an invisible powder, or otherwise you are lost, just as I have been lost for an hour. The first letters which I read did not interest me greatly. They were recent, and came from living men whom I still meet quite often, and whose presence does not move me to any great extent. But all at once one envelope made me start. My name was traced on it in a large, bold handwriting, and suddenly tears came to my eyes. That letter was from my dearest friend, the companion of my youth, the confidant of my hopes, and he appeared before me so clearly, with his pleasant smile and his hand outstretched, that a cold shiver ran down my back. Yes, yes, the dead come back, for I saw him. Our memory is a more perfect world than the universe, it gives back life to those who no longer exist. With trembling hand and dimmed eyes, I reread everything that he told me, and in my poor sobbing heart I felt a wound so painful that I began to groan as a man whose bones are slowly being crushed. Then I traveled over my whole life, just as one travels along a river. I recognized people, so long forgotten that I no longer knew their names. Their faces alone lived in me. In my mother's letters I saw again the old servants, the shape of our house and the little insignificant odds and ends which cling to our minds. Yes, I suddenly saw again all my mother's old gowns, the different styles which she adopted, and the several ways in which she dressed her hair. She haunted me especially in a silk dress, trimmed with old lace, and I remembered something she said one day when she was wearing this dress. She said, Robert, my child, if you do not stand up straight, you will be round-shouldered all your life. Then, opening another drawer, I found myself face to face with memories of tender passions. A dancing pump, a torn handkerchief, even a garter— locks of hair and dried flowers, then the sweet romances of my life, whose living heroines are now white-haired, plunge me into the deep melancholy of things. Oh, the young brows where blonde locks curl, the caress of the hands, the glance which speaks, the hearts which beat, that smile which promises the lips, those lips which promise the embrace, and the first kiss, that endless kiss which makes you close your eyes, which drowns all thought in the immeasurable joy of approaching possession." Taking these old pledges of former love in both my hands, I covered them with furious caresses, and in my soul, torn by those memories, I saw them each again at the hour of surrender, and I suffered a torture more cruel than all the tortures invented in all the fables about hell. One last letter remained. It was written by me and dictated fifty years ago by my writing teacher. Here it is. My dear little mamma, 
I am seven years old today. It is the age of reason. I take advantage of it to thank you for having brought me into this world. Your little son who loves you, Robert. It is all over. I had gone back to the beginning, and suddenly I turned my glance on what remained to me of life. I saw hideous and lonely old age, and approaching infirmities, and everything over and gone, and nobody near me. My revolver is here, on a table. I am loading it. Never reread your old letters. And that is how many men come to kill themselves, and we search in vain to discover some great sorrow in their lives. End of section 152. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 153 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 153, An Artifice. The old doctor sat by the fireside, talking to his fair patient who was lying on the lounge. There was nothing much the matter with her, except that she had one of those little feminine ailments from which pretty women frequently suffer, slight anemia, a nervous attack, etc. No, doctor, she said. I shall never be able to understand a woman deceiving her husband, even allowing that she does not love him, that she pays no heed to her vows and promises. How can she give herself to another man? How can she conceal the intrigue from people's eyes? How can it be possible to love amid lies and treason? The doctor smiled and replied, It is perfectly easy, and I can assure you that a woman does not think of all those little subtle details when she has made up her mind to go astray. As for dissimulation, all women have had plenty of it on hand for such occasions, and the simplest of them are wonderful, and extricate themselves from the greatest dilemmas in a remarkable manner. The young woman, however, seemed incredulous. No, doctor, she said, one never thinks until after it has happened of what one ought to have done in a critical situation, and women are certainly more liable than men to lose their heads on such occasions. The doctor raised his hands. After it has happened, you say? Now I will tell you something that happened to one of my female patients, whom I always considered an immaculate woman. It happened in a provincial town, and one night when I fell asleep, in that deep first sleep from which it is so difficult to rouse us, it seemed to me in my dreams as if the bells of the town were sounding a fire alarm, and I woke up with a start. It was my own bell, which was ringing wildly, and as my footman did not seem to be answering the door, I in turn pulled the bell at the head of my bed, and soon I heard a banging and steps in the silent house, and Jean came into my room and handed me a letter which said, Madame Lelièvre begs Dr. Simeon to come to her immediately. I thought for a few moments, and then I said to myself, A nervous attack, vapors, nonsense, I am too tired. And so I replied, As Dr. Simeon is not at all well, he must beg Madame Lelièvre to be kind enough to call in his colleague, Monsieur Bonnet. I put the note into an envelope and went to sleep again, but about half an hour later the street bell rang again, and Jean came to me and said, there is somebody downstairs. I do not quite know whether it is a man or a woman, as the individual is so wrapped up, but they wish to speak to you immediately. They say it is a matter of life and death for two people. Whereupon I sat up in bed and told him to show the person in. A kind of black phantom appeared and raised her veil as soon as Jean had left the room. It was Madame Berthe Lelièvre, quite a young woman, who had been married for three years to a large merchant in the town, who was said to have married the prettiest girl in the neighborhood. She was terribly pale, her face was contracted as the faces of insane people are, occasionally, and her hands trembled violently. Twice she tried to speak without being able to utter a sound, but at last she stammered out, Come quick, quick, doctor, come, my friend has just died in my bedroom. She stopped, half suffocated with emotion, and then went on, My husband will be coming home from the club very soon. I jumped out of bed without even considering that I was only in a nightshirt, and dressed myself in a few moments, and then I said, did you come a short time ago? No, she said, standing like a statue petrified with horror. It was my servant. She knows. And then, after a short silence, she went on. I was there, by his side. And she uttered a short cry of horror, and after a fit of choking which made her gasp, she wept violently and shook with spasmodic sobs for a minute or two. Then her tears suddenly ceased, as if by an internal fire, and with an air of tragic calmness, she said, Let us make haste. I was ready, but exclaimed, I quite forgot to order my carriage. I have one, she said. It is his which was waiting for him. She wrapped herself up so as to completely conceal her face, and we started. When she was by my side in the carriage, she suddenly seized my hand, and crushing in her delicate fingers, she said, with a shaking voice, that proceeded from a distracted heart, Oh, if you only knew, if you only knew what I am suffering. I loved him, I have loved him distractedly, like a madwoman, for the last six months. Is anyone up in your house? I asked. 
No, nobody except those who know everything. We stopped at the door, and evidently everybody was asleep. We went in without making any noise, by means of her latch key, and walked upstairs on tiptoe. The frightened servant was sitting on the top of the stairs with a lighted candle by her side, as she was afraid to remain with the dead man, and I went into the room which was in great disorder. Wet towels, with which they had bathed the young man's temples, were lying on the floor, by the side of a wash basin and a glass, while a strong smell of vinegar pervaded the room. The dead man's body was lying at full length in the middle of the room, and I went up to it, looked at it, and touched it. I opened the eyes and felt the hands, and then, turning to the two women, who were shaking as if they were freezing, I said to them, Help me to lift him onto the bed. When we had laid him gently on it, I listened to his heart and put a looking glass to his lips, and said, It is all over. It was a terrible sight. I looked at the man and said, You ought to arrange his hair a little. The girl went and brought her mistress's comb and brush, but as she was trembling and pulling out his long matted hair and doing it, Madame Lelievre took the comb out of her hand and arranged his hair as if she were caressing him. She parted it, brushed his beard, rolled his mustaches gently round her fingers. Then, suddenly letting go of his hair, she took the dead man's inert hand in her hands and looked for a long time in despair at his dead face, which could no longer smile at her. And then, throwing herself on him, she clasped him in her arms and kissed him ardently. Her kisses fell like blows on his closed mouth and eyes, his forehead and temples. And then, putting her lips to his ear, as if he could still hear her, and as if she were about to whisper something to him, she said several times, in a heart-rending voice, "'Good-bye, my darling.' Just then the clock struck twelve, and I started up. Twelve o'clock!' I exclaimed. "'That is the time when the club closes. Come, madame, we have not a moment to lose.' She started up, and I said, "'We must carry him into the drawing-room.' And when we had done this, I placed him on a sofa and lit the chandeliers, and just then the front door was opened and shut noisily. "'Rose, bring me the basin and towels, and make the room look tidy.' Make haste, for heaven's sake, Monsieur Lelievre is coming in. I heard his steps on the stairs, and then his hands feeling along the walls. Come here, my dear fellow, I said. We have had an accident. And the astonished husband appeared in the door with a cigar in his mouth, and said, What is the matter? What is the meaning of this? My dear friend, I said, going up to him, you find us in great embarrassment. I had remained late, chatting with your wife and our friend, who had brought me in his carriage, when he suddenly fainted, and in spite of all we have done, he has remained unconscious for two hours. I did not like to call in strangers, and if you will now help me downstairs with him, I shall be able to attend to him better at his own house. The husband, who was surprised but quite unsuspicious, took off his hat, and then he took his rival, who would be quite inoffensive for the future, under the arms. I got between his two legs, as if I had been a horse between the shafts, and we went downstairs while his wife held a light for us. When we got outside, I stood the body up, so as to deceive the coachman, and said, Come, my friend, it is nothing. You feel better already, I expect. Pluck up your courage and make an effort. It will soon be over. But as I felt that he was slipping out of my hands, I gave him a slap on the shoulder, which sent him forward and made him fall into the carriage, and then I got in after him. Monsieur Lelievre, who was rather alarmed, said to me, Do you think it is anything serious? To which I replied, No, with a smile, as I looked at his wife, who had put her arm into that of her husband and was trying to see into the carriage. I shook hands with them and told my coachman to start, and during the whole drive, the dead man kept falling against me. When we got to his house, I said that he had become unconscious on the way home and helped to carry him upstairs, where I certified that he was dead and acted another comedy to his distracted family, and at last I got back into bed, not without swearing at lovers. The doctor ceased, though he was still smiling, and the young woman, who was in a very nervous state, said, "'Why have you told me that terrible story?' He gave her a gallant bow and replied, so that I may offer you my services if they should be needed. End of section 153. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 154 of Complete Original Short Stories, Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 154. Dreams. They had just dined together, five old friends, a writer, a doctor, and three rich bachelors without any profession. They had talked about everything, and a feeling of lassitude came over them, that feeling which proceeds and leads to the departure of guests after festive gatherings. One of those present, who had for the last five minutes been gazing silently at the surging boulevard dotted with gas lamps, with its rattling vehicles, said suddenly, When you've nothing to do from morning till night, the days are so long. And the nights, too, assented the guest who sat next to him. I sleep very little. Pleasure fatigues me. Conversation is monotonous. 
Never do I come across a new idea, and I feel, before talking to anyone, a violent longing to say nothing and to listen to nothing. I don't know what to do with my evenings. The third idler remarked, I would pay a great deal for anything that would help me to just pass two pleasant hours every day. The writer, who had just thrown his overcoat across his arm, turned round to them and said, The man who could discover a new vice and introduce it among his fellow creatures, even if it were to shorten their lives, would render a greater service to humanity than the man who found the means of securing to them eternal salvation and eternal youth. The doctor burst out laughing, and while he chewed his cigar, he said, Yes, but it is not so easy to discover it. Men have, however crudely, been seeking for and working for the object you refer to since the beginning of the world. The men who came first reached perfection at once in this way. We are hardly equal to them. One of the three idlers murmured, What a pity! Then, after a minute's pause, he added, If we could only sleep, sleep well without feeling hot or cold, sleep with that perfect unconsciousness we experience on nights when we are thoroughly fatigued, sleep without dreams. Why without dreams? asked the guest sitting next to him. The other replied, Because dreams are not always pleasant, they are always fantastic, improbable, disconnected, and because when we are asleep we cannot have the sort of dreams we like. We ought to dream waking. And what's to prevent you? asked the writer. The doctor flung away the end of his cigar. My dear fellow, in order to dream when you are awake, you need great power and great exercise of will, and when you try to do it, great weariness is the result. Now, real dreaming, that journey of our thoughts through delightful visions, is assuredly the sweetest experience in the world, but it must come naturally. It must not be provoked in a painful manner, and must be accompanied by absolute bodily comfort. This power of dreaming I can give you, provided you promise that you will not abuse it. The writer shrugged his shoulders. Ah, yes, I know. Hashish, opium, green tea, artificial paradises. I have read Baudelaire, and I even tasted the famous drug, which made me very sick. But the doctor, without stirring from his seat, said, No, either, nothing but either, and I would suggest that you literary men should use it sometimes. The three rich bachelors drew closer to the doctor. One of them said, Explain to us the effects of it. And the doctor replied, Let's put aside big words, shall we not? I am not talking of medicine or morality. I am talking of pleasure. You give yourselves up every day to excesses which consume your lives. I want to indicate to you a new sensation, possible only to intelligent men. Let us say even very intelligent men. Dangerous, like everything else that overexcites our organs, but exquisite. I might add that you would require a certain preparation, that is to say, practice, to feel in all their completeness the singular effects of either. They are different from the effects of hashish, of opium, or morphia, and they cease as soon as the absorption of the drug is interrupted, while the other generators of daydreams continue their actions for hours. I am now going to try to analyze these feelings as clearly as possible, but the thing is not easy. So facile, so delicate, so almost imperceptible are these sensations. It was when I was attacked by violent neuralgia that I made use of this remedy, which since then I have, perhaps, slightly abused. I had acute pains in my head and neck, and an intolerable heat of the skin, a feverish restlessness. I took up a large bottle of ether, and lying down, I began to inhale it slowly. At the end of some minutes, I thought I heard a vague murmur, which ere long became a sort of humming, and it seemed to me that all the interior of my body had become light, light as air, that it was dissolving into vapor. Then came a sort of torpor, a sleepy sensation of comfort, in spite of the pains which still continued, but which had ceased to make themselves felt. It was one of those sensations which we are willing to endure, and not any of those frightful wrenches against which our tortured body protests. Soon the strange and delightful sense of emptiness which I felt in my chest extended to my limbs, which, in their turn, became light, as light as if the flesh and the bones had been melted and the skin only were left, the skin necessary to enable me to realize the sweetness of living, of bathing in the sensation of well-being. Then I perceived that I was no longer suffering. The pain had gone, melted away, evaporated. And I heard voices, four voices, two dialogues, without understanding what was said. At one time there were only indistinct sounds, at another time a word reached my ear. But I recognized that this was only the humming I had heard before, but emphasized. I was not asleep, I was not awake, I comprehended, I felt, I reasoned with the utmost clearness and depth, with extraordinary energy and intellectual pleasure, with a singular intoxication arising from the separation of my mental faculties. It was not like the dreams caused by hashish, or the somewhat sickly visions that come from opium. It was an amazing acuteness of reasoning, a new way of seeing, judging, and appreciating the things of life, and with the certainty, the absolute consciousness that this was the true way. And the old image of the scriptures suddenly came back to my mind. It seemed to me that I had tasted of the tree of knowledge, 
that all the mysteries were unveiled, so much did I find myself under the sway of a new, strange, and irrefutable logic, and arguments, reasonings, proofs rose up in a heap before my brain only to be immediately displaced by some stronger proof, reasoning, argument. My head had, in fact, become a battleground of ideas. I was a superior being, armed with invincible intelligence, and I experienced a huge delight at the manifestation of my power. It lasted a long, long time. I still kept inhaling the ether from my flagon. Suddenly I perceived that it was empty. The four men exclaimed at the same time, Doctor, a prescription at once for a liter of ether! But the doctor, putting on his hat, replied, As to that, certainly not. Go and let someone else poison you. And he left them. Ladies and gentlemen, what is your opinion on the subject? End of section 154. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 155 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 155. Simon's Papa. Noon had just struck. The school door opened and the youngsters darted out, jostling each other in their haste to get out quickly. But instead of promptly dispersing and going home to dinner as usual, they stopped a few paces off, broke up into knots, and began whispering. The fact was that, that morning, Simon, the son of La Blanchotte, had, for the first time, attended school. They had all of them in their families heard talk of La Blanchotte, and, although in public she was welcome enough, the mothers among themselves treated her with a somewhat disdainful compassion which the children had imitated without in the least knowing why. As for Simon himself, they did not know him, for he never went out and did not run about with them in the streets of the village or along the banks of the river, and they did not care for him, so it was with a certain delight, mingled with considerable astonishment, that they met and repeated to each other what had been said by a lad of fourteen or fifteen who appeared to know all about it, so sagaciously did he wink. You know, Simon, well, he has no papa. Just then La Blanchotte's son appeared in the doorway of the school. He was seven or eight years old, rather pale, very neat, with a timid and almost awkward manner. He was starting home to his mother's house when the groups of his schoolmates, whispering and watching him with the mischievous and heartless eyes of children bent upon playing a nasty trick, gradually closed in around him and ended by surrounding him altogether. There he stood in their midst, surprised and embarrassed, not understanding what they were going to do with him. But the lad who had brought the news, puffed up with the success he had met with already, demanded, "'What's your name, you?' He answered, Simon. Simon what? retorted the other. The child, altogether bewildered, repeated, Simon. The lad shouted at him, One is named Simon something. That is not a name. Simon indeed. The child, on the brink of tears, replied for the third time, My name is Simon. The urchins began to laugh. The triumphant tormentor cried, You can see plainly that he has no papa. A deep silence ensued. The children were dumbfounded by this extraordinary, impossible, monstrous thing, a boy who had not a papa. They looked upon him as a phenomenon, an unnatural being, and they felt that hitherto inexplicable contempt of their mothers for La Blanchotte growing upon them. As for Simon, he had leaned against a tree to avoid falling, and he remained as if prostrated by an irreparable disaster. He sought to explain, but could think of nothing to say to refute this horrible charge that he had no papa. At last he shouted at them quite recklessly. "'Yes, I have one.' "'Where is he?' demanded the boy. Simon was silent. He did not know. The children roared, tremendously excited, and those country boys, little more than animals, experienced that cruel craving which prompts the fowls of a farmyard to destroy one of their number as soon as it is wounded. Simon suddenly espied a little neighbor, the son of a widow, whom he had seen, as he himself was to be seen, always alone with his mother. "'And no more have you,' he said. "'No more have you a papa.' Yes, replied the other, I have one. Where is he? rejoined Simon. He is dead, declared the brat with superb dignity. He is in the cemetery, is my papa. A murmur of approval rose among the little wretches, as if that this fact of possessing a papa dead in a cemetery had caused their comrade to grow big enough to crush the other one who had no papa at all. And these boys, whose fathers were for the most part bad men, drunkards, thieves, and who beat their wives, jostled each other to press closer and closer, as though they, the legitimate ones, would smother by their pressure one who was illegitimate. The boy who chanced to be next to Simon suddenly put his tongue out at him with a mocking air and shouted at him, "'No papa! No papa!' 
Simon seized him by the hair with both hands and set to work to disable his legs with kicks, while he bit his cheek ferociously. A tremendous struggle ensued between the two combatants, and Simon found himself beaten, torn, bruised, rolled on the ground in the midst of the ring of applauding schoolboys. As he arose, mechanically brushing with his hand his little blouse all covered with dust, someone shouted at him, "'Go and tell your papa!' Then he felt a great sinking at his heart. They were stronger than he was. They had beaten him, and he had no answer to give them, for he knew well that it was true that he had no papa. Full of pride, he attempted for some moments to struggle against the tears which were choking him. He had a feeling of suffocation, and then without any sound he commenced to weep with great shaking sobs. A ferocious joy broke out among his enemies, and, with one accord, just like savages in their fearful festivals, they took each other by the hand and danced round him in a circle, repeating as a refrain, "'No papa! No papa!' But suddenly Simon ceased sobbing. He became ferocious. There were stones under his feet. He picked them up and with all his strength hurled them at his tormentors. Two or three were struck and rushed off yelling, and so formidable did he appear that the rest became panic-stricken. Cowards, as the mob always is in the presence of an exasperated man, they broke up and fled. Left alone, the little fellow without a father set off running toward the fields, for a recollection had been awakened in him which determined his soul to a great resolve. He made up his mind to drown himself in the river. He remembered, in fact, that eight days before, a poor devil who begged for his livelihood had thrown himself into the water because he had no more money. Simon had been there when they fished him out again, and the wretched man, who usually seemed to him so miserable and ugly, had then struck him as being so peaceful with his pale cheeks, his long-drenched beard, and his open eyes full of calm. The bystanders had said, "'He is dead,' and someone said, "'He is quite happy now.' And Simon wished to drown himself also, because he had no father, just like the wretched being who had no money. He reached the water and watched it flowing. Some fish were sporting briskly in the clear stream and occasionally made a little bound and caught the flies flying on the surface. He stopped crying in order to watch them, for their maneuvers interested him greatly. But at intervals, as in tempest intervals of calm, alternate suddenly with tremendous gusts of wind, which snap off the trees and then lose themselves in the horizon, this thought would return to him with intense pain. I am going to drown myself because I have no papa. It was very warm, fine weather. The pleasant sunshine warmed the grass. The water shone like a mirror, and Simon enjoyed some minutes of happiness, of that languor which follows weeping, and felt inclined to fall asleep there upon the grass in the warm sunshine. A little green frog leaped from under his feet. He endeavored to catch it. It escaped him. He followed it and lost it three times in succession. At last he caught it by one of its hind legs and began to laugh as he saw the efforts the creature made to escape. It gathered itself up on its hind legs, and then with a violent spring suddenly stretched them out as stiff as two bars, while it beat the air with its front legs as though they were hands, its round eyes staring in their circle of yellow. It reminded him of a toy made of straight slips of wood nailed zigzag one on the other, by which a similar movement regulated the movements of the toy soldiers fastened thereon. Then he thought of his home and then of his mother, and overcome by sorrow, he began again to weep. A shiver passed over him. He knelt down and said his prayers as before going to bed, but he was unable to finish them, for tumultuous violent sobs shook his whole frame. He no longer thought, he no longer saw anything around him, and was wholly absorbed in crying. Suddenly a heavy hand was placed upon his shoulder, and a rough voice asked him, "'What is it that causes you so much grief, my little man?' Simon turned round. A tall workman with a beard and curly black hair was standing and staring at him good-naturedly. He answered with his eyes and throat full of tears, "'They beat me because I—I I have no papa, no papa.' "'What?' said the man, smiling. "'Why, everybody has one.' The child answered painfully amid his spasms of grief, "'But I—I I, I have none.' Then the workman became serious. He had recognized La Blanchot's son— and, although himself a new arrival in the neighborhood, he had a vague idea of her history. "'Well,' said he, "'console yourself, my boy, and come with me home to your mother. She'll give you a, a papa.' And so they started on the way, the big fellow holding the little fellow by the hand, and the man smiled, for he was not sorry to see this Blinshot, who was, it was said, one of the prettiest girls of the countryside, and, perhaps, he was saying to himself, at the bottom of his heart, that a lass who had erred might very well err again.' They arrived in front of a very neat little white house. "'There it is!' exclaimed the child, and he cried, "Mamma!" A woman appeared, and the workman instantly left off smiling, 
for he saw at once that there was no fooling to be done with the tall, pale girl who stood austerely at her door, as though to defend from one man the threshold of that house where she had already been betrayed by another. Intimidated, his cap in his hand, he stammered out, "'See, madame, I have brought you back your little boy who lost himself near the river.' But Simon flung his arms about his mother's neck and told her, as he again began to cry, "'No, mamma, I wish to drown myself because others had beaten me, had beaten me, because I have no papa.' A burning redness covered the young woman's cheeks, and, hurt to the quick, she embraced her child passionately while the tears coursed down her face. The man, much moved, stood there, not knowing how to get away. But Simon suddenly ran to him and said, "'Will you be my papa?' A deep silence ensued. La Blanchotte, dumb and tortured with shame, leaned herself against the wall, both her hands upon her heart. The child, seeing that no answer was made him, replied, "'If you will not, I shall go back and drown myself.' The workman took the matter as a jest, and answered, laughing, well, "'Why, yes, certainly I will.' "'What is your name?' went on the child, "'so that I may tell the others when they wish to know your name.' "'Philip,' answered the man. Simon was silent a moment, so that he might get the name well into his head. Then he stretched out his arms, quite consoled, as he said, "'Well then, Philip, you are my papa.' The workman, lifting him from the ground, kissed him hastily on both cheeks, and then walked away very quickly with great strides." When the child returned to school the next day, he was received with a spiteful laugh, and at the end of school, when the lads were on the point of recommencing, Simon threw these words at their heads as he would have done stone. He is named Philip, my papa. Yells of delight burst out from all sides. Philip who? Philip what? What on earth is Philip? Where did you pick up your Philip? Simon answered nothing, and, immovable in his faith, he defied them with his eye, ready to be martyred rather than fly before them. The schoolmaster came to his rescue, and he returned home to his mother. During three months, the tall workman Philip frequently passed by La Blanchotte's house, and sometimes he made bold to speak to her when he saw her sewing near the window. She answered him civilly, always sedately, never joking with him nor permitting him to enter her house. Notwithstanding, being, like all men, a bit of a coxcomb, he imagined that she was often rosier than usual when she chatted with him. But a lost reputation is so difficult to regain and always remains so fragile that, in spite of the shy reserve of La Blanchotte, they already gossiped in the neighborhood. As for Simon, he loved his new papa very much, and walked with him nearly every evening when the day's work was done. He went regularly to school, and mixed with great dignity with his schoolfellows without ever answering them back. One day, however, the lad who had first attacked him said to him, "'You have lied. You have not a papa named Philip.' "'Why do you say that?' demanded Simon, much disturbed. The youth rubbed his hands. He replied, because if you had one, he would be your mamma's husband. Simon was confused by the truth of this reasoning. Nevertheless, he retorted, He is my papa all the same. That can very well be, exclaimed the urchin with a sneer, but that is not being your papa altogether. La Blanchotte's little one bowed his head and went off dreaming in the direction of the forge belonging to old Lausanne, where Philip worked. The forge was as though buried beneath trees. It was very dark there. The red glare of a formidable furnace alone lit up with great flashes five blacksmiths, who hammered upon their anvils with a terrible din. They were standing enveloped in flame, like demons, their eyes fixed on the red-hot iron they were pounding, and their dull ideas rose and fell with their hammers. Simon entered without being noticed, and went quietly to pluck his friend by the sleeve. The latter turned round. All at once the work came to a standstill, and all the men looked on, very attentive. Then, in the midst of this unaccustomed silence, rose the slender pipe of Simon. "'Say, Philip, the Michaud boy told me just now that you were not altogether my papa.' "'Why not?' asked the blacksmith. The child replied with all innocence, "'Because you are not my mamma's husband.' No one laughed. Philip remained standing, leaning his forehead upon the back of his great hands, which supported the handle of his hammer standing upright upon the anvil. He mused. His four companions watched him, and Simon, a tiny mite among these giants, anxiously waited. Suddenly, one of the smiths, answering to the sentiment of all, said to Philip, La Blanchotte is a good, honest girl, and upright and steady in spite of her misfortune, and would make a worthy wife for an honest man. That is true, remarked the three others. The smith continued, Is it the girl's fault if she went wrong? She had been promised marriage, and I know more than one who is much respected today, and who sinned every bit as much. That is true, responded the three men in chorus. He resumed. How hard she has toiled, poor thing, to bring up her child all alone, and now she has wept all these years she has never gone out except to church, God only knows. 
This is also true, said the others. Then nothing was heard but the bellows which fanned the fire of the furnace. Philip hastily bent himself down to Simon. Go and tell your mother that I am coming to speak to her this evening. Then he pushed the child out by the shoulders. He returned to his work, and with a single blow the five hammers again fell upon their anvils. Thus they wrought the iron until nightfall, strong, powerful, happy, like contented hammers. But just as the great bell of a cathedral resounds upon feast days above the jingling of the other bells, so Philip's hammer, sounding above the rest, clanged second after second with a deafening uproar, and he stood amid the flying sparks plying his trade vigorously. The sky was full of stars as he knocked at La Blanchot's door. He had on his Sunday blouse, a clean shirt, and his beard was trimmed. The young woman showed herself upon the threshold, and said in a grieved tone, "'It is ill to come thus when night has fallen, Philip.' He wished to answer, but stammered and stood confused before her. She resumed, "'You understand, do you not, that it will not do for me to be talked about again? What does that matter to me if you will be my wife?' No voice replied to him, but he believed that he heard in the shadow of the room the sound of a falling body. He entered quickly, and Simon, who had gone to bed, distinguished the sound of a kiss and some words that his mother murmured softly. Then all at once he found himself lifted up by the hands of his friend, who, holding him at the length of his Herculean arms, exclaimed, "'You will tell them, your schoolmates, that your papa is Philip Remy the blacksmith, and that he will pull the ears off of all who do you any harm.' On the morrow, when the school was full and lessons were about to begin, little Simon stood up, quite pale with trembling lips. "'My papa,' he said in a clear voice, "'is Philip Remy the blacksmith, and he has promised to pull the ears of all who does me any harm.' This time no one laughed, for he was very well known was Philip Remy the blacksmith, and was a papa of whom any one in the world would have been proud. End of section 155. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 156 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 156. The Child. Lemonnier had remained a widower with one child. He loved his wife devotedly, with a tender and exalted love, without a slip, during their entire married life. He was a good, honest man, perfectly simple, sincere, without suspicion or malice. He fell in love with a poor neighbor, proposed, and was accepted. He was making a very comfortable living out of the wholesale cloth business, and he did not for a minute suspect that the young girl might have accepted him for anything else but himself. She made him happy. She was everything to him. He only thought of her, looked at her continually with worshipping eyes. During meals he would make any number of blunders, in order not to have to take his eyes from the beloved face. He would pour the wine in his plate and the water in the salt cellar, and then he would laugh like a child, repeating, "'You see, I love you too much. That makes me crazy.' She would smile with a calm and resigned look, then she would look away, as though embarrassed by the adoration of her husband, and try to make him talk about something else, but he would take her hand under the table, and he would hold it in hers, whispering, "'My little Jeanne, my darling little Jeanne." She sometimes lost patience and said, "'Come, come, be reasonable. Eat and let me eat.' He would sigh and break off a mouthful of bread, which he would then chew slowly. For five years they had no children. Then she suddenly announced to him that this state of affairs would soon cease. He was wild with joy. He no longer left her for a minute, until his old nurse, who had brought him up and who often ruled the house, would push him out and close the door behind him, in order to compel him to go out in the fresh air. He had grown very intimate with a young man who had known his wife since childhood, and who was one of the prefect's secretaries. Monsieur de Retour would dine three times a week with the Lemoniers, bringing flowers to Madame and sometimes a box at the theatre, and often, at the end of the dinner, Lemonnier, growing tender, turning towards his wife, would explain, With a companion like you and a friend like him, a man is completely happy on earth. She died in childbirth. The shock almost killed him. But the sight of the child, a poor, moaning little creature, gave him courage. He loved it with a passionate and sorrowful love, with a morbid love in which struck the memory of death, but in which lived something of his worship for the dead mother. It was the flesh of his wife, her being continued, a sort of quintessence of herself, this child was her very life transferred to another body. She had disappeared that it might exist, and the father would smother it with kisses. But also, this child had killed her. He had stolen this beloved creature. His life was at the cost of hers. And Monsieur Lemonnier would place his son in the cradle and would sit down and watch him. He would sit this way by the hour, looking at him, dreaming of thousands of things, sweet or sad. Then, when the little one was asleep, he would bend over him and sob. The child grew. 
The father could no longer spend an hour away from him. He would stay near him, take him out for walks, and himself dress him, wash him, make him eat. His friend, Monsieur de Retour, also seemed to love the boy. He would kiss him wildly in those frenzies of tenderness which are characteristic of parents. He would toss him in his arms, he would trot him on his knees by the hour, and Monsieur Lemonnier, delighted, would mutter, Isn't he a darling? Isn't he a darling? And Monsieur de Retour would hug the child in his arms and tickle his neck with his mustache. Celeste, the old nurse, alone, seemed to have no tenderness for the little one. She would grow angry at his pranks and seemed impatient at the caresses of the two men. She would exclaim, "'How can you expect to bring a child up like that? You'll make a perfect monkey out of him.' Years went by, and Jean was nine years old. He hardly knew how to read. He had been so spoiled, and only did as he saw fit. He was willful, stubborn, and quick-tempered. The father always gave in to him and let him have his own way. Monsieur de Retour would always buy him all the toys he wished, and he fed him on cake and candies. Then Celeste would grow angry and exclaim, "'It's a shame, monsieur, a shame. You are spoiling the child, but it will have to stop. Yes, sir, I tell you it will have to stop, and before long, too.' Monsieur Lemonnier would answer, smiling, "'What can you expect? I love him too much. I can't resist him. You must get used to it.' Jean was delicate, rather. The doctor said that he was anemic, prescribed iron, rare meat, and broth. But the little fellow loved only cake and refused all other nourishment, and the father, in despair, stuffed him with cream puffs and chocolate eclairs. One evening, as they were sitting down to supper, Celeste brought on the soup with an air of authority and an assurance which she did not usually have. She took off the cover, and, dipping the ladle into the dish, she declared, "'Here is some broth such as I have never made. The young one will have to take some this time.' Monsieur Lemonnier, frightened, bent his head. He saw a storm brewing. Celeste took his plate, filled it herself, and placed it in front of him. He tasted the soup and said, "'It is indeed excellent.' The servant took the boy's plate and poured a spoonful of soup in it. Then she retreated a few steps and waited. Jean spelled the food and pushed his plate away with an expression of disgust. Celeste, suddenly pale, quickly stepped forward and forcibly poured a spoonful down the child's mouth. He choked, coughed, sneezed, spat. Howling, he seized his glass and threw it at his nurse. She received it full in the stomach. Then, exasperated, she took the young shaver's head under her arm and began pouring spoonful after spoonful of soup down his throat. He grew red as a beet. He would cough it up, stamping, twisting, choking, beating the air with his hands. At first the father was so surprised that he could not move. Then, suddenly, he rushed forward, wild with rage, seized the servant by the throat, and threw her up against the wall, stammering, "'Out! Out! Out, you brute!' But she shook him off, and, her hair streaming down her back, her eyes snapping, she cried out, "'What's getting hold of you? You're trying to thrash me because I am making the child eat soup when you're filling him with sweet stuff?' He kept repeating, trembling from head to foot, "'Out! Get out! Get out, you brute!' Then, wild, she turned to him, and pushing her face up against his, her voice trembling, "'Ah, you think, you think you can treat me like that? Oh, no! And for whom? For that brat who is not even yours! No, not yours! No, not yours! Not yours! Everybody knows it except yourself. Ask the grocer, the butcher, the baker, all of them, any one of them!' She was growling and mumbling, choked with passion. Then she stopped and looked at him. He was motionless, livid, his arms hanging by his sides. After a short pause, he murmured in a faint, shaky voice, instinct with deep feeling. You say, you say, what do you say? She remained silent, frightened by his appearance. Once more, he stepped forward, repeating, you say, what do you say? Then in a calm voice, she answered, I say what I know, what everybody knows. He seized her, and, with the fury of a beast, he tried to throw her down. But, although old, she was strong and nimble. She slipped under his arm, and running around the table once more furious, she screamed, Look at him! Just look at him, fool that you are! Isn't he the living image of Monsieur Dufour? Look at his nose and his eyes! Are yours like that? And his hair, is it like his mother's? I tell you that everyone knows it, everyone except yourself. It's the joke of the town. Look at him! She went to the door, opened it, and disappeared. Jean, frightened, sat motionless before his plate of soup. At the end of an hour, she returned gently to see how matters stood. The child, after doing away with all the cakes and a pitcher full of cream and one of syrup, was now emptying the jam pot with his soup spoon. The father had gone out. Celeste took the child, kissed him, and gently carried him to his room and put him to bed. She came back to the dining room, cleared the table, put everything in place, feeling very uneasy all the time. Not a single sound could be heard throughout the house. She put her ear against her master's door. He seemed to be perfectly still. 
She put her eye to the keyhole. He was writing and seemed very calm. Then she returned to the kitchen and sat down, ready for any emergency. She slept on a chair and awoke at daylight. She did the rooms as she had been accustomed to every morning. She swept and dusted, and, towards eight o'clock, prepared Monsieur Lemonnier's breakfast. But she did not dare bring it to her master, knowing too well how she would be received. She waited for him to ring. But he did not ring. Nine o'clock, then ten o'clock, went by. Celeste, not knowing what to think, prepared her tray and started up with it, her heart beating fast. She stopped before the door and listened. Everything was still. She knocked, no answer. Then, gathering up all her courage, she opened the door and entered. With a wild shriek, she dropped the breakfast tray which she had been holding in her hand. In the middle of the room, Monsieur Lemonnier was hanging by a rope from a ring in the ceiling. His tongue was sticking out horribly. His right slipper was lying on the ground, his left one still on his foot. An upturned chair had rolled over to the bed. Celeste, dazed, ran away shrieking. All the neighbors crowded together. The physician declared that he had died at about midnight. A letter addressed to Mr. de Tour was found on the table of the suicide. It contained these words. I leave and entrust the child to you. End of section 156. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 157 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 157. A Country Excursion. For five months they had been talking of going to take luncheon in one of the country suburbs of Paris on Madame Dufour's birthday, and as they were looking forward very impatiently to the outing, they rose very early that morning. Monsieur Dufour had borrowed the milkman's wagon and drove himself. It was a very tidy, two-wheeled conveyance, with a cover supported by four iron rods, with curtains that had been drawn up, except the one at the back, which floated out like a sail. Madame Dufour, resplendent in a wonderful, cherry-colored silk dress, sat by the side of her husband. The old grandmother and a girl sat behind them on two chairs, and a boy with yellow hair was lying at the bottom of the wagon, with nothing to be seen of him except his head. When they reached the bridge of Neuilly, Monsieur Dufour said, "'Here we are in the country at last,' and at that signal his wife grew sentimental about the beauties of nature. When they got to the crossroads at Courbevoie, they were seized with admiration for the distant landscape. On the right was Argentuil with its bell tower, and above it rose the hills of Senois and the mill of Orgmont, while on the left the aqueduct of Marly stood out against the clear morning sky, and in the distance they could see the terrace of Saint-Germain, and opposite them, at the end of a low chain of hills, the new fort of Cormeille. Quite in the distance, a long way off, beyond the plains and village, one could see the sombre green of the forests. The sun was beginning to burn their faces, the dust got into their eyes, and on either side of the road there stretched an interminable tract of bare, ugly country with an unpleasant odor. One might have thought that it had been ravaged by a pestilence, which had even attacked the buildings, for skeletons of dilapidated and deserted houses, or small cottages, which were left in an unfinished state, because the contractors had not been paid, reared their four roofless walls on each side. Here and there tall factory chimneys rose up from the barren soil, the only vegetation on that putrid land, where the spring breezes wafted an odor of petroleum and slate, blended with another odor that was even less agreeable. At last, however, they crossed the Seine a second time, and the bridge was a delight. The river sparkled in the sun, and they had a feeling of quiet enjoyment, felt refreshed as they drank in the purer air that was not impregnated by the black smoke of factories, nor by the miasma from the deposits of night soil. A man whom they met told them that the place was Bizon. Monsieur Dufour pulled up and read the attractive announcement outside an eating house. Restaurant Poulain, Matelots and Fried Fish, Private Rooms, Arbors, and Swings. Well, Madame Dufour, will this suit you? Will you make up your mind at last? She read the announcement in her turn and then looked at the house for some time. It was a white country inn built by the roadside, and through the open door she could see the bright zinc of the counter, at which sat two workmen in their Sunday clothes. At last she made up her mind and said, Yes, this will do, and besides, there is a view. They drove into a large field behind the inn, separated from the river by the towing path, and dismounted. The husband sprang out first and then held out his arms for his wife and as the step was very high, Madame Dufour, in order to reach him, had to show the lower part of her limbs, whose former slenderness had disappeared in fat, and Monsieur Dufour, who was already getting excited by the country air, pinched her calf, and then, taking her in his arms, he set her on the ground, as if she had been some enormous bundle. She shook the dust out of the silk dress, and then looked round to see what sort of place she was in. She was a stout woman of about thirty-six, full-blown and delightful to look at, she could hardly breathe, as her corsets were laced too tightly, 
and their pressure forced her superabundant bosom up to her double chin. Next, the girl placed her hand on her father's shoulder and jumped down lightly. The boy with the yellow hair had got down by stepping on the wheel, and he helped Monsieur Dufour to lift his grandmother out. Then they unharnessed the horse, which they had tied to a tree, and the carriage fell back, with both shafts in the air. The men took off their coats and washed their hands in a pail of water, and then went and joined the ladies, who had already taken possession of the swings. Mademoiselle Dufour was trying to swing standing up, but she could not succeed in getting a start. She was a pretty girl of about eighteen, one of those women who suddenly excite your desire when you meet them in the street, and who leave you with a vague feeling of uneasiness and excited senses. She was tall, had a small waist and large hips, with a dark skin, very large eyes, and very black hair. Her dress clearly marked the outlines of her firm, full figure, which was accentuated by the motion of her hips as she tried to swing herself higher. Her arms were stretched upward to hold the rope so that her bosom rose at every movement she made. Her hat, which a gust of wind had blown off, was hanging behind her, and as the swing gradually rose higher and higher, she showed her delicate limbs up to the knees each time, and the breeze from her flying skirts, which was more heady than the fumes of wine, blew into the faces of the two men, who were looking at her and smiling. Sitting on the other swing, Madame Dufour kept saying in a monotonous voice, "'Cyprian, come and swing me! Do come and swing me, Cyprian!' At last he went, and turning up his shirt sleeves, as if undertaking a hard piece of work, with much difficulty, he set his wife in motion. She clutched the two ropes and held her legs out straight so as not to touch the ground. She enjoyed feeling dizzy at the motion of the swing, and her whole figure shook like jelly on a dish. But as she went higher and higher, she became too giddy and was frightened. Each time the swing came down, she uttered a piercing scream, which made all the little urchins of the neighborhood come round. And down below, beneath the garden hedge, she vaguely saw a row of mischievous heads making various grimaces as they laughed. When a servant girl came out, they ordered luncheon. "'Some fried fish, a rabbit sauté, salad, and dessert,' Madame Dufour said, with an important air. "'Bring two quarts of beer and a bottle of claret,' her husband said. "'We will have lunch on the grass,' the girl added. The grandmother, who had an affection for cats, had been running after one that belonged to the house, trying to coax it to come to her for the last ten minutes. The animal, who was no doubt secretly flattered by her attentions, kept close to the good woman, but just out of reach of her hand, and quietly walked around the trees against which she rubbed herself, with her tail up, purring with pleasure. "'Hello!' suddenly exclaimed the young man with the yellow hair, who was wandering about. "'Here are two swell boats!' They all went to look at them and saw two beautiful canoes in a wooden shed, and they were as beautifully finished as if they had been ornamental furniture. They hung side by side like two tall, slender girls, in their narrow, shining length, and made one wish to float them on warm summer mornings and evenings along the flower-covered banks of the river, where the trees dip their branches into the water, where the rushes are continually rustling in the breeze, and where the swift kingfishers dart about like flashes of blue lightning. The whole family looked at them with great respect. "'Oh, they are indeed swell boats,' Monsieur Dufour repeated gravely, as he examined them like a connoisseur. He had been in the habit of rowing in his younger days, he said, and when he had spat in his hands, and went through the action of pulling the oars, he did not care a fig for anybody. He had beaten more than one Englishman formerly at the Joinville Regattas. He grew quite excited at last, and offered to make a bet that in a boat like that he could row six leagues in an hour without exerting himself. "'Luncheon is ready,' the waitress said, appearing at the entrance to the boathouse, and they all hurried off. But two young men had taken the very seats that Madame Dufour had selected, and were eating their luncheon. No doubt they were the owners of the skulls, for they were in boating costume. They were stretched out, almost lying on the chairs, they were sun-browned, and their thin cotton jerseys with short sleeves showed their bare arms, which were as strong as a blacksmith's. They were two strong, athletic fellows, who showed in all their movements that elasticity and grace of limb which can only be acquired by exercise, and which is so different to the deformity with which monotonous heavy work stamps the mechanic. They exchanged a rapid smile when they saw the mother, and then a glance on seeing the daughter. "'Let us give up their place,' one of them said. "'It will make us acquainted with them.' They got up immediately, and holding his black and red boating cap in his hand, he politely offered the ladies the only shady place in the garden. With many excuses they accepted, and that it might be more rural, they sat on the grass, without either tables or chairs. The two young men took their plates, knives, forks, etc., to a table a little way off, and began to eat again and their bare arms, which they showed continually, rather embarrassed the girl. She even pretended to turn her head aside and not to see them, while Madame Dufour, who was rather bolder, tempted by feminine curiosity, looked at them every moment, and, no doubt, compared them with the secret unsightliness of her husband. She had squatted herself on the ground, with her legs tucked under her, after the manner of tailors, and she kept moving about restlessly, saying that ants were crawling about her somewhere. 
Monsieur Dufour, annoyed at the presence of the polite strangers, was trying to find a comfortable position, with which he did not, however, succeed in doing, and the young man with the yellow hair was eating as silently as an ogre. "'It is lovely weather, monsieur,' the stout lady said to one of the boating men. She wished to be friendly, because they had given up their place. "'It is indeed, madame,' he replied. "'Do you often go into the country?' "'Oh, only once or twice a year to get a little fresh air. And you, monsieur? I come and sleep here every night.' "'Oh, that must be very nice. Certainly it is, madame.' and he gave him such a practical account of his daily life that it awakened afresh in the hearts of these shopkeepers who were deprived of the meadows and who longed for country walks to that foolish love of nature which they all feel so strongly the whole year round behind the counter in their shop. The girl raised her eyes and looked at the oarsman with emotion, and Monsieur Dufour spoke for the first time. It is indeed a happy life, he said, and then he added, a little more rabbit, my dear? No, thank you, she replied, and turning to the young men again and pointing to their arms, asked, Do you never feel cold like that? They both began to laugh, and they astonished the family with an account of the enormous fatigue they could endure, of their bathing while in a state of tremendous perspiration, of their rowing in the fog at night, and they struck their chests violently to show how hollow they sounded. Ah, you look very strong, said the husband, who did not talk any more of the time when he used to beat the English. The girl was looking at them sideways now and the young fellow with the yellow hair, who had swallowed some wine the wrong way, was coughing violently and bespattering Madame Dufour's cherry-colored silk dress. She got angry and sent for some water to wash the spots. Meanwhile, it had grown unbearably hot. The sparkling river looked like a blaze of fire, and the fumes of the wine were getting into their heads. Monsieur Dufour, who had a violent hiccough, had unbuttoned his waistcoat and the top button of his trousers, while his wife, who felt choking, was gradually unfastening her dress. The apprentice was shaking his yellow wig in a happy frame of mind, and kept helping himself to wine, and the old grandmother, feeling the effects of the wine, was very stiff and dignified. As for the girl, one noticed only a peculiar brightness in her eyes, while the brown cheeks became more rosy. The coffee finished, they suggested singing, and each of them sang or repeated a couplet, which the others applauded frantically. Then they got up with some difficulty, and while the two women, who were rather dizzy, were trying to get a breath of air, the two men, who were altogether drunk, were attempting gymnastics. Heavy, limp, and with scarlet faces they hung, or awkwardly to the iron rings, without being able to raise themselves. Meanwhile, the two boating men had got their boats into the water, and they came back and politely asked the ladies whether they would like a row. "'Would you like one, Monsieur Dufour?' his wife exclaimed. "'Please come.' He merely gave her a drunken nod without understanding what she said. Then one of the rowers came up with two fishing rods in his hand, in the hopes of catching a gudgeon. That great vision of the Parisian shopkeeper made Dufour's dull eyes gleam, and he politely allowed them to do whatever they liked, while he sat in the shade under the bridge with his feet dangling over the river, by the side of the young man with the yellow hair, who was sleeping soundly. One of the boating men made a martyr of himself and took the mother. "'Let us go to the little wood on the Ile aux Anglais,' he called out as he rowed off. The other boat went more slowly, for the rower was looking at his companion so intently that he thought of nothing else and his emotion seemed to paralyze his strength, while the girl, who was sitting in the bow, gave herself up to the enjoyment of being on the water. She felt a disinclination to think, a lassitude in her limbs, and a total enervation, as if she were intoxicated, and her face was flushed and her breathing quickened. The effects of the wine, which were increased by the extreme heat, made all the trees on the bank seem to bow as she passed. A vague wish for enjoyment and a fermentation of her blood seemed to pervade her whole body, which was excited by the heat of the day, and she was also disturbed at this tete-a-tete -tete on the water, in a place which seemed depopulated by the heat, with this young man who thought her pretty, whose ardent looks seemed to caress her skin and were as penetrating and pervading as the sun's rays. Their inability to speak increased their emotion, and they looked about them. At last, however, he made an effort and asked her name. Henriette, she said. Why, my name is Henri, he replied. The sound of their voices had calmed them, and they looked at the banks. The other boat had passed them and seemed to be waiting for them, and the rower called out, "'We'll meet you in the wood. We're going as far as Robinson's, because Madame Dufour is thirsty.' Then he bent over his oars again and rowed off so quickly that he was soon out of sight. Meanwhile, a continual roar, which they had heard for some time, came nearer, and the river itself seemed to shiver, as if the dull noise were rising from its depths. "'What is that noise?' she asked. It was the noise of the weir which cut the river in two at the island, and he was explaining it to her— when, above the noise of the waterfall, they heard the song of a bird, which seemed a long way off. "'Listen,' he said, "'the nightingales are singing during the day, so the female birds must be sitting.' "'A nightingale?' 
She had never heard one before, and the idea of listening to one roused visions of poetic tenderness in her heart. A nightingale, that is to say, the invisible witness of her love trysts which Juliet invoked on her balcony, that celestial music which had tuned to human kisses, that internal inspirer of all those languorous romances which open an ideal sky to all the poor little tender hearts of sensitive girls? She was going to hear a nightingale. We must not make a noise, her companion said, and then we can go into the wood and sit down close beside it. The boat seemed to glide. They saw the trees on the island, the banks of which were so low that they could look into the depths of the thickets. They stopped, he made the boat fast, Henriette took hold of Henri's arm, and they went beneath the trees. Stoop, he said, so she stooped down, and they went into an inextricable thicket of creepers, leaves, and reed grass, which formed an undiscoverable retreat, in which the young man laughingly called his private room. Just above their heads, perched in one of the trees which hid them, the bird was still singing. He uttered trills and roulades, and then loud, vibrating notes that filled the air and seemed to lose themselves on the horizon, across the level country, through that burning silence which weighed upon the whole landscape. They did not speak for fear of frightening it away. They were sitting close together, and slowly Henri's arm stole round the girl's waist and squeezed it gently. She took that daring hand without any anger, and kept removing it whenever he put it round her, without, however, feeling at all embarrassed by this caress, just as if it had been something quite natural, which she was resisting just as naturally. She was listening to the bird in ecstasy. She felt an infinite longing for happiness, for some sudden demonstration of tenderness, for the revelation of superhuman poetry, and she felt such a softening at her heart and relaxation of her nerves that she began to cry without knowing why. The young man was now straining her close to him, yet she did not remove his arm, she did not think of it. Suddenly the nightingale stopped, and a voice cried out in the distance, Henriette! Do not reply, he said in a low voice, you will drive the bird away. But she had no idea of doing so, and they remained in the same position for some time. Madame Dufour had sat down somewhere or other, for from time to time they heard the stout lady break out into little bursts of laughter. The girl was still crying, she was filled with strange sensations. Henri's head was on her shoulder, and suddenly he kissed her on the lips. She was surprised and angry, and, to avoid him, she stood up. They were both very pale when they left their grassy retreat. The blue sky appeared to them clouded, and the ardent sun darkened, and they felt the solitude and the silence. They walked rapidly, side by side, without speaking or touching each other, for they seemed to have become irreconcilable enemies, as if disgust and hatred had arisen between them, and from time to time Henriette called out, Mama! By and by they heard a noise behind a bush, and the stout lady appeared, looking rather confused, and her companion's face was wrinkled with smiles which he could not check. Madame Dufour took his arm, and they returned to the boats, and Henri, who was ahead, walked in silence beside the young girl. At last they got back to Bazan. Monsieur Dufour, who was now sober, was waiting for them very impatiently, while the young man with the yellow hair was having a mouthful of something to eat before leaving the inn. The carriage was waiting in the yard, and the grandmother, who had already got in, was very frightened at the thought of being overtaken by night before they reached Paris, as the outskirts were not safe. They all shook hands, and the Dufour family drove off. "'Goodbye, until we meet again!' the oarsmen cried, and the answer they got was a sigh and a tear. Two months later, as Henri was going along the Rue de Martyrs, he saw Dufour, ironmonger, over a door, and so he went in and saw the stout lady sitting at the counter. They recognized each other immediately, and after an interchange of polite greetings, he asked after them all. "'And how is Mademoiselle Henriette?' he inquired specially. "'Very well, thank you. She is married.' "'Ah!' he felt a certain emotion, but said, "'Whom did she marry?' "'That young man who accompanied us. You know, he has joined us in business.' I remember him perfectly. He was going out, feeling very unhappy, though scarcely knowing why, when Madame called him back. And how is your friend? she asked rather shyly. He is very well, thank you. Please give him our compliments and beg him to come and call when he is in the neighborhood. She then added, Tell him it will give me great pleasure. I will be sure to do so. Adieu. Do not say that. Come again very soon. The next year, one very hot Sunday, all the details of that adventure, which Henri had never forgotten, suddenly came back to him so clearly that he returned alone to their room in the wood, and was overwhelmed with astonishment when he went in. She was sitting on the grass, looking very sad, while by her side, still in his shirt sleeves, the young man with the yellow hair was sleeping soundly, like some animal. She grew so pale when she saw Henri that at first he thought she was going to faint. Then, however, they began to talk quite naturally. But when he told her that he was very fond of that spot, and went there frequently on Sundays to indulge in memories, she looked into his eyes for a very long time. 
I too think of it, she replied. Come, my dear, her husband said with a yawn. I think it is time for us to be going. End of section 157. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 158 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 158. Rose. The two young women appear to be buried under a basket of flowers. They are alone in the immense landau, which is filled with flowers like a giant basket. On the front seat are two small hampers of white satin filled with violets, and on the bare skin by which their knees are covered there is a mass of roses, mimosas, pinks, daisies, tuberoses, and orange blossoms, interwoven with silk ribbons. The two frail bodies seem buried under this beautiful perfumed bed, which hides everything but the shoulders and arms, and a little of the dainty wrists. The coachman's whip is wound with a garland of anemones, the horse's traces are dotted with carnations, the spokes of the wheels are clothed in mignonette, and where the lanterns ought to be there are two enormous round bouquets which look as though they were the eyes of this strange, rolling, flower-bedecked creature. The Landau drives rapidly along the road, through the Rue d'Antibes, preceded, followed, accompanied by a crowd of other carriages covered with flowers, full of women almost hidden by a sea of violets. It is the flower carnival at Cannes. The carriage reaches the Boulevard de la Foncière, where the battle is waged. All along the immense avenue, a double row of flower-bedecked vehicles are going and coming like an endless ribbon. Flowers are thrown from one to the other. They pass through the air like balls, striking fresh faces, bouncing and falling into the dust, where an army of youngsters pick them up. A thick crowd is standing on the sidewalks, looking on, and held in check by the mounted police, who pass brutally along, pushing back the curious pedestrians as though to prevent the common people from mingling with the rich. In the carriages, people call to each other, recognize each other, and bombard each other with roses. A chariot full of pretty women, dressed in red, like devils, attracts the eye of all. A gentleman, who looks like the portraits of Henry the Fourth, is throwing an immense bouquet which is held back by an elastic. Fearing the shock, the women hide their eyes, and the men lower their heads, but the graceful, rapid, and obedient missile describes a curve and returns to its master, who immediately throws it at some new face. The two young women begin to throw their stock of flowers by handfuls and receive a perfect hail of bouquets. Then, after an hour of warfare, a little tired, they tell the coachman to drive along the road which follows the seashore. The sun disappears behind Estorel, outlining the dark, rugged mountain against the sunset sky. The clear blue sea, as calm as a mill pond, stretches out as far as the horizon, where it blends with the sky, and the fleet, anchored in the middle of the bay, looks like a herd of enormous beasts, motionless on the water, apocalyptic animals, armored and humpbacked, their frail masts looking like feathers, and with eyes which light up when evening approaches. The two young women, leaning back under the heavy robes, look out lazily under the blue expanse of water. At last, one of them says, How delightful the evenings are! How good everything seems! Don't you think so, Margot? Yes, it is good, but there is always something lacking. What is lacking? I feel perfectly happy. I don't need anything else. Yes, you do. You are not thinking of it. No matter how contented we may be, physically, we always long for something more. For the heart. The other asked with a smile. A little love? Yes. They stopped talking, their eyes fastened on the distant horizon. Then the one called Marguerite murmured, Life without that seems to me unbearable. I need to be loved, if only by a dog. But we are all alike, no matter what you may say, Simone. Not at all, my dear. I had rather not be loved at all than to be loved by the first comer. Do you think, for instance, that it would be pleasant to be loved by... by... She was thinking by whom she might possibly be loved, glancing across the wide landscape. Her eyes, after traveling around the horizon fell on the two bright buttons which were shining on the back of the coachman's livery, and she continued, laughing, "'By my coachman?' Madame Margot barely smiled, and said in a low tone of voice, "'I assure you that it is very amusing to be loved by a servant. It has happened to me two or three times. They roll their eyes in such a funny manner. It's enough to make you die laughing. Naturally, the more in love they are, the more severe one must be with them. And then, some day, for some reason, you dismiss them, because if anyone should notice it, you would appear so ridiculous.' Madame Simone was listening, staring straight ahead of her. Then she remarked, No, I'm afraid that my footman's heart would not satisfy me. Tell me how you noticed that they loved you. I noticed it in the same way that I do with other men, when they get stupid. The others don't seem stupid to me when they love me. They are idiots, my dear, unable to talk, to answer, to understand anything. But how did you feel when you were loved by a servant? Were you moved? Flattered? Moved? No, flattered, yes, a little. 
One is always flattered to be loved by a man, no matter who he may be. Oh, Margot. Yes, indeed, my dear. For instance, I will tell you of a peculiar incident which happened to me. You will see how curious and complex our emotions are in such cases. About four years ago, I happened to be without a maid. I had tried five or six, one right after the other, and I was about ready to give up in despair, when I saw an advertisement in a newspaper of a young girl knowing how to cook, embroider, dress hair, who was looking for a position and who could furnish the best of references. Besides all these accomplishments, she could speak English. I wrote to the given address, and the next day the person in question presented herself. She was tall, slender, pale, shy-looking. She had beautiful black eyes and a charming complexion. She pleased me immediately. I asked for her certificates. She gave me one in English, for she came, she said, from Lady Rimwell's, where she had been for ten years. The certificate showed that the young girl had left of her own free will in order to return to France, and the only thing which they had to find fault in her long periods of service was a little French coquettishness. The prudish English phrase even made me smile, and I immediately engaged this maid. She came to me the same day. Her name was Rose. At the end of a month, I would have been helpless without her. She was a treasure, a pearl, a phenomenon. She could dress my hair with infinite taste, she could trim a hat better than most milliners, and she could even make my dresses. I was astonished at her accomplishments. I had never before been waited on in such a manner. She dressed me rapidly and with a surprisingly light touch. I never felt her fingers on my skin, and nothing is so disagreeable to me as contact with a servant's hand. I soon became excessively lazy. It was so pleasant to be dressed from head to foot, and from lingerie to gloves, by this tall, timid girl, always blushing a little and never saying a word. After my bath, she would rub and massage me while I dozed a little on my couch. I almost considered her more of a friend than a servant. One morning, the janitor asked mysteriously to speak to me. I was surprised and told him to come in. He was a good faithful man, an old soldier, and one of my husband's former orderlies. He seemed to be embarrassed by what he had to say to me. At least he managed to mumble. Madame, the superintendent of police is downstairs. I asked quickly, what does he wish? He wishes to search the house. Of course the police are useful, but I hate them. I do not think that it is a noble profession. I answered, angered and hurt. Why this search? For what reason? He shall not come in. The janitor continued. He says that there is a criminal hidden in the house. This time I was frightened, and I told him to bring the inspector to me so that I might get some explanation. He was a man with good manners and decorated with the Legion of Honor. He begged my pardon for disturbing me and then informed me that I had, among my domestics, a convict. I was shocked, and I answered that I could guarantee every servant in the house, and I began to enumerate them. The janitor, Pierre Courtin, an old soldier, it's not he. A stable boy, the son of farmers whom I know, and a groom whom you have just seen? It's not he. Then, monsieur, you must be mistaken. Excuse me, madame, but I am positive that I am not making a mistake. As the conviction of a notable criminal is at stake, would you be so kind as to send for all your servants? At first I refused, but I finally gave in, and sent downstairs for everybody, men and women. The inspector glanced at them and declared, This isn't all. Excuse me, monsieur, there is no one left but my maid, a young girl whom you could not possibly mistake for a convict. He asked, May I also see her? Certainly. I rang for Rose, who immediately appeared. She had hardly entered the room when the inspector made a motion, and two men whom I had not seen, hidden behind the door, sprang forward, seized her, and tied her hands behind her back. I cried out in anger and tried to rush forward to defend her. The inspector stopped me. This girl, madame, is a man whose name is Jean-Nicolas Le Capet, condemned to death in 1879 for assaulting a woman and injuring her so that her death resulted. His sentence was commuted to imprisonment for life. He escaped four months ago. We have been looking for him ever since. I was terrified, bewildered. I did not believe him. The commissioner continued, laughing. I can prove it to you. His right arm is tattooed. The sleeve was rolled up. It was true. The inspector added with bad taste. You can trust us for the other proofs and they led my maid away. Well, would you believe me? The thing that moved me most was not anger at thus having been played upon, deceived, and made ridiculous. It was not the shame of having thus been dressed and undressed, handled and touched by this man, but a deep humiliation, a woman's humiliation. Do you understand? I'm afraid I don't. Just think, this man had been condemned for, for assaulting a woman. Well, I thought of the one whom he had assaulted, and, and I felt humiliated, there, do you understand now? Madame Margot did not answer. She was looking straight ahead, her eyes fastened on the two shining buttons of the livery, with that sphinx-like smile which women sometimes have. End of section 158. Recording by Tatiana Chachilla, Columbus, Ohio.
Section 159 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 159. Rosalie Proudhon. There was a real mystery in this affair which neither the jury, nor the president, nor the public prosecutor himself could understand. The girl Proudhon, Rosalie, servant at the Varimbos of Nantes, having become ensanct without the knowledge of her masters, had, during the night, killed and buried her child in the garden. It was the usual story of the infanticides committed by servant girls, but there was one inexplicable circumstance about this one. When the police searched the girl Prudence's room, they discovered a complete infant's outfit, made by Rosalie herself, who had spent her nights for the last three months in cutting and sewing it. The grocer from whom she had bought her candles, out of her own wages, for this long piece of work had come to testify. It came out, moreover, that the sage farm of the district, informed by Rosalie of her condition, had given her all necessary instructions and counsel in case the event should happen at a time when it might not be possible to get help. She had also procured a place at Poissy for the girl Prudent, who foresaw that her present employers would discharge her, for the Varimbeau couple did not trifle with morality. They were present at the trial, both the man and the woman, a middle-class pair from provinces, living on their income. They were so exasperated against this girl, who had sullied their house, that they would have liked to see her guillotined on the spot without a trial. The spiteful depositions they made against her became accusations in their mouths. The defendant, a large, handsome girl of Lower Normandy, well-educated for her station in life, wept continuously and would not answer to anything. The court and the spectators were forced to the opinion that she had committed this barbarous act in a moment of despair and madness, since there was every indication that she had intended to keep and bring up her child. The president tried for the last time to make her speak, to get some confession, and, having urged her with much gentleness, he finally made her understand that all these men gathered here to pass judgment upon her were not anxious for her death and might even have pity on her. Then she made up her mind to speak. Come now, tell us first, who is the father of this child, he asked. Until then, she had obstinately refused to give his name. But she replied suddenly, looking at her masters who had so cruelly calumniated her. It is Monsieur Joseph, Monsieur Varimbeau's nephew. The couple started in their seats and cried with one voice. That's not true. She lies. This is infamous. The president had them silenced and continued. Go on, please, and tell us all how it happened. Then she suddenly began to talk freely, relieving her pent-up heart, that poor, solitary, crushed heart, laying bare her sorrow, her whole sorrow, before those severe men whom she had now taken for enemies and inflexible judges. Yes, it was Monsieur Joseph Verimbeau when he came on leave last year. What does Mr. Joseph Verimbeau do? He is a non-commissioned officer in the artillery, monsieur. Well, he stayed two months at the house, two months of the summer. I thought nothing of it when he began to look at me and then flatter me and make love to me all day long, and I let myself be taken in, monsieur. He kept saying to me that I was a handsome girl, that I was good company, that I just suited him, and I, I liked him well enough. What could I do? One listens to these things when one is alone, all alone, as I was. I am alone in the world, monsieur. I have no one to talk to, no one to tell my troubles to. I have no father, no mother no brother, no sister, nobody. And when he began to talk to me, it was as if I had a brother who had come back. And then he asked me to go with him to the river one evening so that we might talk without disturbing anyone. I went, I don't know. I don't know how it happened. He had his arm around me. Really, I didn't want to. No, no, I could not. I felt like crying. The air was so soft. The moon was shining. No, I swear to you, I could not. He did what he wanted. That went on for three weeks, as long as he stayed. I could have followed him to the ends of the world. He went away. I did not know that I was enceinte. I did not know it until the month after. She began to cry so bitterly that they had to give her time to collect herself. Then the president resumed with the tone of a priest at the confessional. Come now, go on. She began to talk again. When I realized my condition, I went to see Madame Boudin, who was there to tell you, and I asked her how it would be in case it would come if she were not there. Then I made the outfit, sewing night after night, every evening until one o'clock in the morning, and then I looked for another place, for I knew very well that I should be sent away, but I wanted to stay in the house until the very last, so as to save my pennies, for I have not got very much, and I should need my money for the little one. Then you did not intend to kill him. Oh, certainly not, monsieur. Why did you kill him, then? It happened this way. It came sooner than I expected. It came upon me in the kitchen while I was doing the dishes. Monsieur and Madame Varimbeau were already asleep, so I went up, not without difficulty, dragging myself up by the banister, and I lay down on the bare floor. It lasted perhaps one hour, or two, or three, I don't know, I had such pain, and then I pushed him out with all of my strength, 
I felt that he came out and I picked him up. Oh, but I was glad, I assure you. I did all that Madame Boudin told me to do, and then I laid him on my bed, and then such a pain gripped me again that I thought I should die. If you knew what it meant, you there, you would not do so much of this. I fell on my knees and then toppled over backward on the floor, and it gripped me again, perhaps one hour, perhaps two. I lay there all alone, and then another one comes, another little one. Two, yes, two, like this. I took him up as I did the first one, and I put him on the bed, the two side by side. Is it possible? Tell me. Two children, and I who only get twenty francs a month? Say, is it possible? One, yes, that can be managed by going without things, but not two. That turned my head. What do I know about it? Had I any choice? Tell me. What could I do? I felt as if my last hour had come. I put the pillow over them without knowing why. I could not keep them both. And then I threw myself down and I lay there, rolling over and over and crying until I saw daylight come into the window. Both of them were quite dead under the pillow. Then I took them under my arms and went down the stairs out in the vegetable garden. I took the gardener's spade and I buried them under the earth, digging as deep a hole as I could. One here and the other one there, not together, so that they might not talk of their mother if these little dead bodies can talk. What do I know about it? And then back in my bed, I felt so sick that I could not get up. They sent for the doctor and he understood it all. I'm telling you the truth, your honor. Do what you like with me. I'm ready. Half the jury were blowing their noses violently to keep from crying. The women in the courtroom were sobbing. The president asked her, Where did you bury the other one? The one that you have? She asked. Why, this one, this one was in the artichokes. Oh, then the other one is in the strawberries by the well. And she began to sob so piteously that no one could hear her unmoved. The girl Rosalie Prudent was acquitted. End of section 159. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 160 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 160. Regret. Monsieur Saval, who was called in Mont Father Saval, had just risen from bed. He was weeping. It was a dull autumn day, the leaves were falling. They fell slowly in the rain, like a heavier and slower rain. Monsieur Saval was not in good spirits. He walked from the fireplace to the window, and from the window to the fireplace. Life has its somber days. It would no longer have any but somber days for him, for he had reached the age of sixty-two. He is alone, an old bachelor, with nobody about him. How sad it is to die alone, all alone, without anyone who is devoted to you. He pondered over his life, so barren, so empty, he recalled former days, the days of his childhood, the home, the house of his parents, his college days, his follies, the time he studied law in Paris, his father's illness, his death. He then returned to live with his mother. They lived together very quietly and desired nothing more. At last, the mother died. How sad life is. He lived alone since then, and now in his turn, he too will be dead. He will disappear, and that will be the end. There will be no more of Paul Saval upon the earth. What a frightful thing. Other people will love, will laugh. Yes, people will go on amusing themselves, and he will no longer exist. Is it not strange that people can laugh, amuse themselves, be joyful under that eternal certainty of death? If this death were only probable, then one could have hope. But no, it is inevitable, as inevitable as that night follows the day. If, however, his life had been full, if he had done something, if he had had adventures, great pleasures, success, satisfaction of some kind or another, but no, nothing. He had done nothing, nothing but rise from bed, eat at the same hours, and go to bed again. And he had gone on like that to the age of sixty-two years. He had not even taken unto himself a wife, as other men do. Why? Yes, why was it that he had not married? He might have done so, for he possessed considerable means. Had he lacked an opportunity? Perhaps. But one can create opportunities. He was indifferent, that was all. Indifference had been his greatest drawback, his defect, his vice. How many men wreck their lives through indifference? It is so difficult for some natures to get out of bed, to move about, to take long walks, to speak, to study any question. He had not even been loved. No woman had reposed on his bosom in the complete abandon of love. He knew nothing of the delicious anguish of expectation, the divine vibration of a hand in yours, of the ecstasy of triumphant passion. What superhuman happiness must overflow your heart when lips encounter lips for the first time, when the grasp of four arms makes one being of you, a being unutterably happy, two beings infatuated with one another. Monsieur Saval was sitting before the fire, his feet on the fender, in his dressing gown. Assuredly, his had been spoiled, completely spoiled. He had, however, loved. 
He had loved secretly, sadly, and indifferently, in a manner characteristic of him in everything. Yes, he had loved his old friend, Madame Sandre, the wife of his old companion, Sandre. Ah, if he had known her as a young girl, but he had met her too late, she was already married. Unquestionably, he would have asked her hand. How he had loved her, nevertheless, without respite, since the first day he set eyes on her. He recalled his emotion every time he saw her, his grief on leaving her, the many nights that he could not sleep, because he was thinking of her. On rising in the morning, he was somewhat more rational than the previous evening. Why? How pretty she was formerly, so dainty, with fair curly hair and always laughing. Sandra was not the man she should have chosen. She was now fifty-two years of age. She seemed happy. Ah, if she had only loved him in days gone by. Yes, if she had only loved him. And why should she not have loved him? He, Saval, seeing that he loved her so much. Yes, she, Madame Sandre. If only she could have guessed. Had she not guessed anything? Seen anything? Comprehended anything? What would she have thought? If he had spoken, what would she have answered? And Saval asked himself a thousand other things. He reviewed his whole life, seeking to recall a multitude of details. He recalled all the long evenings spent at the house of Sandre when the latter's wife was young and so charming. He recalled many things that she had said to him, the intonations of her voice, the little significant smiles that meant so much. He recalled their walks, the three of them together, along the banks of the Seine, their luncheon on the grass on Sundays, for Sandre was employed at the sub-prefecture, and all at once the distinct recollection came to him of an afternoon spent with her in a little wood on the banks of the river. They had set out in the morning carrying their provisions in baskets. It was a bright spring morning, one of those days which intoxicate one. Everything smells fresh, everything seems happy. The voices of the birds sound more joyous, and they fly more swiftly. They had luncheon on the grass under the willow trees, quite close to the water, which glittered in the sun's rays. The air was balmy, charged with the odors of fresh vegetation. They drank it with delight. How pleasant everything was on that day. After lunch, Sandra went to sleep on the broad of his back. The best nap he had in his life, said he when he woke up. Madame Sandra had taken on the arm of Saval, and they started to walk along the river bank. She leaned tenderly on his arm. She laughed and said to him, I am intoxicated, my friend. I am quite intoxicated. He looked at her, his heart going pit-a-pat. He felt himself grow pale, fearful that he might have looked too boldly at her, and that the trembling of his hand had revealed his passion. She had made a wreath of wild flowers and water lilies, and she asked him, Do I look pretty like that? As he did not answer, for he could find nothing to say, he would have liked to go down on his knees. She burst out laughing, a sort of annoyed, displeased laugh, as she said, Great goose, what ails you? You might at least say something. He felt like crying, but could not even find a word to say. All these things come back to him now, as vividly as on the day when they took place. Why had she said this to him? Great goose, what ails you? You might at least say something. And he recalled how tenderly she had leaned on his arm, and in passing under a shady tree he had felt her ear brushing his cheek, and he had moved his head abruptly, lest she suppose he was too familiar. When he had said to her, Is it not time to return? She had darted a singular look at him. Certainly, she said, certainly, regarding him at the same time in a curious manner. He had not thought of it at the time, but now the whole thing appeared to him quite plain. Just as you like, my friend. If you are tired, let us go back. And he had answered, I am not fatigued, but Sandra may be awake now. And she had said, If you are afraid of my husband's being awake, that is another thing. Let us return. On their way back, she remained silent and leaned no longer on his arm. Why? At that time, it had never occurred to him to ask himself why. Now he seemed to apprehend the meaning that he had not yet understood. Could it? Monsieur Saval felt himself blush, and he got up at a bound, as if he were thirty years younger, and had heard Madame Sange say, I love you. Was it possible? That idea which had just entered his mind tortured him. Was it possible that he had not seen, not guessed? Oh, if it were true that he had let this opportunity of happiness pass without taking advantage of it. He said to himself, I must know. I cannot remain in this state of doubt. I must know. He thought, I am sixty-two years of age. She is fifty-eight. I may ask her that now without giving offense. He started out. The soldier's house was situated on the other side of the street, almost directly opposite his own. He went across and knocked at the door, and a little servant opened it. You here at this hour, Saval? Has some accident happened to you? No, my girl, he replied, but go and tell your mistress that I want to speak to her at once. The fact is, Madame is preserving pears for the winter, and she is in the preserving room. She is not dressed, you understand. Yes, but go and tell her that I wish to see her on a very important matter. The little servant went away, and Saval began to walk, with long, nervous strides, up and down the drawing room. He did not feel in the least embarrassed, however. Oh, he was merely going to ask her something, as he would have asked her about some cooking recipe. He was sixty-two years of age. 
The door opened and Madame appeared. She was now a large woman, fat and round, with full cheeks and a sonorous laugh. She walked with her arms away from her sides and her sleeves tucked up, her bare arms all covered with fruit juice. She asked anxiously, "'What is the matter with you, my friend? You're not ill, are you?' "'No, my dear friend, but I wish to ask you one thing, which to me is of the first importance, something which is torturing my heart, and I want you to promise that you will answer me frankly.' She laughed. "'I am always frank. Say on.' "'Well, then, I have loved you from the first day I ever saw you. Can you have any doubt of this?' She responded, laughing, with something of her former tone of voice. "'Great goose! What ails you? I knew it from the first day!' Saval began to tremble. He stammered out. "'You knew it? Then—' He stopped. She asked. "'Then?' He answered. "'Then what did you think? What—what—what what, what would you have answered?' She broke into a peal of laughter. Some of the juice ran off of the tips of her fingers onto the carpet. "'What? I? Why, you did not ask me anything. It was not for me to declare myself.' He then advanced a step toward her. "'Then tell me—' Tell me, you remember the day when Soldier went to sleep on the grass after lunch, when we had walked together as far as the bend of the river, below? He waited expectantly. She had ceased to laugh and looked at him straight in the eyes. Yes, certainly, I remember it. He answered, trembling all over. Well, that day, if I had been, if I had been venturesome, what would you have done? She began to laugh as only a happy woman can laugh was nothing to regret, and responded frankly, in a clear voice tinged with irony. I would have yielded, my friend. She then turned on her heels and went back to her jam-making. Saval rushed into the street, cast down as though he had met with some disaster. He walked with great strides through the rain, straight on, until he reached the river bank without thinking where he was going. He then turned to the right and followed the river. He walked a long time as if urged on by some instinct. His clothes were running with water, his hat was out of shape, as soft as a rag and dripping like a roof. He walked on straight in front of him. At last he came to the place where they had lunched on that day so long ago, the recollection of which tortured his heart. He sat down under the leafless trees and wept. End of section 160. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio.